Tonight, the final sprint to New Hampshire as the tabulation of the first votes in the Granite State is now underway. There's never been a movement like this. Make America great again. We work New Hampshire hard and we're excited to see what the day brings. We don't have a clear path to victory. It is now a two-person race, but is it too little too late for Nikki Haley to eke out a win against Donald Trump? Will the former president notch a big enough win to compel Haley to drop out entirely? The high-stakes fight for the nomination tonight as the candidates push their final messages to voters. And we do have to get rid of the chaos. I mean, I'll vote for him. He's the nominee, but border problem in America is definitely my top issue. The economy, parental rights, immigration, and much more. We are just minutes away from the release of the first batch of exit polls. What are the big issues driving primary voters to the polls? And what, if anything, can tonight's results predict for November's general election? ABC News Live special coverage of the 2024 New Hampshire primary starts right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us on this special New Hampshire primary edition of Your Voice, Your Vote. As we come on the air, the polls are about to close there in New Hampshire in this first presidential primary of 2024. And this race for the Republican nomination is now down to two, as Nikki Haley likes to put it, between a fella and a lady. Former President Donald Trump is hoping he gets a decisive win over former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley to clear his path to the general election. Haley is vowing to stay in, and we'll have more from ABC's Eva Pilgrim on the ground with a Haley campaign campaign in just a moment. And we're getting our first preliminary exit polling data about just who voted today. You can see that number will be tracking all night. 47% of independent uh, or undeclared voters. If that number holds, it would be an all-time record in a GOP primary in New Hampshire. We'll talk with political director Rick Klein in a moment about what all this means. But first, ABC's Rachel Scott leads us off with the Trump campaign in New Hampshire. Tonight, with the Republican primary now just a two-person race, election officials predicting record turnout here in New Hampshire. Lines snaking around gymnasiums, voters waiting to cast their ballots. This morning in Londonderry, Donald Trump making a surprise visit to a polling location. In the closing hours, Trump predicting a landslide victory that will give him a lock on the Republican nomination. We started off with 13, and now we're down to two people. And I think one person will be gone probably tomorrow. Yes! And the other one will be gone in November. Trump's one remaining Republican rival, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, has poured her energy and resources into this state, staking her campaign on a strong showing. Governor, how are you feeling heading to this final day here? Do you feel confident that you can close this gap? We're excited. I mean, this is what uh, election day is all about. Haley insists win or lose tonight, She'll stay in the race. Don't give up. I won't. I won't. Heading on to the South Carolina primary, and after that, Super Tuesday. Former President Trump last night said he'll probably drop out today. What's your response to that? I don't do what he tells me to do. I've never done what he tells me to do. I'm not going to talk about an obituary just because y'all think we have to talk about it. I'm going to talk about running the tape and saving this country. Trump telling me he's not concerned. Mr. President, Haley says that she's staying in through Super Tuesday. I don't care. Is she a threat to you? No. No, she, and I don't care if she stays in. Let her do whatever she wants. It doesn't matter. Haley is counting on independent voters to lift her up today in New Hampshire. People like stay-at-home mom Sarah Barley. I will do anything to not vote for Donald Trump. Why? I think he's a total con man, and I'll do anything to make sure he doesn't get voted in. But Maya Harvey, a die-hard supporter of the former president, tells me New Hampshire is Trump country. Are you all but certain that Trump will be the nominee? Absolutely. I mean, there's blue collar, hardworking, good people here in New Hampshire. You see them everywhere and they're all coming out to support the president. People feeling very confident. Rachel Scott joins us now from Nashua, New Hampshire. Uh, Rachel, what are you learning about voter turnout so far? Well, Lindsay, we have been at these polling locations all day, even before the polls opened this morning, and we saw these lines stretching all the way outside of the building. So tonight, election officials are telling us that turnout is higher than they anticipated. In fact, you have several cities and towns that are requesting additional Republican primary ballots. It is a big sign that voters here understand just how consequential this Republican primary is, Lindsay. Yeah, they clearly do. Trump and his campaign have been complaining, though, about votes tonight. What are they saying? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, look, the former president has been pushing these false claims that Democrats could vote in the New Hampshire primary. That is absolutely uh, not true. They cannot vote in the Republican primary. Only uh, Republicans or undeclared uh, voters are allowed to vote in the Republican primary. But we have seen this straight out of the Trump playbook. When he doesn't like the early results, maybe, or the exit polls that seem to be not going his way, uh, he tends to bash them. But uh, right now, those are just, just straight up false claims, Lindsay. All right. Rachel Scott will continue talking with you throughout the night. ABC's Eva Pilgrim is also in New Hampshire tonight. She's following Nikki Haley's campaign closely for us. Eva, what is the Haley campaign looking to accomplish tonight? Well, Lindsay, they are looking for a strong finish. We keep hearing them say strong finish. They haven't defined for us what strong looks like to them, but they are hoping to keep this as close as possible with the former president. Uh, they really need to get some momentum coming out of New Hampshire as they look ahead to South Carolina. But as you heard Rachel mention in her piece, Nikki Haley has no plans of dropping out of this race. They are committed to going forward, and they think there is a path forward for them, no matter what happens here in New Hampshire tonight. They're looking ahead to South Carolina. The Republican primary there allows people, anyone, to vote in that primary as long as they didn't vote in the Democratic primary already. And then she's looking ahead to Super Tuesday, where 11 of those states have open or semi-open primaries. She really thinks that she is the candidate that can be the, uh, the someone that people who can't get behind Donald Trump can get behind and pull in those independent voters. And so she's pushing forward, Lindsay. I know you said you haven't been able to get the campaign to define exactly what a strong finish would look like, but what are you hearing from voters there on the ground from, from uh, Nikki Haley supporters? You know, it's interesting talking to people here in New Hampshire. You know, they, they kept referencing the fact that we talk a lot about the enthusiasm that Trump supporters have for Donald Trump. They feel like they have a similar type of enthusiasm just because they're not loud, maybe it doesn't come across on cameras and, and uh, when you hear them as loudly, but they feel like they have a moral obligation to be here supporting Nikki Haley. They do talk to us a lot about what's on the line for the country. And we saw, we've seen it all day, those long lines at the polling sites, people turning out to vote. Her campaign here thinks that's a good sign tonight, Lindsay. All right, Eva Pilgrim, we will be watching. Thank you so much. And we want to get back to those preliminary exit polls. And while we need to stress it's still early, we do not have definitive results, a few things have caught our eye. Let's bring in our political director, Rick Klein. Rick, I first want us to look at that question that we mentioned a few minutes ago uh, as far as did you know, and, and we're just getting this for the first time, taking a look, uh, before voting today, you were registered as 49% said Republican, 47% there uh, saying they're independent. If this number holds, this would be the highest turnout of independents and undeclared voters in a New Hampshire GOP primary. It sounds like that's good news uh, for Nikki Haley. She needed at least 45%, it sounded like. She needs a different electorate to be showing up today in New Hampshire, and those preliminary uh, exit polls suggest that she's getting that or getting something close to it. Yes, the, the record, the high watermark we've ever seen in a Republican primary is 45%. And that that happened in 2012 when you had a Democrat running for re-election, so there wasn't a lot of action on that side. It freed up a lot of undeclared voters to be able to vote in the Republican primary. That appears to be happening in large numbers. We also heard a number of, uh, of smaller towns throughout the state ran out of Republican ballots today because the Secretary of State's office says they didn't anticipate that many votes for Republicans. Yes, undeclared candidates can vote in the Republican primary or the Democratic primary, for that matter. Donald Trump is falsely saying that New Hampshire allows Democrats to vote. That wasn't, that isn't the case. But an undeclared uh, 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 voter who typically votes Democrat is allowed to vote Republican. And they're doing so in relatively large numbers. So they, we, we know from pre-election polling, Lindsay, that those voters broke, broke overwhelmingly in polling for Nikki Haley. You know, two-thirds proposition. So those are good numbers, encouraging numbers for Nikki Haley's efforts to keep it close. Another thing that caught us, caught our eyes, the late deciders. Yeah. Uh, and the difference that we saw between New Hampshire and, and Iowa. Look, when you look at these uh, preliminary exit polls from New Hampshire, when did you decide who to support? Just 7% saying today. Yeah, even today. They did. Uh, but you have 25%, I believe, in all, yeah. who are saying that, you know, they just decided in the last week. Since just Iowa. Since the yeah, Iowa it, it, caucus. Exactly. It, it contrastly, in Iowa, 80% were saying they knew weeks ago, or at least before the week prior to the election. 
That's right. You add up those three numbers. People say just today, the last couple of days, or the last week. Bottom line is Iowa was eight days ago. So for everything we've said about how the, the die is cast or this race seems to be set, that does not appear to be the case for a large number of voters. And many of them were watching the results in Iowa. We're watching the changes. Ron DeSantis dropped out just after the, the Iowa caucuses. So a lot of things were happening, a lot of ads, a lot of new messaging. All these things were kind of crashing at the same time. It, it frankly doesn't surprise me in that New Hampshire likes to make up its own mind and sometimes go in a different direction uh, as Iowa, but it does suggest that there's some, still some fluidity in this race. And, and let's take a look at its favorability of abortion bans, those yeah. who are in favor or oppose it. New Hampshire, you're really seeing almost a flip-flop of what we saw in Iowa. Look, 67% of those in New Hampshire are saying they oppose banning abortion, 27% saying they favor banning it. In Iowa, we saw 61% said that they favored banning it. What does that tell us about the difference between the Iowa voters and the New Hampshire voters? Yeah, it's a Republican caucus now, a Republican primary. That is really stunning to me. Yes, New Hampshire is a much more moderate state. Yes, we have this large share of, of individuals independent, undeclared voters, but it tells you something about the state of, of abortion law and the reactions to it in this country. If you want to be elected president, you have to be able to appeal not just to core Republicans, but to undeclared, uh, independent voters, people somewhere in the middle. And we're seeing this in pretty stark evidence that most Republicans don't want a nationwide ban on abortion. Nikki Haley has made a case that we need a state-by-state -state consideration. You have to be very considerate of these things. Donald Trump, of course, appointed the Supreme Court justices that allowed Roe v. Wade to be overturned, although he, too, has taken a more moderate position on abortion. But to see how that's animating voters, particularly female voters tonight, I think is really stark. Really fascinating stuff as we're watching the differences between Iowa being so conservative and how that yeah. independent vote is shaping up potentially in New Hampshire. Rick, we're going to keep going with you, you know all it. through the night, so we thank you in advance for a long night. And we want to turn now to Bedford, New Hampshire, where ABC's Zareen Shah is watching all the action in this primary at a polling location there. Zareen, what's the latest that you're hearing from Bedford? Lindsay, I've been talking to voters all day long, and what one voter told me really sums up everything for me. He says he voted for Vivek Ramaswamy. Lindsay, that candidate is not even in the race anymore, but he says he was voting on principle. And so many people who I'm speaking to are voting from the heart. I mean, the never Trumper independents who could have voted for Haley, some instead telling me that they're writing in Joe Biden's name. One even said she vo voted for Dean Phillips. I mean, that race right there, the Democratic race, has very little consequence to, uh, compared to the Republican race. All right, and Zareen, we are going to be checking back with you. Thank you so much for your intel. Joining us now is Donald Trump's son, Eric Trump. Eric, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Big night ahead in New Hampshire. Would it be safe to say you think your father is going to win? I, I mean, if he does, in your mind, is it on to the general election and the primary is over? Yeah, let's say, I mean, we have tremendous momentum. Obviously, you saw what happened in Iowa, where the largest margin of victory ever in that state was 12 points. My father won by 31 points. And, you know, now I've been at all the polling locations, you know, around the state today. The energy is incredible. Uh, the, the energy is absolutely incredible in, in New Hampshire. I think we're going to have a great night tonight. Um, and I do really think it is on to the general election. I mean, at the end of the day, Nikki Haley didn't, she, she never filled out the paperwork in Nevada or something happened. So she's not even part of the caucus in a couple weeks. And then you go to South Carolina, her home state, and my father's polling at five to one um, in, in her home state of, of South Carolina. And then we go to uh, Super Tuesdays, you know very well, and my father's outperforming in every single one of those states. So I, I think her road to victory is non-existent, um, you know, assuming a, you know, a, a victory tonight. And, um, and I think at the end of the day, we, we have to turn our attention to Joe Biden, who's single-handedly the worst president in the history of this country. Uh, Haley, as I imagine you know, has said a few times now, the race is down to one fella and one lady, and that two 80-year-olds should not be running for office. On, on the trail this weekend, uh, your dad appeared to confuse Haley for Nancy Pelosi. How do you explain this confusion uh, when he said Haley was in charge of security at the Capitol on January 6th? My father's an incredible man. Uh, he's incredible, he's bright, he's got more energy than any person I know. He, he runs circles, and I think you know this too, because... You have teams of people around him every single day. He runs circles around the media. He runs circles around people that are third his age. He's, he's a remarkable human being. Um, he's got the brains. He's got the toughness uh, to do the job. He'll do the job better than any human being. And, and we need somebody to do that job. We need toughness right now. We need a fighter in the Oval Office. He's a remarkable man. He's at the top of his game. And, uh, and again, as a son, I'm incredibly proud of him. Uh, understood, uh, but I do want to go back to that moment because, as you know, Haley is really saying that this is an issue of his mental fitness. 
you know, I have parents who are Stop. now 78 and, and they do have some some questions sometimes or confusion sometimes. And I, I do think that it is a legitimate point of hers to say this is a really big issue if you're confusing me with Nancy Pelosi. Uh, uh, Lindsay, in all fairness, I mean, my father just beat her by 31 points in Iowa. Um, he's going to beat her again tonight. Um, you know, she forgot to put her name on a on a ballot, on a, you know, on a caucus in, in Nevada, I wouldn't exactly say that was, uh, you know, um, e using the breast of her brain power, um, to say the least, but, um, you know, we could stop with those games. I think this race is going to be over tonight. Um, my father's a remarkable person. He's done great things for this country. He's the last person um, that needs to be doing this job. He does it because he, he cares about red, white, and blue. Um, his life would be exponentially better if he was sitting at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, with his grandkids, having a great time. Uh, he wants to save our nation. Our nation is a nation in decline. Everybody sees it. Trump has spread discredited questions about Nikki Haley's eligibility to be president. Um, she is eligible. He's, he's mocked her, her birth name. Um, why do you think he's, he's doing that? Why take that approach? I mean, we know she was born in South Carolina. She's uh, eligible to, to run for, for president. So why question her that criteria? You know, Lindsay, every one of these questions is just kind of like a race to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom of the bucket. And, you know, it's, it's uh, we don't need to do this before. You know, we, we've got three hours left of voting. Let let the people of this country, you know, make a decision. You know, at the end of the day, there's there's two people. Um, so far, one of them has pulled way ahead. Uh, I think he's going to pull even farther ahead tonight. Um, but honestly, in, in, in the eve of, you know, people voting, I, I just don't think there's a need to go down that, you know. It, you know, it's something that the media wants to do. Uh, they do it for ratings. Uh, they also no, make this that's not really fair. Ratings. That's not fair. Your dad has, has made this an issue. I mean, just as, as recently as yesterday, he was questioning wherever she's from, which is which is a quote. So I, I understand if you don't want to talk about it, but I do yeah. think it's it's fair. It's not like the media is just making this stuff up. Your dad has has put that out there. But but that aside, I would like to ask: Do you have any sense at all if he would consider Nikki Haley as a VP or, or Ron DeSantis potentially? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's his call to make. Um, I, I wouldn't personally hope so. I, you know, I, I, I saw her when she was in the administration. Every time the, the wind would blow a little bit to the right or the left, she'd go, you know, running for the hills. And so, you know, um, it wouldn't be my first choice, to, to put it mildly. And I'm not sure if it would be my father's. In fact, I think he came out pretty strongly the other night and said that, you know, that wasn't exactly in the cards. But I can tell you he'll, he'll find somebody great. And, Eric, just last question for you. Uh, whether they're uh, right or not or whether the prosecution is, is fair or not, the persecution as it's been described, um, your dad does have another number of court cases that he's facing. He will have to spend a lot of this election cycle in court. Do you think as a result of that that his pick for VP has more meaning potentially than prior elections uh, so that that person can really be out on the campaign trail for them? Well, he's always been a great multitasker, and I think he's proving it right now. And, and I appreciate you saying whether it's fair or not. I, I mean, I can tell you as a son, it's not been fair. Um, you know, the second he got into office, they came at him with the, the sham Russia investigation. You know what happened there. Impeachment one, impeachment two. Uh, obviously, he won both of those. They went after Supreme Court justices. Then when he came out of office, they weaponized every radical AG and DA's office in the country to go after him, you know, with the hopes of keeping him off the ballot. And, you know, when that didn't work, they started removing his name in Colorado. And when that didn't work, they removed his name in Maine. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's so desperate, and the entire country sees through it. Well, Eric Trump, I know it's a big night, so I greatly appreciate you spending this time with us. I know you may not like all the questions, but I do have a lot of respect for you taking uh, each question a as it came, and, and really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And joining us now for more is Olivia Perez Kubis, spokesperson for the Nikki Haley campaign. Thank you so much for joining us, Olivia. How's the campaign feeling about the primary tonight? We feel good. Look, think back a few months ago. Just a few months ago, Nikki was at 2% in the polls. There were 14 people in this race, and no one said she had a shot. Now we got 20% in Iowa, and it's down to a two-person race here in New Hampshire. We feel really good about where things are right now. We are feeling the buzz, the energy, the excitement here on the ground. Yesterday, we had an event with two overflow rooms. The day before that, we had over 1,200 people. People are excited. Nikki is running as a new generational leader. People want that. People want a fresh face. And what's a win look like in your book? Look, a win for us has been what we've always said it would be, which is we wanted to show that we were strong in Iowa. Then we wanted to take that and show that we were strong in New Hampshire and we were competitive and be even stronger in New Hampshire. And then take that momentum and carry it home to South Carolina. Is it on to South Carolina no matter the outcome of tonight? 
No matter the outcome, Nikki said this a few times now, I'll even say we announced a $4 million ad buy in South Carolina. We've got a rally there tomorrow night. So we're fighting for every inch. Look, no one said that this was going to be easy. Donald Trump is Donald Trump. But it's a two-person race right now. Voters have a very clear choice. They can choose more of the same with two 80-year-old leaders of the past who are surrounded by a lot of drama, a lot of chaos, a lot of division. Or they can pick a new generational conservative leader. That's what Nikki's fighting for. It's resonating. So we're going to keep we're going to keep doing this. We're going to run through the tape. Our partners at 538 have Haley polling at an average of 25 percent to Trump's 62 percent in South Carolina. Former Governor Haley's uh, own, own home state, of course. Uh, what's the possibility that she would withdraw before that nominating contest rather than potentially lose in her own home state? I just said, we will be in South Carolina tomorrow. We are committed to see this through. I think what a lot of people don't realize is first, uh, a month in politics is a lifetime. A lot can happen over the next several weeks. A lot can happen very quickly. So we're going to do strong in New Hampshire tonight, show that we're competitive, take that momentum into South Carolina. And if you look beyond South Carolina, a lot of people keep saying that New Hampshire is as good as it gets for Nikki Haley. That's not the case. You look to the Super Tuesday states, and more states on Super Tuesday look more like New Hampshire than they look like Iowa. There are a lot of people, a lot of voters out there who want something new, who want something different. In Iowa, Donald Trump only got less than one and a half percent of the vote out of three million people in the state. America is not a coronation. We are a democracy. We have choice. One of the former 2024 candidates, Senator Tim Scott, said earlier today, quote, Nikki should join the team, adding it makes sense for everybody to coalesce around Donald Trump. How does she respond to, to that pressure uh, that, that we ultimately did see uh, former Governor Chris Christie to some, succumb to as well? There will be plenty of folks, plenty of time for Republicans to rally around the nominee, which will be Nikki Haley. Here's something a lot of people might not know about her. In 2010, she was the outsider candidate. She was the Tea Party candidate, the anti-establishment candidate. She has never had the support or the backing of Washington insiders or Washington elites. She does, she's never had it. She didn't have it then. She doesn't want it now. And quite frankly, she doesn't need it. Can you rule out that Nikki Haley would not endorse former President Trump? Trump. Well, Nikki has said if if he is the nominee, she will support whomever the Republican nominee is going to be, but it's not going to get to that because she's going to be the Republican nominee. People keep talking and acting like this race is over. It's not. One state has voted. The second state votes tonight. We got a long way to go. So let's let the process play out. Olivia Perez Cuba, spokesperson for the Nikki Haley campaign. We thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And stay with ABC News Live. Our New Hampshire primary coverage continues. And still much more of today's other headlines to get to here on Prime. Coming up, the terrifying moment when water rushed into a U.S. military base, knocking people off their feet. What caused that massive wave? But next, the deadliest day so far for Israeli forces in the war against Hamas, the attack that led to their deaths. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Next tonight, 21 IDF reservists were killed in a single rocket attack and three others in separate incidents. It's the deadliest day for Israeli troops since the war began. It comes as IDF forces have encircled and deepened the operation in southern Gaza, warning thousands of Palestinians to move once again. ABC's Matt Gutman reports in from Israel. Israel reeling tonight after losing 21 soldiers in that attack in the Gaza Strip. According to the IDF, a unit of reserve soldiers was preparing to demolish a pair of two-story buildings in Gaza Monday in the buffer zone Israel is carving out near its border. Hamas video showing the moment its fighters fired an anti-tank missile that would trigger a chain reaction and then a massive explosion. Israel's chief of staff at the scene today announcing an investigation has begun with 24 soldiers killed yesterday. It was the deadliest day for Israel since the war began. It comes as Israel lays siege to Gaza's second largest city. Bombs exploding over the skyline and bullets piercing the area's largest hospital. Inside the hospital, this boy's sister killed. He screams, Don't tell me my sister is dead. I want to play with her. The streets filled with the echoes of machine guns. Families now fleeing, some running hand in hand, bundles under their arms, cars piled high with bedding, others moving on donkey carts. Those desperate scenes continue. Matt Gutman joins us once again from Israel. Matt, any update on potential talks about a ceasefire? There is more momentum, uh, Lindsay. Uh, Brett McGurk, the U.S. Special Envoy, is in the region. He's going to be in Egypt, then Qatar. Uh, but because of the soaring hunger in Gaza, 570,000 people at risk of catastrophic hunger, Qatari mediators are now saying that it complicates their efforts to try to reach a deal. Those worsening humanitarian conditions do not make it easy to reach both a ceasefire and a hostage release. Lindsay. Matt Gutman from Tel Aviv for us. Thanks so much, Matt. Developing tonight, the U.S. has staged retaliatory airstrikes against Iran-backed militants in Iraq. This comes as Iran's foreign minister spoke one-on-one -on -one with ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz, who asked him point-blank about the chances of Iran going to war with the U.S. Tonight, the U.S. launching strikes on Iran-backed militants inside Iraq, direct retaliation for attacks on American military there over the weekend. It follows days of widespread U.S. retaliatory strikes on the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen. We ask Iran's foreign minister about the targeting of commercial and U.S. Navy ships. Are those attacks you support? This is the decision that the Yemenis have made in support of the people of Palestine. I think what they did and the decision is a brave one. But the minister denies Iran is giving Houthi rebels weapons, despite evidence. The Pentagon sent out pictures of those weapons showing they were from Iran. This, this is a, a show that they put on TV. If the United States has any information about this, then they have to provide the, the documents to us. The U.S. has warned Iran not to escalate the situation, but the minister told us that may well happen. It is highly possible that the war can spill over and to the other parts of the region. It is very high, uh, likely that it will widen. What do you think the chances are that Iran and the U.S. will be at war. We don't really want the war, the scope of the war, to expand. You cannot uh, continue the war in the war, Gaza and the West Bank to militarily engage with uh, the Yemen and then still talk about uh, how you don't want the war to, to widen. And Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, let's get back to those airstrikes in Iraq. What do we know about the targets hit tonight? They, they hit a headquarters, they hit a training area, and they hit a storage facility. And in that storage uh, facility, they say there were drones, rockets, and missiles. So they're obviously trying to take out as many as they possibly can. But this deterrent so far hasn't really worked. So I expect these 
strikes and counter strikes to go on for a while, Lindsay. All right, Martha Rad, it's good to be with you here in studio. And tonight. you too. Thank you. Tonight, winter weather alerts are in effect for the Northeast and Great Lakes with ice and snow from Michigan to New York to Massachusetts. After days of heavy rain across the eastern half of the country, there's now a flood threat in the Deep South. Ginger Z joins us now in Piermont, New York, with the latest forecast for us. Hey, Ginger. Hey there, Lindsay. Yes, we've got a winter weather advisory here, Westchester County, all the way north through Vermont. Most of that's for a wintry mix, and then on the northern side, snow, one to three inches, just enough to make things slick overnight. Then we are going to start the warm-up, which I will get to, but let's talk about that flood watch because so many states are involved, including Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. But that red area that you see highlighted there happens to be some of the spots that have the most exceptional drought, but they're going to get a lot of rain really fast rounds of it in the next 24 to 48 hours. So if you are in that red area and you get a flash flood warning, best idea is do not get in the car. That's how most people get injured or killed when we're talking about flash flooding. There will be dangerous winds and a tornado threat, but that's that larger yellow area. Just something for the next two days to keep in mind. And I mentioned it, but here are the numbers. We are going to see that January thaw. Washington, D.C. ends the week in the mid 60s, New York City in the mid 50s. And this isn't the end we will see a considerable warming trend going through the end of January and even to start February. We could even be using words like winter heat wave by the time we start February. Lindsay? Winter heat wave, that's a new one, but I'm here for it, Ginger, thank you. Waves smashed through a U.S. Army base in the South Pacific, busting down doors and knocking people over. ABC's Trevor Ault has the incredible images from the Marshall Islands. Tonight, recovery efforts underway after this terrifying video capturing an extreme wave hitting a U.S. Army base in the Marshall Islands. The wave striking Roy Namor Island Saturday night, home to some of the U.S. Army's most sophisticated space tracking equipment. The force of the water plowing through the doors. Another wave rushing in, taking out the windows. Get out of here! Pitching everyone into darkness as the lights go out. The Army saying only a few minor injuries were sustained, but about 80 people were evacuated to the nearby Kwajalein Atoll. The Army now assessing the damage by air, finding massive damage to the island's infrastructure and multiple areas under standing water. The Marshall Islands is a nation of low-lying islands and atolls, halfway between Hawaii and Australia. It's considered the front lines of climate change as rising sea levels contribute to powerful waves and flooding. These images showing damage to the chapel and dining facility. This is going to go down in Quadra's history books as one of its most challenging times ever in its 80-year history. Lindsay, officials at NOAA say the source of this swell appears to have been a storm north of the islands days prior. The Army says the recovery could take months. Lindsay. Trevor, thank you. Now to another mishap involving a Boeing jet, this time at Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson Airport, when a wheel came loose as a Delta flight was preparing for takeoff. Fortunately, all passengers on board did make it off safely. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, a Delta flight that was taxiing for takeoff from Atlanta bound for Columbia, getting this alarming message from a plane nearby. One of your nose tires just came off. It just rolled off the runway uh, behind you. The nose wheel falling off of the Boeing 757 and then rolling down an embankment at Hartsfield Jackson International Airport around 1115 Saturday morning. You have located the tire. Yes, sir, it was in a safety area on the south, south shoulder. Delta says passengers on flight 982 were removed from the aircraft and transferred to the gate. They were later moved onto a replacement aircraft. While experts say this was likely a maintenance issue, it's the latest in a series of incidents relating to a Boeing aircraft just this month. Oh my God, it's on fire. Sparks shooting from the engine of an Atlas Air Boeing 747 cargo plane departing Miami International Airport last week. And an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 forced to make an emergency landing when a door plug detached 16,000 feet in the air. Boeing's MAX 9s now temporarily grounded. And Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, the Boeing CEO will certainly have a lot to answer for. What can we expect tomorrow? Well, his team, they're not releasing many details, but we do know that Boeing CEO is reportedly meeting with lawmakers on Capitol Hill tomorrow regarding those MAX 9s. Lindsay. All right, Stephanie Ramos for us. Thanks so much, Stephanie.
Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin participated in a virtual meeting today, his first public appearance since his secretive hospitalization in December. Austin spoke to 50 nations providing Ukraine with military assistance about the ongoing efforts to counter Russian attacks. He spoke from his home office, saying he hopes to be back in the Pentagon soon. He was hospitalized due to complications following a prostate cancer procedure that caused a political firestorm when it was revealed that not even President Biden was made aware of his hospitalization. And a cherished and longtime broadcaster has passed away, Charles Osgood, the five-time Emmy winner. I'm Charles Osgood, and this is Sunday Morning. Charles Osgood, you see him right there, the five-time Emmy winner who anchored CBS Sunday Morning for more than two decades, passed away today at his home in New Jersey. He was 91 years old, and his family says the cause was dementia. Osgood also hosted the long-running radio program, The Osgood File, and was called CBS News's Poet in Residence. Closer to home, he also anchored ABC News Radio back in the 60s. CBS Sunday Morning will honor Osgood with a special broadcast this Sunday. ABC News Live continues our coverage of the New Hampshire primary, and we are getting a first look at the results in some places. Polls close at 7.30, but for most of the state, polls close in less than 30 minutes at 8 p.m. You can see a tight neck-and-neck -neck race uh, with uh, Donald Trump uh, less than one percentage point advantage over Nikki Haley, but again, only 5% of the vote in at this hour. We'll have much more coverage of the New Hampshire primary as well as today's biggest headlines. Another test of Trump's lead in the polls and Nikki Haley's campaign against him. We look at the New Hampshire primaries by the numbers. And after tragedy, a new start. Why the site of a deadly mass shooting is now reopening its doors. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. In our connected world, misinformation can masquerade as fact, eroding trust, dividing communities. But behind every share is a person with a decision. Join the movement for a more news literate America. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For non-stop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. And we are turning back to your voice, your vote, as results start trickling in from New Hampshire. Tonight, a look at the first in the nation primary. One significant factor we're watching, more than 40% of the state's registered undeclared voters, also known as independent voters, who are able to vote in the Republican or Democrat primaries. Also noteworthy, the 3,542 voters in the Granite State who switched their party affiliation this year from Democratic to undeclared, though the Secretary of State deemed that insignificant. Today's expected turnout, according to New Hampshire's Secretary of State, 410,000 voters, and that does not account for the more than 26,000 absentee ballots requested. As for the candidates vying to become the next Republican presidential nominee, Donald Trump is the front runner. That's according to polls held 17 events over 15 days in New Hampshire. Nikki Haley held 82 events on the campaign trail over the span of 41 days. And one final note to end on here. In the last 20 years, Iowa has not picked a single GOP winner has go who has then gone on to become president. New Hampshire has only picked one, Donald Trump. And we'll have much more coverage of the New Hampshire primary coming up. It's a small state and only the second contest, but we look at why New Hampshire has a big role in who becomes president. And we are one step closer to Hollywood's biggest night, this year's Oscar nominees and the notable snubs. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives and the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. A former congressman on trial, the return of a piece of art stolen by the Nazis, and this year's Oscar nominees and snubs. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. Former New York Congressman George Santos briefly appearing in federal court today. The outspoken Republican known for his often untrue statements, facing 23 felony charges, including wire fraud and making false statements to the Federal Election Commission. Two of his associates who were involved in the campaign have already pleaded guilty. Santos represented Long Island's third congressional district before being expelled from Congress last year in a bipartisan vote. The owners of the bowling alley and bar that was targeted during a mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine, say they will reopen. The two co-owners say they never thought they would want to reopen, but an outpouring of support from local community made them reconsider. The October 25th shooting was the deadliest mass shooting in Maine's history. 18 people killed, 13 were injured. The shooter died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound hours before police found him. A local pastor and his two children killed in a deadly house fire. Officials say the three others were taken to the hospital for injuries and have since been released. Pastor Mark Robinett was confirmed dead by his brother in a Facebook post. The brother says Robinett successfully evacuated his wife and two children before going back for his two other children who were still in the bedroom. They are still investigating what caused the fire. A painting that's been at UNC Chapel Hill for more than 50 years is being returned to its rightful owner in Europe. The painting is called The Studio of Thomas Couture. It was purchased by the Auckland Art Museum at UNC in the early 1970s. Recently, they discovered the Nazis stole the painting from a Jewish family during World War II. The painting is part of a collection of more than 450 works that belong to a prominent French and Jewish lawyer and art collector. About 20 pieces of art have been returned to the family, but this is the first from a museum in the United States. Dwayne The Rock Johnson is cementing the rights to his nickname. Johnson used the name for years but never owned the rights to it. In a new deal struck with the WWE, Johnson will join the board of their parent company and be granted rights to his name. The financial value of the transaction has not been disclosed. Johnson says he would be nowhere without the nickname, which is a tribute to his late father and former WWE champion, Rocky Johnson. A leading 13 Oscar nominations for Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, his highest grossing film to date, earning him a Best Director nod, Acting nods for Killian Murphy, Robert Downey Jr., and Emily Blunt, and a Best Picture nomination, among others. And in second place, it wasn't Barbie, as many had predicted. It was Poor Things, starring Emma Stone, directed by Yurgos Yathimos, the bizarre comedy scoring 11 nominations left out of the party in the acting categories Barbie star Margot Robbie and Killers of the Flower Moon star Leonardo DiCaprio, although Killers had the third most nominations with 10. Barbie director Greta Gerwig was also notably missing from the best director category. Jury selection starts today in the trial of a Michigan mom, Jennifer Crumbly. She and her husband are charged but being tried separately with involuntary manslaughter after their son shot and killed four students at his high school in 2021. He's now spending the rest of his life in jail. This is the first time that a parent could face prison time in connection to a mass shooting. ABC's Tim Pulliam has the story. All right. The trial for Jennifer Crumbly, the mom of convicted mass killer Ethan Crumbly, started with jury selection Tuesday. Jennifer and her husband James Crumbly facing involuntary manslaughter charges. Prosecutors trying their cases separately at their lawyer's request for their alleged roles in the shooting deaths of four students. In 2021, their son Ethan Crumbly shot and killed four of his classmates, wounded six others, and a staff member. 16-year-old Tate Myrie among the victims murdered. We are miserable. We miss Tate. 
Ethan pleaded guilty, now serving a life sentence. Prosecutors allege the boy's parents failed to recognize or report warning signs about their son's mental health before the attack and didn't tell school leaders they gave him the gun. Hours before the shooting, prosecutors say a teacher saw a note on Ethan's desk showing a drawing of a semi-automatic weapon pointed toward the words, the thoughts won't stop, help me. The notion that a parent could read those words and also know that their son had access to a deadly weapon that they gave him is unconscionable, and, it, and I think it's criminal. The couple has pleaded not guilty. Our thanks to Tim. The growing controversy tonight over the popular baby clothing company, Kite Baby. ABC's Lara Spencer has the story of a new mom who was fired from the company with her baby still in the NICU. A popular baby clothing company is facing a consumer boycott after an employee's request to work remotely while her newborn is in the hospital was denied. Hey everyone. Marissa Hughes of Texas adopted a son in December when she worked for Kite Baby, a company that sells infant sleep sacks and clothing. Hughes' premature baby is hospitalized in the neonatal intensive care unit nine hours away from her home in Dallas. She says her request to work remotely was denied and she was fired after not returning from her allotted two-week maternity leave. Hughes sharing her story online and the backlash was swift. Other parents sharing videos, tossing their Kite Baby products and vowing not to support the company. I will never give Kite Baby another dime of my money. Now the CEO of Kite Baby has posted two apology videos after her first was criticized as being insincere. I wanted to hop on here to sincerely apologize to Marissa. In her new apology video, so the CEO offering Hughes a new position with the company in addition to announcing policy changes. It was scripted. I memorized it. I, I just basically just read it. It wasn't sincere. This was a terrible decision. I was insensitive, selfish. But Hughes responding, saying it would not be appropriate for her to return to the company. We're really encouraged to hear that there will be some changes made for current and future employees at the company. Our thanks to Lara Spencer for that. And ABC News Live continues our coverage of the New Hampshire primary. For most of the state, polls close in just a few minutes at 8 p.m., ending the first in the nation primary. And we are getting a first look at results. You see there Donald Trump edging just a little bit, uh, what, six points over uh, Nikki Haley with just 11 percent of the vote in. Could be a long night ahead. On the Republican side, we are now down to those two, former President Donald Trump and Governor Nikki Haley. Weeks of touring and campaigning has all led to this moment. But how do New Hampshire voters feel? Our Joe O'Brien takes us to the Granite State. You might ask why should you pay attention to a small, sometimes cold, but often picturesque state nestled in New England? Because for decades, voters here in New Hampshire have helped pick your president. The question now is, will they do it again? It's great to be back in the Granite State. Hello, New Hampshire. I'm thrilled to be back in your beautiful state. The second state after Iowa in the Republican primary calendar, coming in first, even second in New Hampshire, can show the country a candidate has what it takes to make it all the way to the White House. You have some states that just love college football. Other places have amazing barbecue. What New Hampshire has is politics. After the Iowa caucuses thinned the Republican field, New Hampshire is now a two-person race between former President Donald Trump and his former U.N. ambassador, Nikki Haley. But winning the Granite State isn't easy. As its nickname suggests, voters in New Hampshire are hard as rock and aren't worried about speaking their minds and grilling candidates. I have been to a bunch of other town halls. Even nine-year-old Hannah Kesselring, who can't yet vote herself, has gotten in on the action. Attending events for every single Republican presidential hopeful, even asking some hard questions. Leading at least three reasons why you think and some others, Haley supporters think that you should be elected president. Which candidate stood out to you? I really like Nikki Haley because she always has a great answer to questions and she, she seems like a strong woman. I think it's important for people to come to these town halls mm -hmm. because you actually get a better opinion. Are you guys truly undecided voters? So we, when we started this process, I'll be honest with you, I was like full-fledged Trump. And 
what Hannah had made me realize is I'm going to listen to everybody. But even at events held by other candidates this year, we kept meeting New Hampshire voters who said they already had their minds made up. I'm still probably going to vote for Trump unless something happens. You know? Why is that? He's already gone through everything they can throw at him, and he's still alive. How many of you are coming to hear me for the first time? On the heels of a key endorsement from New Hampshire's Governor Chris Sununu, Haley is gaining some steam here. When we bring this home for Nikki Haley in New Hampshire, that's a complete reset button on the presidential campaign. But Trump is still dominating in most polls, despite facing four criminal indictments, pleading not guilty to all. So despite the fact that he's the leader of the party, he's polling as well as he is, you still view Trump as the underdog because of everything he's gone through. I, 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 well, not the underdog in the, in the race. Yeah. I view him as, but he's the kind, but I think Americans have a real admiration deep down, and a lot of people will, probably won't admit it, but I think there's a deep down admiration for getting beaten and bloodied the way he has, and yet not only still standing, but thriving in it. Whether or not you think Trump is an underdog, here in New Hampshire, voters like their Cinderella stories. This was the state that famously revived Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign. That New Hampshire tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. And helped define Ronald Reagan's 1980 run with this testy moment at a debate in Nashua. I am paying for this microphone. People saw the character of the man, a kind of toughness that was there. That's another aspect of why New Hampshire? Because you can come in here with very little resources and just submit yourself to the process, put yourself in front of the people, and if you have what it takes, you're going to see a response. I'm Dean Phillips. I'm running for president. On the Democratic side, that is exactly what Minnesota Congressman Dean Phillips is trying to do in a long-shot bid to wrestle his party's nomination away from President Biden. Are you ready for some change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. New Hampshire won't host the first official Democratic primary this year after the National Party decided to give that honor to South Carolina because of the state's more diverse population. It puts black voters at the front of the process in South Carolina. But New Hampshire is still holding a primary before South Carolina. It's just not sanctioned by the National Democratic Party, meaning President Biden won't be on the ballot. The president's supporters will have to write his name in. It is time to have young people have their voice in the White House, right? Phillips, along with Marianne Williamson, will be on the ballot here. So the millionaire Minnesota congressman sees an opening. When we surprise on January 23rd. And is using his own money to make his pitch to New Hampshire voters. What are you hearing from fellow Democrats? Not silence. Voters. Silence. Total silence. It's a disease of silence. They don't silence. like what you're doing. Believe it or not, I'm closer, I think, to your age than a lot of people running right now. I mean, you're on the stump talking about the age of the commander in chief, the head of their party. I don't talk. The, the, the country has opined on the age of both of these candidates, 75%. How can you say that 75% of the country, in just about every poll, does not want this to be the election, Donald Trump and Joe Biden? President Biden has shrugged off concerns about his age, pointing voters to his string of legislative accomplishments. There you go. Thank you. You're so welcome. Enjoy. Trailing President Biden in recent New Hampshire polls, Phillips's campaign continues. Nice to meet you. In places like Diz's Diner in Manchester, meeting voter after voter, table after table in typical New Hampshire style. Nice to see you guys again, too. Looking on is Judy Window, Diz's owner. So this second Saturday, we make holiday cards. She's seen all this before pretty much every four years, but is still keeping a close eye on every White House hopeful that passes through. I like to see how they interact with people, mm. what they do, what they do when the cameras aren't on them. Oh, interesting. That's, to me, really important. I, mm. I find that very interesting. Their character. Their character. And yeah. you get to see that in a way that the rest of the country doesn't. Right. You get the snippets and you get those sound bites. I'm not looking for those. I'm just looking for what happens behind the scenes. Our thanks to Jay O'Brien. We will see how it all unfolds in just a few hours. That is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. And stay with ABC News Live as our New Hampshire primary coverage continues right after this. This is ABC News Live.
with the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. In our connected world, misinformation can masquerade as fact, eroding trust, dividing communities. But behind every share is a person with a decision. Join the movement for a more news literate America. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Tonight, the final sprint to New Hampshire as the tabulation of the first votes in the Granite State is now underway. There's never been a movement like this. Make America great again. We work New Hampshire hard and we're excited to see what the day brings. We don't have a clear path to victory. It is now a two-person race, but is it too little too late for Nikki Haley to eke out a win against Donald Trump? Will the former president notch a big enough win to compel Haley to drop out entirely? The high-stakes fight for the nomination tonight as the candidates push their final messages to voters. And we do have to get rid of the chaos. I mean, I'll vote for him. He's the nominee, but border problem in America is definitely my top issue. The economy, parental rights, immigration, and much more. What are the big issues driving primary voters to the polls? And what, if anything, can tonight's results predict for November's general election? ABC News Live special coverage of the 2024 New Hampshire primary starts right now. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us on this special New Hampshire primary edition of Your Voice, Your Vote. The battle for the Republican nomination in New Hampshire. As we come on the air, the polls have just closed there, and this the first presidential primary of 2024. Early indications point to Trump leading in this two-person race, as Nikki Haley puts it, between a fella and a lady. And ABC News can say right now Trump is leading based on our analysis of the vote. You see him up there by about eight percentage points, but only 13 percent of the vote in at this moment. Former President Donald Trump is hoping he gets a decisive victory over former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley to clear his path to the general election. Haley is vowing to stay in it, and we'll have more from ABC's Eva Pilgrim on the ground with the Haley campaign in a moment. Looking at some preliminary exit polling data about just who voted today, you can see that number we'll be tracking all night. 47% of independent or undeclared voters. If that number holds, it would be an all-time record in the GOP primary in New Hampshire of 47% independent. We'll get to political director Rick Klein with more on those results. And ABC News can project Joe Biden will win the Democratic primary. Rachel Scott, though, joins us now from Nashua, New Hampshire, where she's been closely following the Trump campaign. Uh, Rachel, what's the mode of the Trump campaign heading into tonight? 
They are optimistic. Look, the former president said that he wanted to win by a landslide here in New Hampshire. He's really looking to send a message that he has this Republican nomination on lock. But I just talked to some senior advisors with the campaign, and they really sort of are tempering expectations here. One put it to me this way. A win is a win for Donald Trump in this state. They'll take it by any means. Sure, they would love to see those numbers if they are projected winners here a lot higher, closer to what they saw in Iowa. But they say that regardless of what happens here, if Donald Trump is able to secure a victory, it proves that he really has the momentum in this race. And it puts even more pressure on Nikki Haley to prove what state can she actually win. The former president here is hoping, fresh off of this victory in Iowa, to really send a clear message here that this is his nomination for the taking, Lindsay. And I know, Rachel, you had a chance to speak to voters right before the polls closed. What were they saying? Yeah. I really saw the strength of the independent vote for Nikki Haley. I met several voters who just didn't love the options here of the front runners on either side. They didn't love President Joe Biden. They weren't in love with former President Donald Trump. They believed that too much legal chaos and drama followed the former president, almost repeating back Haley's stump speech word by word to me. You also got a sense that they really felt the weight of what this primary means. You know, typically here in an election cycle, you have uh, maybe a dozen plus candidates on the ballot here. They have multiple options to choose from. The fact that this is down now to just a two-person race, they know that what they decide tonight can change the trajectory of this race entirely, Lindsay. Sure can. Rachel Scott will be checking back in with you. Thank you. The New Hampshire Secretary of State's office says that they've been fielding requests for additional Republican ballots from roughly nine states. The latest indications pointing to a higher than expected turnout. ABC's Eva Pilgrim joins us now also in New Hampshire tonight. Eva, what are you hearing on the ground there from New Hampshire voters? You know, Lindsay, it's really interesting. We have heard a lot of these voters talking about candidates and not issues. They were choosing based on who these people are and how they felt about them as, as a person, as opposed to those issues that were really important to them in Iowa. And, and that is in big part because this has come down to a two-person race. This was something that Nikki Haley really wanted to see. She wanted to be the alternative to Donald Trump. And a lot of what we saw today, you heard Rachel mention it, those independent, those undeclared voters waiting in line, feeling like they needed to do this, that they needed to participate in this primary. So many people we talked to while they were waiting in line to go into those polling sites told us that, you know, here in New Hampshire, they really take this job seriously. And they recognize that they're the first in the nation primary and that they aren't the ones who decide the whole thing. And they really felt like they shouldn't be the ones to decide the whole thing, that other states should also get to weigh in. But what they decide here, they know matters in a big way, Lindsay. And what does the path forward look like for Nikki Haley? Well, the path forward means going forward, right? So she already has a rally planned tomorrow in her home state of South Carolina. And they really think that if they can get a good strong showing here tonight, that they can continue on to South Carolina, on to Super Tuesday. You know, in South Carolina, uh, anyone can vote in that primary as long as they haven't voted in the Democratic primary. So she's really hoping to pull those independent, those more moderate voters, those people who just don't want to vote for Trump again. And then looking to Super Tuesday, 11 of those Super Tuesday states are open primaries or semi-open primaries. And she's hoping for that same game plan again. She needs to have a big show and tonight here with those independent undeclared voters, Lindsay. Yeah, many saying that the live free or die state could be do or die for Nikki Haley. Eva Pilgrim will be checking back in with you. Thank you as well. And now I want to bring back in ABC News political director Rick Klein. Rick, we know the polls just closed at 8 o'clock. Let's talk about the results that are just coming in. What are you seeing? Yeah, you're seeing a, a little bit of a lead for Donald Trump right now. Five, six points as the as the numbers start to flow in. I am co I'm concentrating on a couple of key parts of the state. I'm looking at Keene, New Hampshire. This is a place where Nikki Haley needed to be doing a little bit better than this, particularly right here in this part of the state. She's down in that city by about three, point, uh, three points. That's, that's a hard margin to, to overcome. I'm very interested in what's going on in Concord because this is a place where Nikki Haley is, is currently leading Donald Trump, but again, maybe not by the margin she needs to, and, and particularly here in Manchester. That's the state's largest city. We're seeing the numbers start to flow in, and we're seeing Donald Trump 
win that, win that city by a, a sizable enough margin. Those are the places that she needed to do well. There's definitely places in the state that she is making a statement tonight, but it doesn't look like that's the kind of statement that's going to put her over the top against Trump. And, and let's talk about the independent voters in this primary. Seemingly, they can be really pivotal. Uh, can you explain how New Hampshire allows independent or undeclared voters to vote in party primaries and how significant of a role they play in determining who comes out on top tonight? Yeah, it's totally different than Iowa. So undeclared voters, independent voters, can vote in either, either side's primary. And actually, they're doing so in what appear to be close to record numbers, if not record numbers tonight. 47% of the primary voters tonight actually aren't even Republicans. They say they're independent, they're undeclared voters. The previous record was about 45%. And those are Nikki Haley voters. In our exit polls and in all sorts of pre-election polling, we saw them breaking uh, two, two to one for Nikki Haley. So overwhelmingly, they are Haley folks. And it does appear like this electorate looks pretty favorable to her, certainly compared to Iowa. The question is how many come out. And those core Republicans, that is about half of the Republican primary. Those are much more likely to be Donald Trump voters tonight. All right, Rick Klein, thanks so much. On the Democratic side, ABC News can project Joe Biden will win that primary in New Hampshire. We want to turn to ABC's Zareen Shaw now, who joins us from the Dean Phillips camp. Zareen, uh, we just got this ABC News projection that Joe Biden will, in fact, win the Democratic primary, even though he was he needed to be written in, he wasn't actually on the ballot. How is the Dean Phillips team reacting there? Lindsay, it got very quiet very quickly when they saw the projections on the screen. But look, the goal for Dean was never to necessarily win. He knew he wasn't going to win in New Hampshire, but he had a feeling that he could embarrass the incumbent president, and he still might. It do we don't know if Joe Biden will hit that 80 percent mark. That is yet to be seen. A lot of previous presidents, including Obama, Clinton, they have hit that 80 percent mark in New Hampshire as an incumbent president or even even higher. Uh, a lot of presidents uh, do hit that mark. And I'm actually looking at an email that my producer is showing me right now that uh, ABC News projects that Biden will win statewide. Two percent of the expected vote. Biden leads with 80 percent of the vote. OK, well, so 80 percent, that is definitely not what Dean Phillips had hoped for. Uh, with Biden getting 80 percent, he had hoped he would get at least 20 or break that number. But it doesn't look like it's going to happen tonight, Lindsay. And Zarina, as you've reported, Phillips launched a long shot primary challenge to President Biden. Most people haven't heard of him. Why is there so much attention on him right now? I think the attention is because so many people say that they're frustrated with Joe Biden. They don't want to see a rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And that is exactly where we're headed, especially with these results tonight, Lindsay. And you spoke to Dean Phillips recently. What did he have to say about why voters should vote for him instead of writing in Joe Biden's name? He said a couple of things. He said chaos. He talked about the economy. He says people are really hurting. He says people are not talking about the issues in this moment. He says Joe Biden needs to debate him, to talk about those specific issues versus leaving it to Donald Trump to eventually win, which he which he felt would happen, and then uh, have the race between these two people, another rematch from 2020, essentially. And, and you've reported the DNC wanted the more diverse state of South Carolina to be the first primary battle in this election. Are people in New Hampshire feeling snubbed at all by that? You know, Lindsay, snubbed isn't even the right word. I mean, it's politically wounded, right? We sat down with six people in a panel over the weekend, all of them independents. None of them wanted to go for Joe Biden. I mean, three people, in fact, from that panel were interested in Dean Phillips, which really surprised us. I would say politically wounded is a much better word than snubbed. There's a lot of hurt feelings. I mean, look, there's a, over a hundred year history in New Hampshire of being the first primary in the state. This is not something that they're used to uh, going after South Carolina. All right, Zareen Shaw from a very loud headquarters there. We appreciate your reporting. And we do want to announce that ABC News can project that Donald Trump will win the New Hampshire primary. Still early, uh, but the numbers are on his side. And I want to bring in ABC News political analyst Reince Priebus, an ABC political director or contributor and Democratic strategist, though she could direct it as well, Donna Brazil. Uh, thank you both uh, for joining us. Just want to start off uh, getting both of your reaction that just uh, 11 minutes after the hour, we're already calling uh, that this race is going to be won by, by Donald Trump. Uh, Reince, we'll start with you. Well, uh, look, I don't think it's a surprise. I think we saw this coming for a long time, and really the only issue now is how big the margin is for Donald Trump. And, and this is, as you've just talked about, this is the best case scenario 
for Governor Haley. You have half of the voters here are either independents or Democrats who are having fun in a Republican primary. And I just got to say, look, if, if it's, you know, 10 or more, I think the pressure on Nikki Haley is going to be enormous. And I think that's really what this is all about tonight. And it's early, you're right, but really in the middle of the state, you know, northwest of Concord, that's a place where Nikki Haley's got to be doing better than where these early returns are. The only question now is, you know, how, how big is that margin for President Trump? And Donna, your reaction? Well, let's see how, how large the margin is, but I, I do believe that this is not going to provide Governor Haley with any momentum, and I also believe that uh, the Trump campaign should not take a pre, uh, what I call a premature uh, victory lap until all of the returns are in. Look, I, I want to react to something um, Mr. Chairman said, and that is Democrats had to change their registration months ago to participate in the Republican primary. What we're seeing tonight, at least if the, some of the exit polls are accurate, is that the non-affiliated voters have increased their participation in the Republican primary. So these are moderate in some cases. These are not as evangelical or religious voters, more college-educated voters, perhaps in some parts of the state. But I think it's impressive that um, Ms. Haley uh, has been able to generate the kind of enthusiasm and consolidate the, what I call the non-anti-Trump uh, voters. And, and Ryan, when we were talking just last week with you and Donna, I believe you both were on the same page as thinking that uh, it was going to be somebody was going to have to get out of the race just within the next few days, if not by the end of the week. You were right about that with regard to, to Ron DeSantis. How much pressure will be on Nikki Haley if she doesn't overperform tonight? Well, I think there's going to be, if she doesn't, you know, overperform or, you know, have some kind of talking point when this is all over, no, the, the, the pressure is going to be tremendous because it's not just going to come from donors. It's going to come from media types, talker types, Republican leader types. So, you know, everything's on the line here for Nikki Haley tonight. There's no doubt about it. It's early. I know that. But certainly the pressure is mounting. And, and by the way, the, Fed, the, the caucus in Nevada is coming on February 8th. Nikki Haley is not participating in that. So there's not going to be any good news there either. And there's going to be another victory speech uh, in a couple weeks in Nevada that she's going to have to contend with. And Ryan, staying with you for a moment, ABC News can now project that Joe Biden will win the New Hampshire primary. Based on exit polling and voting analysis, how do you think tonight's results will impact the momentum of, of President Biden's campaign? Well, you know, look, you know, I, I don't think it has any impact one way or the other. I think, you know, non-participation, you know, the, the beat goes on for President Biden, and he's just got to worry about the economy and and, and seeing how he can do there to, to, to increase his chances of winning. And, and, and he's going to, I'm sure they're working on that, and that's what they need to do to win. But right now, all the, all the, all the attention's on the Republican side of the aisle tonight. And Donna, before we let you go in this hour, uh, curious, when you see how overwhelming the support is just uh, so far going in Iowa, New Hampshire, just a few hours in tonight, uh, your concern level about Joe Biden going head to head potentially again against uh, Donald Trump? Well, I constantly tell people that Joe Biden has been underestimated before, so don't underestimate him at any time. And look, he, he was not on the ballot. In fact, I believe there were over 20 Democrats on the ballot, including Marianne Williamson, who competed in 2020. Just remember, Joe Biden knows how to win. He knows that this is about the economy, the national security of this country. Yes, border security included. But Joe Biden has shown time and time again he can deliver. Four electoral votes. The general election might start a little bit earlier this year, but Joe Biden won New Hampshire four electoral votes in 2020. So I think the campaign is ready. You might have heard the news already that there, there's a little bit of a campaign shakeup or they're adding more uh, players to the field. And that's a good thing because I think the campaign got to get out and start working very hard. All right. Donna Brazil, Ryan's Priebus, we thank you both so much for joining us. Appreciate it.
And we do want to remind those who are just joining us that ABC News has already called the New Hampshire primary in favor of Donald Trump. Even though it's an early night, uh, he seems to have enough of a dominance there with those voters uh, that ABC News can already say that he is the winner of the New Hampshire Republican primary. For more on this, the reaction, I want to bring in ABC News contributing correspondent Rachel Bade. Rachel, as we see, Nikki Haley uh, trailing behind Trump in the polls. Her team says that she won't drop out if Trump wins New Hampshire. Is there any hope of her being able to uh, live to see another day if she doesn't win tonight? Yeah, Lindsay, for campaigns, you really need two things to keep them alive, either voter support or a lot of money. Unlike Ron DeSantis, who raised a lot of money early in the cycle and then spent a lot, actually, his critics would say wasted a lot, he didn't have a lot to show after his defeat in Iowa. Nikki Haley, she's in a different position here. She actually says that she has enough money to continue her campaign through March. So even if she doesn't do well tonight, there's a chance that we could see her potentially stick around for a while. The question I have is, to what end? If she's not close to Trump tonight in terms of her finish, if she's far behind more than 10 points, she's going to have to make a case to her donors that she's going to get momentum from somewhere. And, you know, they're not going to want to invest in her, Lindsay, unless they can see down the line that this is a smart investment and that she's actually going to go somewhere. So it's going to be hard for her. And money aside, even though that's a big part of it, does she have a path forward? Yeah, Lindsay, it's really hard to see a path forward for Nikki Haley if she doesn't do well in New Hampshire tonight. I mean, look, the electorate there is the best it could possibly be for her. Number one, we talked all night, you've talked all night about how uh, independent voters can actually vote. Uh, and also, it's a very educated electorate. People, 40% of folks in New Hampshire actually have four-year college degrees. These are folks that Nikki Haley traditionally does very well with. Now, if she can't do well there, she doesn't actually have a, a lot of shots to do better in the coming days and weeks. Nevada is next. Rachel That's Bade, gonna go I gotta interrupt Trump. you. I hate to, but Nikki of Haley course. has just taken to the stage there in New Hampshire. We want to take a listen to what mm -hmm. she has to say. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, what? I love you, Nikki. I love her too. What a great night. God is so good all the time. Thank you, New Hampshire, for the love, the kindness, the support, and a great night here tonight. Thank you so much. I want to first say thank you to my husband, who I know is watching right now. I love you. We're excited to have you. I want to thank my kids who are here, Rita and Naylan and Josh, who have really kind of stepped up and um, just given me the support I need. You know, you, you really pull on your family when something like this happens, and um, I am incredibly blessed by their support. I have my parents at home, and I will always say that the way they raised me to know that we lived in the best country in the world, but to also know that the best way you appreciate your blessings is to give back. Thank you, Mom and Dad. I love you so much. <laughs> to my siblings, to my in-laws, um, to everybody back at home, to Vicki for helping me take care of Mom and Dad. Thank you for that. You know, I will tell you, it has been, it feels like it's been a lifetime, but it has been almost a year that we've been campaigning in New Hampshire, touching every hand, um, answering every question, being the last person to leave. And we had um, the most amazing thing happen is the second that we got the endorsement from Governor Chris Sununu. <laughs> I mean, a true governor that doesn't stand behind a podium. He shows up at a diner. He shows up at the brewery. He loves the people of New Hampshire. He has been with me every single day at every single event. Chris, I couldn't have done it without you. And I want to thank someone who was with me on day one. He's a patriot. 
He's a hardcore conservative. And he is my friend. General Don Baldick and Sharon, thank you so, so much. I want to congratulate Donald Trump on his victory tonight. He earned it, and I want to acknowledge that. Now, you've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves, saying this race is over. Well, I have news for all of them. Woo! New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the yeah! nation. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. in this campaign, there were 14 of us running, and we were at 2% in the polls. Well, I'm a fighter. And I'm scrappy. And now we're the last one standing next to Donald Trump. Today, we got close to half of the vote. We still have a ways to go, but we keep moving up. For a lot of people, politics is way too personal. It's not personal for me. I voted for Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his cabinet. I agree with many of his policies. I decided to run because I'm worried about the future of our country and because it's time to put the negativity and chaos behind us. We have an economy that's crushing middle-class Americans. We have a border that is totally open and dangerous, creating a disaster in our country. Unbelievable! We have, school, <laughs> we have schools that are failing too many of our children, and we have a world on fire with a war in Europe and the Middle East and a huge and growing threat from China. And then you look at Washington, D.C. We have a Congress that fights about everything and accomplishes nothing. And we have Joe Biden in the White House making one bad decision after another, when he's making any decisions at all. Our country's in a real mess. is, who's going to fix it? With Donald Trump, Republicans have lost almost every competitive election. We lost the Senate. We lost the House. We lost the White House. We lost in 2018. We lost in 2020. And we lost in 2022. The worst kept secret in politics is how badly the Democrats want to run against Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah. Trump's a loser. He's a loser. They know Trump is the only Republican in the country who Joe Biden can defeat. You can't fix you can't fix the mess if you don't win an election. You want to win. A Trump nomination is a Biden win and a Kamala Harris presidency. Donald Trump. I defeat
defeat Biden handily. With Donald Trump, you have one bout of chaos after another. This court case, that controversy, this tweet, that senior moment. You can't fix Joe Biden's chaos with Republican chaos. The other day, Donald Trump accused me of not providing security at the Capitol on January 6th. No, I've long called for mental competency tests for politicians over the age of 75. <laughs> Trump claims he'd do better than me in one of those tests. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. But if he thinks that, then he should have no problem standing on a debate stage with me. Most Americans do not want a rematch between Biden and Trump. No. The first party to retire its 80-year-old candidate is going to be the party that wins this election. And I think it should be the Republicans that win this election. So our fight is not over, because we have a country to save. In the, in the next two months, millions of voters in over 20 states will have their say. We should honor them and allow them to vote. And guess what? In the next two months, Joe Biden isn't gonna get any younger or any better. <laughs> We'll have all the time we need to defeat Joe Biden. When we get to South Carolina, Donald Trump's gonna have a harder time falsely attacking me. The great people of South Carolina know I cut their taxes. They know, they know I signed the toughest illegal immigration bill in the country. They know we passed voter ID and tort reform and ethics reform, and they know we moved 35,000 people from welfare to work. Yes. Every time I've run for office in South Carolina, I've beaten the political establishment. They're lined up against me again. That's no surprise. But South Carolina voters don't want a coronation. They want an election. And we're gonna give them one. Because we are just getting started. Thank you for the energy. And there you have Nikki Haley with an energetic crowd. She has a lot of enthusiasm still, uh, not at all uh, ind indicative of uh, her performance tonight, potentially. She did congratulate Donald Trump on his victory, saying that he deserves it, but went on to say uh, that the race is not over, declaring that New Hampshire is the first in the nation 
it is not the last. And I want to go to Eva Pilgrim, who is right there uh, with the Nikki Haley camp in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, Eva, just uh, we feel like we're feeling it through the TV that that crowd is pumped up, energetic, excited to go on to her home state of, of South Carolina. What sense are you getting on the ground there? Oh, definitely. You can feel the energy coming off the crowd. And you can also feel the energy coming off of Nikki Haley. This is the most animated that we have seen her yet, the most excited. I don't know if you could hear when she first walked out on the stage, but the announcer said, introducing the next president of the United States. It was very clear when she came out that she was not about to drop out of this race, that she is ready to go home to South Carolina. And she she made this comment, I'm a fighter and I'm scrappy. And she threw some punches here tonight, really pointing out the ages of both President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump, making comments that whichever party gets rid of their elderly 80-year-old candidate will be the party that wins. And she challenged Donald Trump to a debate saying, you know, she is at almost every campaign stop that we've seen her in, she's talked about this mental competency test that she thinks that all politicians over the age of 75 should complete to prove that they are competent to hold office. And she talked about how Donald Trump has said that he thinks he could do better on that test than her. And that's when she challenged him to the debate stage, putting it out there for Trump. If you think you're more competent, take the stage against her. She's headed home to South Carolina, where she talked about the fact that she has long been the candidate fighting the uphill battle. She's used to being the underdog. She has been the underdog in every race that she has ever run in. And in South Carolina, you know, Lindsay, I'm a native South Carolinian. The people of South Carolina know Nikki Haley, and they know what she did for the state. She's made the comment it will be much harder for Donald Trump to lie about her in her home state, Lindsay. All right. We thank you so much, Eva Pilgrim. Heading off to South Carolina next. We'll be checking back in with you shortly, and we'll see if that debate that she threw out there ever does happen between her and Donald Trump. In the meantime, I want to take a look at some preliminary exit polling. Joe Biden, did he legitimately win the 2020 election of those who were polled today? 46% saying yes, 51%, the majority there, saying no, he did not legitimately win. But if we break out just the Trump voters, just 16% say that Joe Biden won. 82% say Joe Biden is not legitimately the president. Meanwhile, 83% of Haley voters say that Biden won. And joining us in the conversation now, ABC News political contributor, former Republican representative from New York, John Katko, and political strategist, Alencia Johnson. Thank you both uh, for joining us. Alencia, what do you make of that exit polling divide? You have a majority of there. Again, granted, uh, we're talking uh, for the most part about Republican voters as well as independent voters, but, but saying there that they don't think that Joe Biden is a legitimate president. I think it speaks to the culture that we unfortunately live in, sown by former President Donald Trump, and to question elections if you don't get your way. Listen, I was a senior advisor to Biden's 2020 campaign, so and I know that we legitimately won. But I think it's also setting us up for what is to come in 2024 should, and as Democrats, we believe that Donald Trump loses on election night. We saw what happened on January 6th because people believe this big lie and they will continue to do that. And it is really challenging that Donald Trump's base, the base of the Republican Party, continues to believe this way and that you only have, you know, a slim margin of, of, of difference in the people who do believe that Joe Biden was, was elected um, as president. And so it's going to be an interesting year. I want to point out something, though, that Nikki Haley uh, mentioned in her speech when she talked about Congress and the dysfunction of Congress. She went as far to say that, but did not go far enough to say that it is because of the Republican-controlled Congress that can't pass bills, because she is trying to make sure that she does not turn off this Republican base that is sowing this discord, that is continuing to perpetuate this big lie and signal that they will challenge in, uh, the election results should Donald Trump not win. And so 
I'm concerned about this because we know that this year could be extremely violent. There have been a lot of polls that we've talked about here on ABC that show that the political violence continues to rise at, in this election, in this current climate that we're in. And it looks like the Republican Party is leading that charge based on those polling and disaggregating that. And, you know, while Nikki Haley's base doesn't believe that, Unfortunately, she more than likely is not going to be the nominee. And so it is something to pay attention to as we continue throughout this election cycle. Uh, John Keck, I want to bring you in here. You know, the polls closed right at eight. Just minutes after that, you had ABC News calling it already for Donald Trump, though many had thought that this potentially would be a long night trying to figure out uh, who was winning or potentially even if Nikki Haley could do it. Uh, your reaction to these results? Well, quite frankly, I think that uh, I'd be a little concerned if I was Donald Trump. Uh, Nikki Haley went from having 14 opponents in Iowa to just one, and she got 20% of the vote. The first time she went one-on-one -on -one with Trump, she more than doubled that number. So she's gaining. She's the only one, including Trump, where her numbers are consistently going up. So that's something to look at. That's an argument that she needs to make about why she should stay in the race a little longer, at least. See what happens in South Carolina then on Super Tuesday when there's multiple states that have a similar electorate to New Hampshire where independents can vote and what have you. So I don't think this is a devastating loss at all. And I was just looking at some numbers. About 80,000 votes cast, and she's got, uh, and Trump's got a net benefit out of 80,000 votes of 5,000. So she's not, I don't see this as a massive landslide victory for Trump tonight. And if it isn't, I think that makes him a little bit nervous. And then, you know, the longer she can drag this out, let's not forget he's got four criminal trials this year. And even Republicans who support him say that if he if he is convicted in any of those trials, 25% of them are gonna uh, leave him. I will, I will end with what, I, what uh, Lencia started with. It was a legitimate election last time. Uh, Biden kicked Trump's butt on the last election. There's no question about it. All of uh, uh, Trump's top advisors told him so. And it is scary that after all this time that people still believe that Biden is not the legitimate president. That is a frightening thing. And that's another argument why we need to get past this stuff. And I think that's what Nikki Haley is talking about, saying we need to get past the drama. We need to start leading again. We need to start getting things done in Congress. And that comes from both sides now, not just Republicans. And I think you need the right person in the White House to do that. And I, I just don't see Donald Trump as bringing people together. He's going to further divide them. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, John, that the momentum is there for Nikki Haley, but is it potentially too little too late? I mean, next stop is South Carolina, of course, her home state, where, again, early polls, preliminary polls show she's potentially going to take a shellacking there. Yeah, I think the early polls in New Hampshire said the same thing. So um, let's see what happens. And uh, you know what? If she's making South Carolina is a big argument, uh, and that's uh, based on the results tonight, uh, I don't think we should just throw in the towel. I wouldn't if I were her, especially since she's saved an awful lot of her money and she's got a, a lot of money left to, to spend. Let's see what happens in South Carolina. That's her home turf. Uh, if she gets her teeth kicked in, well, then you reevaluate. But I'm a little troubled after having one primary, this very first primary in a small state, everyone's saying it's over. Well, let's, let's, let's play this out a little longer. There, I've never seen a, a presidential candidate with more baggage than Donald Trump has. He's managed it beautifully. It's managed to turn it around on others. But the fact that remains, he's got a lot of baggage to deal with this year. And that is a wild card here that we don't know how that's going to play out. And so if she's keeping it close and she doubled up her results from last last election in Iowa. Uh, let's see what happens going forward. I, I don't think this is over yet. She's got an uphill road for sure, but it ain't over. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Alencia, I want to bring John Katko's point to you uh, with regard to, to Trump having a lot of baggage, though we've seen it time and time again. Every time he gets uh, potentially another court case, it seems like he rises in the polls. You have said prior to this night that you feel that Trump is going to be the nominee regardless of the outcome. Why is that? Well, look, the base of the Republican Party, unfortunately, is very much energized by Donald Trump. They are Donald Trump voters, which is why you hear Republicans who are still in office, they may not agree with Donald Trump, but they play into that form of politics because those are the people that keep them in power and they want to remain in power. And so 
ba this base gets galvanized every single time something comes out about Donald Trump and these court cases because for some reason they believe that there's this conspiracy theory around Donald Trump versus the actual legitimate charges against him. So it is concerning, yet it is very clear where the Republican Party, their base, their voters, not the leaders who want a change and to distance themselves from Donald Trump, but it's the people who are electing Republicans in office, they enjoy Donald Trump for whatever reason it may be. Now, the Democrats, we are preparing for a Biden-Trump matchup and we won in 2020 and are hoping to do so again in 2024 and planning to do so in 2024 given all of the drama around him that Nikki Haley is talking about but to John's point about Nikki's victory here I will call it a victory because she is the lone person standing and she is chipping away at some of Donald Trump's enormous lead. And that is going to push the Republican Party and a lot of the voters along as well to think about, hey, we need to challenge Donald Trump in some of the ways in which he's campaigning. And she has some leverage. She's going to have delegates and she's going to stay in this race. I actually believe we should stop trying to call these the, the primaries done by just two states early on without going through at least Super Tuesday. And so it will be interesting to see. Uh, I do believe that Donald Trump will be the nominee, but we have to wait and see just how weak of a nominee he will be and that's all contingent on how Nikki Haley continues to perform throughout the primaries. A wait and see, something many of us, I think, can agree on. Alencia Johnson and John Katko, thank you both for your insight. Appreciate it. And Nikki Haley has said just a few minutes ago she is looking ahead to South Carolina. Let's take a listen. Now, you've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves, saying this race is over. It's not over. <laughs> Well, I have news for all of them. Woo! New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the yeah! nation. <laughs> this race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. Mayor Alice Parks joins us now from that sweet state of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, Mary Alice, as we just heard there, she certainly has a lot uh, on the line with regard to South Carolina. Yeah, Lindsay, she's coming here to Charleston tomorrow. And the big question is, is this Haley's home turf or is it Trump territory? I mean, her theory of the case has always been that if she can hold her own in New Hampshire, then she gets to come home. She gets to take advantage of the fact that she was a popular governor in this state that votes early. The only problem for her could be that Donald Trump might be even more popular. I talked today to Chad Connolly. He was the chair of the state party here while she was governor, and he repeated a line to me Lindsay that I have heard a lot, which was that South Carolina liked Nikki Haley, but seems to love Donald Trump. I mean, that is what the polls show. We have seen in the polls, like in so many states, the former president uh, with 60 points. I mean, these huge margins. And the reality is South Carolina looks a lot more like somewhere like Iowa in terms of the electorate than somewhere like New Hampshire. I mean, a few numbers for you. In 2016, 16% of um, South Carolina GOP respondents in our exit polls identified as evangelicals. That's even more than in Iowa, where we know Trump did so well with that group. Uh, a number, 38% uh, say they were very conservative. That's double digits more than the number who said they were very conservative uh, voting there in New Hampshire. So big picture, this looks like Trump territory. But Voters here don't take to the polls, at least in the Republican primary, for nearly a month. Nikki Haley's team, Lindsay, has said that she has all of that time to campaign here in her home state where she wants to prove all the critics wrong. She's going to have to deliver as a gov former governor here. She cannot afford uh, an embarrassing showing somewhere like this, Lindsay. And, and you're right. Uh, an important distinction to make if you're saying that they seem to like her but love him. Is the Trump campaign focusing on South Carolina the same way that Haley is? Uh-uh. 
arguably more so. I mean, I talked to the current uh, state party chair who's here, and he told me that far and away, it is the Trump team that has more staff, more resources, more volunteers here on the ground, that he has really built out an apparatus here. I mean, she really has been so focused on New Hampshire. I mean, New Hampshire was where she wanted to deliver, uh, where she had the, the sort of the backing. You know, I'm thinking about just a few days ago there in New Hampshire, where Trump showed up on stage with all these out-of-towners. Lindsay, that's a little bit weird to bring elected officials from another state, uh, but he brought the current governor of South Carolina, the lieutenant governor of South Carolina, the speaker of the House here to New Hampshire as this power play, a flex move, to try to show that even in her own state, there are so many elected officials who are sticking with him, who are sticking with him and picking him over Trump. I mean, the latest example, uh, Congresswoman Mace, I mean, she's from arguably one of the more moderate parts of this state. She barely won her election the first time in 2020, and even she decided to endorse Trump instead of Haley. Really telling and flexes there, as you say. Mary Alice Parks, our thanks to you. And as it has been stated, ABC News is projecting that Donald Trump will win the New Hampshire primary. Former President Donald Trump is, of course, juggling a campaign for the White House, along with several criminal and civil court cases, including an election interference trial. ABC's Aaron Katursky joins us now to break it all down. Aaron, uh, how has the former president integrated his legal issues into his campaign? They're one and the same at this point, Lindsay. Wherever former President Trump goes, whatever courthouse, he makes sure to try and get as much attention as he can, whether that's by lashing out at the judge or the case, or, or simply by speaking extemporaneously in the hallway because it gets the attention on him. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about his legal issues. It can be about anything, but, but he's trying to press it to his advantage. We've seen him in New York just recently. As he gets ready to testify, he says, in the civil defamation damages trial against E. Jean Carroll. He's complained about that, but this week he is expected to testify. And he has said equally disparaging things about judges, prosecutors, and others connected to all of his criminal cases as well. And when is he expected to be in court next? In theory, Thursday, if everybody's healthy, there's been some uh, some health issues in the federal court in Manhattan, but if everyone's healthy, the case would resume on Thursday morning. And former President Trump's attorney says he does intend to testify. That testimony could be rather limited, given that the trial is only about money, what uh, Donald Trump must pay, if anything, to E. Jean Carroll for defaming her when he denied raping her back in 2019. Uh, and the, the question will be, can he stick to the restrictions uh, on, on his testimony and also his behavior, because as you know, Lindsay, the judge nearly booted him out of court. Uh, yeah, we have seen that, uh, Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you. And now let's take a look at some additional preliminary exit polls. What issue was most important for voters tonight? Overall economy, the top issue there, 36% immigration, 31%, followed by foreign policy, and then abortion at just 11%. But if we break out just Trump voters, Immigration is their top issue with 45 percent, nearly half, uh, putting that over uh, their concerns about the economy. And then 8 percent with foreign policy, only 6 percent with abortion. U.S. Border Patrol apprehensions hit a record high in December of last year, a record that we haven't seen in two decades. In the last debate with Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, immigration policy took center stage when the two said that they would focus on deportation. Meanwhile, President Biden's deportation efforts have reached above the two million mark. ABC's Maria Villarreal joins us now. And Maria, uh, do we think the border will still be a, pro a top priority for voters in New Hampshire? I mean, we're seeing it there based on the exit polls, and they are quite a distance away uh, from the Texas border. 100%. Look, we saw it in Iowa. Um, it's very clear that for the voters in New Hampshire, it is still a top priority right behind the economy. And a lot of that just has to do with the fact that, you know, immigration might bleed into all of the other issues that we're talking about right now, the economy, because could this be a drain on our economy having to provide for all of these migrants? Um, you know, on top of that, the idea of crime potentially in their backyards. And, and then we go back to what we were talking about before, Lindsay, the idea that it, this, this is a fear-driven 
driven priority for a lot of voters, pushing them to get to the polls. And the reason why those numbers you just cited right now are important to both sides is for the Republicans, as you were talking about, the amount of people that are coming through our borders, and then you're cross-checking that with the deportations. It does seem like some very scary numbers coming in through our borders and into our country. On the flip side of it, you know, Democrats will hopefully will start to hear them talk a little bit more about those numbers as well, explaining that, you know, while, yes, we are seeing, you know, record numbers at the border, we're also seeing a record number of repatri uh, repatriations, uh, deportations, expulsions by this particular administration. So, you know, their stance will be, we are taking a very hard stance on immigration. You're just not able to see it as much through all of the chaos and conversation that is coming from the Republican Party. And you and I have discussed this before, Maria. the fear uh, tactics that are, that are being used. How much of an issue do you think that immigration is going to be overall during the 2024 election season? Well, it's been very clear as we speak with agents along the border, the Department of Homeland Security, um, they, are, they are continuing to prepare for large groups, large mass numbers coming through our borders. If that continues to be the case, then we will continue to see the Republican Party hang their hat on this. I mean, not to mention that we're continuing to see, you know, border security funding being discussed in Washington, D.C. We can't seem to come to a compromise. And President Trump has inserted him into those, himself into those conversations already. So, you know, I think as of right now, this will continue to be played out by the Republican Party as chaos and, you know, and an issue that has not been focused on by, the, by this particular administration well enough. They will capitalize on the fact that we continue to see these large numbers, even though that's not necessarily just attributed to this administration not doing enough. We are seeing this around the globe right now, uh, an, a mass exodus and migration from all countries around, around the globe. And then, yes, a lot of them are coming here to the U.S., but this is clearly something that that strikes fear into the people living here, the voters. They are concerned if this is happening in cities like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. Could this happen in my own backyard? And yes, that will motivate me to go to the polls. And what's fascinating in particular, when you look at a state like New Hampshire, it's 2,300 miles away from the El Paso border crossing there in, in, from Texas into Mexico. And yet you see uh, a large number of uh, the majority of, of those Republican voters in New Hampshire saying that that is their number one issue, immigration. Last week, we saw similarly the same thing in the Iowa caucus. And right after that, in his speech, Trump talked about an invasion of migrants at the southern border, the millions coming through. Do you think at any point he'll back down from this, or, or it seems to be effective? Absolutely not. He will not back down from this. This is his biggest issue. This is what he falls back on. If you talk about January 6th, he's going to fall back on everything that he has done at the border. He will show pictures of himself touching the wall in South Texas. I mean, one day after January 6th happened, he was down in South Texas, you know, signing a wall that he helped construct, for example. So to him, this is the issue that he has won, and it resonates with voters clearly. I mean, we're talking about 36 percent in the economy um, and 31 percent for immigration. So clearly the voters agree with him. I will say what's interesting to me tonight is to listen to Nikki Haley not really touch on this subject at all, even though she knows it does resonate with Trump voters. And she needs some of those voters to come over to her side. The one thing she does hang her head on is during her um, during her time as governor in South Carolina back in 2011, they put one of the hardest immigration bills into play, SB 20. Um, part of that bill was uh, pulled apart through the you know through the justice system, but some of it still lingers. And so for her, she's going to continue referring back to that. But I do think there's going to come a time where she's going to have to go toe to toe on immigration policies, and on top of that, she's going to have to fact check Trump and all of the things he's done. Or or hasn't done, for that matter, on the issue of immigration. And we'll see how she handles that. Maria Villarreal, always appreciate you joining us. And want to bring back in our ABC News political director, Rick Klein. Rick, we have about 25% of the vote in at this point. What are you seeing as far as margins in key areas? Yeah, right now you're seeing Donald Trump with about a 10, 11 point lead. Frankly, even though there's a lot of vote out, I don't see a lot of places where Nikki Haley can really cut into that gap. And look, the map right now is looking very, very Trump favorable, but there are some dots of the state, some places that Nikki Haley's running relatively strong. Just the question is, how strong is it? Looking right here at, at Portsmouth on the, on the seacoast, right now, Nikki Haley's winning by about 30 points there. Now, that's a good night for her, right? 
Frankly, she should be doing a lot better in a place like that. Similarly, uh, right now, she's down in Nashua by about 10 points to, to, to Donald Trump. Looking over in Keene, a very narrow Haley lead right now. We're just not seeing the kinds of numbers she would need. And, and I'm really focused tonight on, on Manchester. That's the state capital. That's a place where you've got a lot of uh, potential battlegrounds, uh, voters, a lot of Democrats that might be coming out. And right now, Donald Trump is up by about 15 points in that city, a fur further above the, the statewide margin. So I think the story of the night is likely to be a decisive Trump victory, but a, a kind of a sub-story to that is the kind of voters that came out, whether they're independent, moderate voters, uh, women probably a lot stronger for Nikki Haley than they were for Donald Trump. There are definitely cracks out there that Donald Trump has to try to heal when he looks at the Republican coalition, but this is going to be a decisive win for Donald Trump. He is hitting the numbers where he needs to and swamping uh, Nikki Haley in much of the state. All right, Rick Klein will check back in with you. Thank you so much. In their first joint appearance of the 2024 campaign, shortly before ABC News projected him the winner of the Democratic primary in New Hampshire, President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris held an abortion rights rally in Virginia. Here's what the president had to say. Let there be no mistake. The person most responsible for taking away this freedom in America is Donald Trump. And Selena Wang joins us now. Selena, the president's rally was his counter-programming offered to the American people. Uh, give us a sense of his message. Yeah, well, what really struck me is the number of times he directly went after Donald Trump, and that was before we got these projected results, and now we are hearing directly from the campaign. They're officially reacting, saying that this all but seals the deal for Donald Trump as the GOP Republican nominee, and they say, quote, the election-denying anti-freedom MAGA movement has completed its takeover of the Republican Party. And during that rally today that was centered on reproductive rights, the president really driving home how freedom is tied to abortion, and that while he and Democrats are trying to preserve those freedoms, he says the Republicans, the MAGA extremists, as he calls them, are trying to take away those fundamental rights, putting women's health and lives at risk. Now, the Biden campaign, they believe that this is going to galvanize voters across the board, not just Democrats, but they think they can get some of those independents and Republicans to turn out. Because as we've seen in these elections and states after states, voters in both red and blue states, they have voted to enshrine abortion rights. So even though Though there may be some voter apathy and frustrations around inflation, they believe issues like this will get people out there in November. And tell us about the interruption during the president's speech. This was pretty unprecedented. I've been to other Biden events before where there have been these protests of pro-Palestine protesters interrupting the president's speech, but this time there were more than a dozen interruptions. So every few minutes there would be a few protesters that would stand up and chant something along the lines of Genocide Joe or saying ceasefire now, and the security would have to flank them and escort them out. It was really hard for the president to continue his speech. He was fired up. It was a strong speech, but it was hard for him to get back on pace after these consistent disruptions. And Lindsay, it really just underscores how this issue is causing divisions among the, the Democratic Party, especially among more progressive and young voters who are angry at how the president has dealt with the Israel-Hamas war. Yeah, in particular, those young voters. But in general, uh, talking about voters on the ground, what sentiment are you hearing from them? Well, I spoke to voters of all demographics, of course. They are largely in support of the president. But what really stuck out to me is that they all had this sense of foreboding, anxiety, and fear about what's going to happen in November. They said it really appears that it could go either way. So they are concerned about the stakes in this election. They say the stakes here are high. They're worried that the country will go to a place that it can never return from if Trump is president again. And I spoke to some college students who were critical of the president, especially around the Israel-Hamas war, as we just talked about earlier. But they said, look, they are going to support whoever will defeat Donald Trump. That is their key priority. And that is also something the campaign is banking on. All right, Selena Wang, our thanks to you. And one to everybody who may be just joining us now to recap for a little bit as you're watching ABC News Live, your voice, your vote, and the face-off for the first presidential primary of 2024. The polls closed in New Hampshire just about an hour ago, and ABC News is now projecting that Trump will win the GOP primary in New Hampshire in the highly competitive Republican race there. But an adamant Haley vows to stay in the race. Take a listen. Now, you've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves, saying this race is over. It's not over. No. 
Well, I have news for all of them. Woo! New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. Yeah! This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. And the next one is my sweet state of South Carolina. Lots of energy on the stage, lots of enthusiasm in the crowd. We'll have more from ABC's Eva Pilgrim on that in a moment. I want to take a look at some of the results here on the Democratic side. ABC News has projected that Biden is the, anticipated to be the winner in New Hampshire. And I want to get right to ABC's Rachel Scott in Nashua, New Hampshire, who is following Trump's campaign. Rachel, uh, we know that Trump is expected to take the stage any moment. He's already reacting to his own projected win over Nikki Haley. It, what does he have to say? Well, Lindsay, it was clear that the former president was paying close attention to what Nikki Haley was saying there on the stage, because as soon as she made it clear that she was staying in this race, that it was far from over in her eyes, he responded and called her delusional. He said that she needed to win New Hampshire and that she did not. His campaign already blasting out a fundraising email declaring the race to be over. Of course, Nikki Haley says that she's pushing on to her home state of South Carolina, but she does face an uphill challenge. There. The former president is still leading in the polls in that state as well at this point in the race. And so the Trump campaign really was hoping to send a direct message to the Haley campaign tonight in this two person race that he has the clear momentum, that this is his nomination for the taking. And they're raising the question tonight of which state can Nikki Haley win? Obviously, the more states that Donald Trump wins, the more momentum he builds, the harder that it will be for anyone else in this race to clinch the Republican nomination. Nomination. They are now asking the Haley campaign to see what they are calling the writing on the wall, Lindsay. Oh, she's saying she doesn't see that writing yet. Uh, Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper joins us now live in Manchester, New Hampshire. Avery, former President Trump is projected to win the New Hampshire primary, but Haley took to the stage just now saying that race is far from over. What does her support in the state tell you about her position in this primary race? Right. I mean, despite those defiant remarks, despite the fact that she is saying that she's staying in the race, uh, she is really in a very precarious place uh, when you look at the primary overall. And so uh, as she continues to be in this race, it's going to be interesting to see exactly uh, what is going to happen. She had momentum coming into New Hampshire uh, after the Iowa caucuses. Uh, the electorate here, the primary electorate, is probably as favorable as it's going to get for her. Uh, we've talked so much about those undeclared voters uh, that were really vital to her strategy here here in New Hampshire, uh, going into South Carolina and beyond it, it's not going to be like that. So it'll be interesting to see if she's able to uh, replicate or do even better uh, than what has happened here tonight in New Hampshire uh, as we continue to go on in this primary race. And Avery, how do Trump and, and Haley seem to be faring among those undeclared voters? Right. When we look at the exit poll data, we find that there has been strong turnout among those undeclared voters. Those are the voters who were particularly popular with Nikki Haley. Uh, but it uh, doesn't necessarily seem, and when we look at our projection, that it's going to be enough for her to claim victory. And so it all begs the question of if she has a viable a chance and a viable path to the nomination. All right, Avery Harper, our thanks to you. As we continue to watch the votes come in, we want to bring in ABC's Jay O'Brien. Jay, now that ABC News is projecting that Trump will win the New Hampshire primary, where does the Haley campaign go from here? Well, you heard Nikki Haley say it, Lindsay, that she's going on to South Carolina, but there are some bumps in the road here. First, as Reince pointed out earlier in the night, and the Trump campaign has been making repeated mention of, Nikki Haley has not filled out the paperwork to be considered in the Nevada caucuses, which are early next month in February. South Carolina's primary, remember, is not until the end of February, February 24th. And so Nikki Haley says she's going to continue to South Carolina it's her home state. She says she can make a convincing case to voters there. But a couple bumps in the road first. 
Trump is beating Nikki Haley in every poll we have seen come out of South Carolina, in some instances between 20 and 30 points. So she's got an uphill battle there. Additionally, campaigns are defined, as Rachel Bade noted earlier in our coverage tonight, by how much money they have to burn. And Nikki Haley has the money to burn, it would seem, to get all the way to South Carolina. But additionally, she's going to need a fair to good showing in New Hampshire tonight to convince the small money donors and the big money donors especially that she's a viable investment going forward in this race. So she's got to come. The handicapping is up in the air, but, you know, I've heard between 10 to 15 points of Donald Trump tonight in order to make that convincing case, not just to Republican primary voters that she's a viable alternative to Trump, but certainly to donors to keep funding this campaign. And Jay, of course, it was just days after the Iowa caucus that we saw Ron DeSantis decide that he couldn't go any further. At this point, what do you think that Nikki Haley can learn from his campaign to not make those same mistakes? Well, one of the factors in the DeSantis campaign was that ongoing case to donors. We heard uh, pretty early on, after some pretty big stumbles from Ron DeSantis, that some of his biggest money donors did not like where the DeSantis campaign was heading, and so they balked at cutting checks to Ron DeSantis uh, to a large amount the way they had in the past. I even talked to people who were close to donors in Florida who said that they didn't feel like they were getting the love from the campaign, and so they weren't writing checks the kind that they were. And money is the lifeblood of campaigns in American politics, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing about the DeSantis campaign is, while it had some campaign stumbles, and while there was a question as to what issues was the DeSantis campaign talking about, about. The reality is the DeSantis campaign was always going to be defined by Iowa. Whether or not you think that they mounted a good or a bad campaign, he put everything he had into Iowa. The campaign privately and, and publicly in many ways acknowledged that as well. And so when DeSantis didn't come as close to Trump in Iowa, having poured his heart into that state, remember, he was campaigning in Iowa before he had even declared that he was running for president. That was really the death blow of the DeSantis campaign. And the DeSantis people that I've talked to since those results really came in just had a different feeling about that campaign and you know speaking of a different feeling there Jay you know we're talking about uh, President Biden today and how he had maybe a dozen uh, different interruptions from uh, people who went to hear him speak supporting uh, demanding in fact I should say a ceasefire uh, calling him genocide Joe uh, how much of an issue is foreign policy in particular uh, in on the Republican side in the Republican side, it, there's an interesting dynamic because probably one of the biggest dividing lines in Republican politics is support for Ukraine. Nikki Haley believes that supporting Ukraine is a key geopolitical issue. Donald Trump is far more skeptical to continued U.S. aid for Ukraine. That's the dividing line amongst Republicans. Amongst Democrats, it is exactly what you just pointed out, which is that ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. Even in New Hampshire, we're seeing it play out in a small microcosm. There is this small movement in New Hampshire We'll get a sense by the end of tonight of how successful it's been telling people instead to write in President Biden's name, because remember, President Biden isn't on the ballot in New Hampshire. Democrats are having to write his name in. They're having people write in the words ceasefire, this small progressive movement. We'll see how much they get in terms of numbers. But point being, that issue can really drive a wedge between President Biden and the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party that's typically younger. And it's a group he's got to make some significant gains in or at least hold on to in order to be a viable candidate. All right, Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you. And once again, ABC News is projecting that Donald Trump will win the New Hampshire primary, but Nikki Haley says the race isn't over. Eva Pilgrim joins us now. And Eva, of course, she said that while New Hampshire is the first state, it is not the last. On to South Carolina next. How's the Haley campaign feeling going into her home territory? Exactly, Lindsay. They, Nikki Haley is moving on and she's heading home to her home state of South Carolina. You mentioned they, they said this is the first in the nation primary, but there are a lot of other primaries to come. And as the kids say, Lindsay, as long as the math is mathin', they're going to stay in this. They think that they can still pull voters, those independents and those be an alternative to Donald Trump for Republicans, that they are going to continue on to see if momentum continues to build. They feel like they have momentum coming tonight. She talks a lot and her staff talk a lot about where her numbers were just a month ago. And they point out that they have a month until South Carolina and a lot can change 
in a political race in a month. So they're going to go hit the ground running tomorrow morning. They're flying into Charleston, South Carolina and starting there with a rally. And she knows this state well. She she was the governor of South Carolina. She is going to crisscross the state of South Carolina and hope that she can close those margins there. You know, she said tonight, I'm a fighter and I'm a scrapper scra and I'm scrappy. And she's repeatedly said that she knows that this was going to be hard. She never expected that this was going to be an easy uh, race. And she is planning to continue fighting on. And now she's making the call for Donald Trump to debate her. We'll have to wait to see if that actually happens, Lindsay. Yeah, I love the way the young people talk these days with, as you brought up, that example of the math is math. And so what does her campaign say about that strategy moving forward? How do you get the math to all add up in her favor? Well, here's the thing. You look at the next races that are coming, and in their mind, South Carolina is a race where anyone can vote in that primary, right? Unless you voted in the Democratic primary. So she thinks that she could pull some independent voters there. Then you look on to Super Tuesday. 11 of those states have open or semi-open primaries. So they want to see where the numbers lie. They want to okay. get these delegates, get the delegate count up. And as long as the math is mathin', they're staying in this, Lindsay. <laughs> all right, Eva Pilgrim, keeping us all hip and in the know as you inform us as well. Uh, thank you so much, Eva. And we want to dig into how the Trump campaign is reacting tonight. For that, we turn to ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent uh, John Carl. Uh, big picture this for us. What does this mean for Trump? Uh, you know, look, b before I fully answer that question, can I just state something that, that, that is obvious but easy to forget amidst all of this? Two states have yes. voted, <laughs> and they're two small states. Uh, two small states have voted. Uh, Donald Trump has won both of them. We have never seen a Republican presidential candidate win both Iowa and New Hampshire and then not win the nomination. So yes, he is far and away the front runner. Is he the presumptive front runner, the presumptive nominee? Not yet. Uh, there's a lot of voting left to go. But Nikki Haley, New Hampshire was the state that she was best position to win of them all. She didn't. She got closer than she got in Iowa. Uh, she managed to vanquish all the rest of her opponents. She has that one-on-one -on -one race against Donald Trump that she's wanted all along. And finally, she has begun to take the fight directly to Trump in a way that she simply wasn't during the campaign. Now she gets a chance Nevada, as you were discussing, is really not in play uh, because of the rules and how it was set up. So the next big state is her home state. So can she win there? Well, she was elected governor twice. She was reelected overwhelmingly. Um, but it's a real uphill battle for her. I mean, true. Democrats can vote in the Republican primary in South Carolina. I'm not sure how many of them will actually want to do that to vote for Nikki Haley. Um, and she goes to a state that is her own state, but it's a state where Donald Trump is wildly popular among Republicans. He has the endorsements of both of the senators. He has endorsements of all of the Republican congressmen, except for one, who is still sticking with Nikki Haley for now. Um, and uh, uh, he has the endorsement of the uh, governor, her former lieutenant governor. So this is going to be a very, very tough battle. She still has money. She still has donors who don't want to cede this race to Donald Trump yet. And she has the fact that she's the only one left. And there's a feeling among some of her donors and some of her supporters, and probably among Nikki Haley herself, is even if my odds are really, really small, don't I need to stick around because God only knows what's gonna happen with Donald Trump, a guy that's facing 91 criminal counts, a guy who has the ability um, to say things and do things uh, that are wildly controversial. Um, he hasn't shot anybody on Fifth Avenue yet, but it's like, do I, I'm the only one matter. left. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't you know? matter. I'm the uh, only one left. Do I stick it in, wait it out, fight it out at least through Super Tuesday? And, you know, the question is, um, does she want to risk the possibility that she could really lose handily in her own state, which would be quite an embarrassment? Or, or does she want to, uh, you know, stick this out and, and I, my, my, my bet is that she sticks it out at least for a while it, but the question is and I want to bring in Eva's point because I just like yeah. the way the, the 
kids as I now yeah. feel like a very old person yeah. now. But the math, it's math. And is it, is it, I know you're saying, yeah, we're only two states in, yeah. but does she have a way forward? As you said, she was best positioned, yeah. best postured to win in New Hampshire. And there we were, like five minutes after the polls closed, already calling it for Donald right. Trump. And what many had presumed might be a long night, yeah. might go down to the wire. Yeah. And yet it's it's a blowout. She was walking out there and conceding uh, just just you know less than an hour after after the polls closed. Uh, look, it, it's a really steep climb. Uh, she could win. It would take a minor miracle uh, to win at this point. Um, and it really comes down to getting the campaign on track. I was going to say back on track, mm -hmm. but it needs to get on track uh, in South Carolina. She has to win. The other thing that the Trump campaign has been doing, and there, in some ways it's a much better organized campaign than we saw in 2016 uh, when, when he first won, is they have gone through state by state and tried to work the nominating rules, how each state allocates um, uh, delegates to be in a favorable uh, position for him. So, and, and he now controls uh, most of these state parties, um, which he didn't in 2016. He was an outsider in 2016. He's no longer the outsider. Donald Trump is the Republican establishment right now. And just a really quick question about those delegates. Even if, yep. we'll, we're just going really out on a limb here, even if he is convicted and she stays in, hanging by a thread, but doesn't have the delegates, then what? Yeah, well, if she doesn't have the delegates, she's not going to win. Um, and, and, and those... Delegates, you know, first of all, it, it, you raised the question, if he's convicted. I guess there is a scenario where one of these trials could actually not only start, but be done before the Republican convention. It's unclear which one that'd be. Maybe it could be Jack Smith's uh, election interference case, although there's real doubts about uh, how quickly that's actually going to get underway. It's scheduled for, for March 4th, but uh, it's it's not going to start by March 4th, and, and we'll see when, when it starts. And trials take a long time, especially with something like this. Um, and th there's, there's nothing to prevent a convicted felon um, from getting elected president of the United States. He may not be able to vote in the state of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> as a convicted felon, but he will be able to be elected president of the United States. Very fascinating, uh, our politics there. All right, yeah. Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you. And we want to turn now to ABC's new, ABC News's political director, Rick Klein. And Rick, let's talk about the Democratic race. ABC has projected that Biden is going to win the Granite State. Uh, break down the numbers for us on that side. Yeah, well, Lindsey, fourth time's a charm for Joe Biden. He ran in 1988, and he dropped out before he even got to New Hampshire. He ran in 2008, dropped out before he got to New Hampshire. Four years ago, he came in fifth place. And tonight, Joe Biden finally can say he won New Hampshire. And he did it in the weirdest possible way. He won as a write-in candidate. He chose not to appear on the ballot at all, mostly because New Hampshire actually doesn't count for any delegates. It was and is, though, the first major test of where Democratic discontent is, given all of the headlines, given Israel, given the concerns about uh, his advanced age. All of these things have kind of come together. And he got the, the challenge of Congressman Dean Phillips, uh, from Minnesota, who says we need someone who's a new generation. Marianne Williamson, who appeared in at least one Democratic debate uh, four years ago, uh, but is mo mostly known as an author and a, and a spiritualist. But Joe Biden, his, his advisors, his team on the ground in New Hampshire decided to mount this, this writing campaign. And they are winning, and they are winning decisively. I think this is the kind of number that Joe Biden was looking for tonight. If this number was a lot lower, I think you'd have more questions being raised. As it is, they seem to have over, overperformed. I would note that the vote is somewhat behind where it is on the Republican because of these are write-in votes. It takes longer for them to count. We're getting them in slow, more slowly, but we're seeing this kind of a cross-section across the state where, where Biden is winning and winning by a pretty substantial margin uh, against the, 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 the challengers that were actually on the ballot. So it's a win for Joe Biden. And I'd also note uh, no one has won as, as a write-in since 1968. LBJ at the time, one is a, a write-in, but it wasn't so great for him. A couple weeks later, he was out of the race because it was clear that the unpopularity of the Vietnam War was making his campaign uh, untenable. So Biden was trying to avoid that piece of history, even while winning tonight. All right, Rick Klein, we'll be checking back in with you before you know it. In the meantime, I want to bring back in ABC News political analyst Reince Priebus, an ABC political contributor and Democratic strategist Donna Brazil. Thanks for joining us once again. Uh, Donna, I want to come to you first. Uh, when Nikki Haley took the stage a short time ago, she said, quote, it's time to put the negativity and chaos behind us. Do you think that message will, will prove effective for her? Is it too little too late? Uh, I think it's too little too late. Look, she had her moment, and the, the moment was a debate. She was outstanding. She stood 
head and shoulders above the rest. The problem is, last week she had an opportunity to be in the living rooms of just about everyone in New Hampshire, and she chose not to because Donald Trump or Joe Biden would not get on stage with her. Look, I still believe that she has a little gas in her tank. I don't know how much money, so I don't know what she can buy in South Carolina. But when you start cherry picking where you're going to pick up delegates and you missed a moment in Nevada, the Silver State, coming up on February 8th, that's not a good strategy for winning delegates. Remember, this is a race for the Republican nomination, which means you need delegates. All right, Donna, we're going to interrupt just for a moment. I hope that you and Reince will stick by us for a moment because we are seeing uh, Donald Trump take to the stage there in New Hampshire. We see uh, Tim Scott on the stage, Eric Trump and his wife just a moment ago, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, Rachel, I want to toss it over to you. What's the energy like in the room? <laughs> yeah, the energy here is very loud. This crowd is enthusiastic to see the former president fresh off of this projected victory here in New Hampshire. And I want to say it's notable that you have two of the pr former president's rivals on the stage with him right now. You have Senator Tim Scott and Vivek Ramaswamy, who both were running against Trump and then decided to drop out of this race and endorse him. So make no mistake about it, having the two of them on this stage tonight is also meant to send a message that the Republican Party is starting to unify behind Trump. We have seen more and more endorsements in recent days, not only from his former rivals, but also from elected officials uh, out across the country on Capitol Hill as well. Those who were apprehensive about the former president now coming around, realizing that he has the momentum in this race, first with that win in Iowa, now with another projected win here in New Hampshire, Lindsay. And we see him uh, slapping hands and patting people on the back, really taking in this moment. It was just eight days ago when we saw him give a, a victory speech in the state of Iowa. And now he is posing for pictures, really taking this moment in. We got to imagine, Rachel, that this night means even more than, than Iowa. It, it does. Having these two back-to-back -back wins is exactly what the former president wanted to deliver to his supporters. And here he is. Well, I want to thank everybody. This is a fantastic state. This is a great, great state. You know, we won New Hampshire three times now. Three. three. We win it every time. We win the primary. We win the generals. We've won it. And it's a very, very special place to me. It's very important. If you remember, in 2016, we came here and we needed that win. And we won by 21 points. And it was great. And uh, today, I have to tell you, it was very interesting because I said, wow, what a great victory. But then somebody ran up to the stage all dressed up nicely <laughs> when it was at 7. But now I just walked up and it's at 14. But, but she ran up when it was 7. And, you know, we have to do what's good for our party. And she was up and I said, wow, she's doing uh, like a speech like she won. She didn't win. She lost. And, you know, last, last week, we had a little bit of a problem. And if you remember, Ron was very upset because she ran up and she pretended she won Iowa. <laughs> and I looked around. I said, didn't she come in third? Yeah, she came in third. And then I looked at the polls. She was talking about most winnability, who's going to win. And I had one put up. I don't know if you see it, but I have one put up. We've won almost every single poll in the last three months against crooked Joe Biden. Almost every poll. And she doesn't win those polls. And she doesn't win those. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody take a victory when she had a very bad night. She had a very bad night. And you, uh, you have the... You have the very, the now very unpopular governor of this state. This guy, he's got to be on something. I've never seen anybody with energy. He's like a uh, hopscotch. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching this guy, and two weeks ago, he said, we're going to win, we're going to win in the last side, we're going to win. About three days ago, he started saying, well, we want to do well. That's a big difference. But I walked out just now, we're 14 points up, and I don't know what it's going to be, but when she was up here, it was like six or seven. And, you know, with like 7% of the vote counted, 
Now, uh, let, let me just tell you, uh, we, uh, we had an unbelievable week last week in Iowa. We set a record. It was the best in the history of the caucus, in the history. And uh, I remember I sort of had the same feeling. I'm up and I'm watching, and I said, she's taking a victory lap. And we, we beat her so badly, she was... But Ron beat her also. You know, Ron came in second, and he left. She came in third, and she's still hanging around. The other thing, she only got 25% of the Republican votes. I don't know if you saw that. Tremendous numbers of independents came out, because in this state, because you have a governor that doesn't, frankly, know what the hell he's doing, in this state, in the Republican primary, they accept Democrats to vote. In fact, I think they had 4,000 Democrats, Democrats before October 6th. They already voted. Now, they're only voting because they want to make me look as bad as possible. Because if you remember, we won in 2016. And if you really remember, and if you want to play it straight, we also won in 2020. <laughs> by more. And we did much better in 2020 than we did in 2016. But as they said, we lost by a whisker, just by a whisker. No, 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 but we can't let that happen. You know, you have to have people that speak up. I said, I can go up and I can say to everybody, oh, thank you for the victory, it's wonderful, it's what." Or I can go up and say, who the hell was the imposter that went up on the stage before and, like, claimed a victory? She did very poorly, actually. She had to win. The governor said, she's gonna win, she's gonna win, she's gonna win. Then she, she failed badly. Now, I have here, if he promises to do, to do it in a minute or less, but the only person more angry than, let's say me, but I don't get too angry, I get even. The only person... The only per because he was there, and he did fantastically well, by the way, and then he endorsed me. And we don't have to talk about Tim Scott, who, by the way, just got engaged, we have to tell you. And that's more important than all of this stuff. But a man that got to know her very well is Vivek. I said, Vivek. I said, Vivek. Go up and say a few words about it. He has to do it in one minute or less, and then we're gonna just say, we had one hell of a night tonight. And one other thing before Vivek comes. Do you see that, Paul? We're gonna put it up. We have beaten Biden. You could almost say, who can't? Who the hell can't? The man can't put two sentences together. He can't find the stairs off a stage. Who can't? But Vivek, one minute or less. Go do it, Vivek. What we saw tonight is America first defeating America last. That's what we saw tonight. If you want America last, you can go to Joe Biden. You got another candidate still apparently in the Republican primary. Cut your Social Security to fork over more money to Ukraine so some kleptocrat can buy a bigger house. Go to Nikki Haley. But you know who delivered a double-digit victory tonight? It is a double-digit victory as of right now. Is this man, Donald J. Trump, the leader of America first. And that means something. Now. USA and Donald Trump, America first. Now, I got, I got 30 seconds left. I want to make this point here, okay? We got to say this, we got to say this right. What we see right now with her continuing in this race is the ugly underbelly of American politics, where the mega donors are trying to do one thing when we the people say another. And it's up to us to we the people to at long last say, hell no, we the people create a government that is accountable to us. And we the people have said tonight, we want again, as we did in Iowa, Donald J. Trump. And so you want to actually speak truth. That's the truth tonight. And the only thing that right, they promised for, Tommy going a little longer than Trump had given him a minute or less. Uh, but we want to go back to Rachel Scott, who is at that Trump rally where Vivek Ramaswamy is still at the stage. Uh, Rachel, of course, another projected win for Donald Trump. A little bit uh, cantankerous there, saying, I don't get angry, I get even. Uh, I heard him some re repeating some of the, the 2020 falsehoods that we've heard him talk about before. Uh, but it, it seems like people are, are eating it up in the room. 
Uh, they certainly are a chance of USA. They're cheering the former president on. Look, it's clear that Trump thought that if he had a win here, that Nikki Haley might reconsider whether or not she stays in this race. Obviously, Nikki Haley taking the stage, making it clear that she does not believe that this race is over. And so he went after her pretty hard here. A little rich and ironic that uh, he's insisting that she declare that she had uh, some type of victory here after, you know, the former president has centered so much of his campaign on these false claims that he won the 2020 election. But again, very notable tonight that the first two people to walk out on that stage with him are two of his former rivals, Vivek Ramaswamy, who you just heard from right there, and Senator Tim Scott. That is meant to send a message that the party should unify behind the former president. Lindsay. All right, but Nikki Haley saying it's fall from over. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Uh, Jay O'Brien, and want to bring you in. Your reaction to that speech, I mean, as Rachel was just pointing out, he really spent a lot of time talking about just how badly he beat Nikki Haley. Yeah, and, and he obviously had some tough words for Nikki Haley. To Rachel's point, I think it's evident that he expected, or, or rather her coming out and having that non-victory victory speech seemed to have irked Trump. The other thing that I think is worth noting is somewhat of the visual you're seeing on your screen of Vivek Ramaswamy standing to the left of Tim Scott and then Tim Scott being there. Essentially, this notion of trying to de signify that the Republican Party, or at least the Republican field of GOP candidates, is coalescing, quote-unquote, around Trump, although Haley is still out there. DeSantis has endorsed Trump. One more point, though, that we should fact-check here is that Trump repeated again that false claim um, that Democrats can vote in the New Hampshire primary. That's not true. New Hampshire has a closed primary, meaning Democrats vote in the Democratic primary, Republicans vote in the Republican primary, independent voters, or what New Hampshire characterizes as quote unquote unaffiliated voters, they can vote in whatever primary they want to, meaning they can pick to vote in the Republican primary or the Democratic primary. It is true, a lot of unaffiliated voters cast a ballot for Nikki Haley tonight, but you can't just change your, prime, your political affiliation at the polls, like you can, by the way, in a state like Iowa, something that Trump never criticized, you have to change your party affiliation to vote in the primary by an October deadline in right. New Hampshire. If it is, it seemed he had an axe to grind, particularly with the governor there, Governor Sununu, who, of course, uh, had thrown his support behind Nikki Haley then. All right. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you. I want to bring back an ABC News contributing correspondent, Rachel Bade. Rachel Trump said that he does better against Joe Biden in the polls than Nikki Haley does, but Nikki has clearly been espousing something totally opposite. Yeah, and I mean, not just to fact check that, Lindsay, uh, he's wrong. I mean, if you look at the polling consistently, it shows that Nikki Haley in the matchup against Joe Biden uh, basically wipes the floor with him. She does a lot better in terms of a, of a matchup against Joe Biden than, than Trump does. And clearly that is a sensitive spot for Joe Biden. Look, I have consistently heard uh, from Democrats that they do not want to face Nikki Haley. They think that she uh, might be able to sort of pull along those independent voters, maybe even some Democrats who are not happy with with President Joe Biden right now and who are looking for someone else uh, to vote for, they don't want to, to face her. And so, uh, you know, the fact that uh, President Trump was out there saying, look, I'm stronger against Joe Biden uh, than Nikki Haley is. Well, if you look at the polling, it definitely suggests otherwise, Lindsay. And, and Rachel, I'm curious your take on, because eight days ago when we were kind of breaking down the Iowa caucus, uh, Donald Trump took to the stage and really gave a speech that was focused on the general election, really going ahead as if this was over, the, the primary was a non-issue, and he was going ahead, full steam ahead with attacks on, on Joe Biden. But tonight, at least what we've heard so far in that first portion, it was really to, to litigate uh, Nikki Haley and, and claiming that it was a two-person race, even when Ron DeSantis was still there and she had come in uh, third place. Are you surprised that he seems to have shifted entirely from that strategy of let me focus ahead on Joe Biden and really kind of backtracking and, and attacking Nikki Haley? Yeah, really fascinating. He said her name a lot more uh, than Joe Biden, and that's certainly not what his inner circle wants to be doing. Him, they want him to be doing right now. They want uh, the former president to be focused on the general election, to act like he's got the nomination on lock and focus his intention on Biden. So he sort of looks like he's already marching to the nomination. Problem here is obviously Nikki Haley uh, has struck a nerve because she's still in this race. Uh, and so that's why you saw him sort of gloating about his numbers tonight, going on to attack her, talking more about 
about her than Joe Biden. And I was really struck uh, by him sort of flaunting Senator Tim Scott, who's obviously from Nikki Haley's home state of South Carolina. Uh, Haley uh, obviously uh, was courting an endorsement from Tim Scott. He decided to ultimately go with Donald Trump. And, you know, the former president just being up there, seeing seeming very proud uh, and, and boasting about who was behind him, Tim Scott. So basically take that Nikki Haley from his end. Yeah, a, a little thumb of the nose there. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel Bader, thanks to you. Want to get right to senior White House correspondent Selena Wang. And Selena, uh, Trump just a few moments ago said President Biden can't put two sentences together, can't find the staircase. Uh, you were at a rally of his today. What did you observe? Yeah, Lindsay. Well, obviously, he can, in fact, string more than two sentences together. He gave a very lengthy speech at the rally today in Virginia, and he was fired up. It was perhaps the strongest, one of the strongest speeches I've seen him give, despite those multiple interruptions, as I mentioned, from those protesters. But every time he still picked it back up, he was loud, he was fired up, he was angry. So the president, he has clearly still got that stamina in him, and the campaign is trying to show that. And when I spoke to voters there at that rally, Valley, they said, look, age, we believe it's just a number. And as long as he can deliver, that's what matters. And of course, Trump isn't too much younger than President Biden. That's right. All right. Selena Wang, our thanks to you. Want to check in now with how things are shaping up for President Biden on the campaign trail with ABC News. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce, who joins us live in studio. And there was a statement that the Biden campaign just released. What are they saying? Well, look no further than this statement for a clear sign that they are definitely heading into what is going to be a very long general election because the president in this statement saying Donald Trump is all but locked up the GOP nomination, saying that Trump is offering Americans the same extreme agenda that has cost Republicans election after election, referencing, of course, those off-year elections that we've seen, especially uh, recently, and then really underscoring what is their central message and what you are going to hear over and over again, Lindsay, in the coming months, that Donald Trump, they say, is headed straight into a general election matchup where he'll face the only person to have ever beaten him at the ballot box, Joe Biden. And there are certainly other signs that the Biden campaign is ramping up, getting ready to go into this general election. They, they are moving around some of their staff uh, today, announcing that two of the president's top aides, his deputy chief of staff, Jen O'Malley Dillon, Mike Donilon, who's one of his closest advisors, they're going to be leaving the White House in the next few weeks, going up to Wilmington, Delaware, to really help uh, craft and navigate this campaign going forward. They were critical to his win in 2020, really the architects of that campaign. Now they're shifting their focus to this next critical campaign. And you've heard, you know, Selena mentioned there, the president is also ramping up his rhetoric. He name-checked Donald Trump in that speech today 14 times. A couple months ago, you would be hard-pressed to hear Joe Biden mention Donald Trump by name. So they are very much looking forward to this rematch, and you are getting a sense that the Biden campaign, the Biden White House, is really shifting gears. Going and into even that though we're mode. just two states in, it seems like yeah. they're already preparing for that rematch. Any sense that the strategy would be this different this time around, if it is to be a Trump-Biden rematch? No, in fact, they are very much hitting the exact same theme. And you hear the president say, you know, that that, that central argument that he needs a chance to finish the job. Mm. Just as he ran in 20. 20 on that argument that this was a battle for the soul of America. At the core of this campaign is his argument that Donald Trump uh, is a threat to American democracy, that he is challenging and threatening the very freedoms that this country is founded on. Even before tonight, Joe Biden's reelection campaign has really centered around the threat of Donald Trump, and he's going to continue hammering that for many months to come. It really is astonishing, I think, too, to look in Iowa as well as New Hampshire at how many people are saying that they don't even believe that Joe Biden is a legitimate president. So we'll see if there's any uh, difference this go round. Mary Bruce, our thanks to you. I want to now bring in Galen Druk from 538. Galen, we heard Trump moments ago where he said Haley is acting like she won, but she didn't. Uh, let's take a listen. Pretended she won Iowa. <laughs> And I looked around, I said, didn't she come in third? Yeah, she came in third. And then I looked at the polls. She was talking about most winnability, who's going to win. And I had one put up. I don't know if you see it, but I have one put up. We've won almost every single poll in the last three months against Crooked Joe Biden. Almost every poll. And she doesn't win those polls. And she doesn't win those. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody Take a victory. Galen Druk, your reaction.
So Donald Trump is essentially running as an incumbent here at this point. And the argument that Nikki Haley needed to win New Hampshire, we've heard throughout the evening, the argument has basically been that she does well with these unaffiliated voters. So she needed to win amongst that group and she didn't. So where else does she have to go? That's true. There are also, there's also the ability, if you're an unaffiliated voter or if you're a Democrat or Republican, to cross ballots in South Carolina. But I think the most important thing to focus on here is actually the electorate in New Hampshire. It's one of the most educated electorates in the country. 41% of New Hampshireites have a four-year college degree. That makes it far beyond, for example, South Carolina, where 26% have a college degree. And that's a coalition that Nikki Haley does really well with. So when we're talking about, you know, she really needed to hit those benchmarks, she really needed to win, it's not just because independent voters like her, it's because this is ex the exact profile of the kind of voter that would get her to the nomination. And, if she, and really, I mean, if she can't win with that electorate, where does she win? I mean, Nevada, the next state, 33% of Nevadans have a four-year college degree. So, you know, she's not even competing in the caucus there, but also not promising. And you spoke with a number of New Hampshire voters on the issues most important to them. Let's take a listen. What's the most important issue to you in this election? Immigration. Immigration. I'm more interested in an overall leadership qualities. What do you think about the issue of immigration? The southern border has gotten out of control, and Nikki Haley has some really good thoughts on, you know, getting that border under control. Immigration certainly looming as a big issue in this election. What other issues did you hear that New Hampshire voters are, are most passionate about? Yeah, Lindsay, I do want to linger on that issue of immigration for just a second, because we saw in the exit polling tonight that 36% of New Hampshireites, or they like to say granite staters, <laughs> said that the economy was the most important issue, whereas only 31% said immigration, which is close, but is not immigration as number one. I should say, though, that's in large part because of those unaffiliated voters. If you look at polling before the New Hampshire primary of strictly Republican voters, you see that immigration is number one. And we've done polling throughout this cycle ahead of Republican debates, asking voters again and again and again who plan to vote in the Republican primary, what is the most important issue to you? And we have seen immigration rising and rising and rising. And it is now, even nationally, outside of just New Hampshire, on par with the economy. So this is going to be an issue that we're gonna hear a lot about. Of course, when I talked to the voters that we heard from, the economy also came up and folks really spoke about gas prices and what gas prices were like under Trump, which hits home what I mentioned earlier, that Trump is running as an incumbent here. When people talk about the issues they care about, and I'm out on the trail talking to them, they point to, well, when Trump was president, this. When Trump was president, gas was under $2. When Trump was president, we didn't have these wars in X, Y, and Z areas of the world. And so running as somebody who can point to a concrete um, track record really gives you an advantage where Nikki Haley is asking folks to imagine a future where she can accomplish the things that she says. Donald Trump is more pointing to a record that we know from polling about 80% of Republicans are happy with. All right, Galen Druk, we appreciate your analysis as always. Want to now bring in ABC News political contributor John Katko and president of Next Gen American, Christina Sisun Ramirez. Uh, Christina, let's start with you. Uh, thoughts on what we just heard from Trump? You know, I think what we're hearing from Trump is. Two, Trump 2.0 is going to be even more dangerous for American democracy, for women's rights, for LGBTQ rights. And so I think that there's a lot of fear, right, that you're seeing a consolidation with Trump, a man that has 91 counts against him. Um, and I think what's important for folks to know is he's already saying what he's going to do in his next administration, that through his own admission, he wants to jail his opponents. He's willing to shoot migrants and criminalize women that seek abortion care. So we're really seeing a consolidation of an extreme MAGA Republican Party. And we have to remember the primary is always more conservative than the general election. So we're going to see, have to see how this fares in a general election. But most Americans, remember, voted against him in 2020, even though a lot of his supporters refused to acknowledge that Trump lost the election. And they, that uh, inability to um, accept that they lost could really lose them the election again in 2024. And John, same question to you. Your biggest takeaway from Trump's speech just a little while ago. I was really taken aback by the fact that he didn't act uh, like the, the races behind him. 
he spent almost the entire time that I was able to listen to it just bashing uh, Nikki Haley in general and talking about his remarkable polling and uh, the polling aspect of it, especially that he, he does better against Biden than Haley is simply not true. Haley would crush uh, Biden in a general election. And uh, the, the fact of the matter is that Trump is a lot closer. So uh, it was very odd to me when after his, his speech in Iowa was very much going after, as you guys noted, uh, going after Biden and talking about policies, what he's going to do. I didn't hear anything about that tonight, which was kind of strange for me. And if you want to put your opponent in the rearview mirror, you don't talk about it much. You put him in the rearview mirror. And the only thing I can conclude from that is that he's still a little concerned about her. And uh, we will see what happens going forward. And I, I think that uh, Haley's demise is a little premature right now. Let's see what happens in the next couple of races. Uh, this is the first uh, race where it was just her and him. And she got uh, well over 40, she had close to 40% of the vote, or over 40% of the vote. So she's doing okay. Let's see what happens going forward. She's still got a very tough road to hoe. But again, uh, it's almost that thou does protest too loudly uh, syndrome. And uh, that to me is a trigger that maybe, maybe he's not so comfortable with going forward with her. So we'll see. And Christina, I want to put John's point right to you. He said that he thinks that the demise of Nikki Haley is a little premature. Do you agree? I mean, look, Nikki Haley, more power to her. She is the only person left standing against Trump, the only and the only woman that had the gall to really stand up to him at this point. And she's going to South Carolina. This is her home state. She could do well in South Carolina, but she is trailing by 30 points. But I think that you're going to see her own donors, her own base really ask and push her to continue fighting because even though Donald Trump does really well in the Republican primary, there is a core base of the Republican Party that is very dissatisfied with the MAGA extremist Republican Party that has become the party of Trump and the cult of personality. So I think we're going to continue to see people pushing and asking her to stay in this race. But it's going to be really hard. It's it's becoming a much, much harder pathway forward. And yes, DeSantis dropped out of the race, but most of his voters were Donald Trump supporters. He was their second choice, not Nikki Haley. So the pathway for her forward is going to be very, very difficult. And let's turn to the Democrats now. A win for Biden, even though he wasn't technically on the ballot, only had to uh, rely on people writing him in. Uh, what does that say about his support, Christina? Well, uh, uh, Joe Biden, you know, this is we're going to see a rematch of 2024, likely. It's going to be Trump and Biden. Um, Biden was able to be a write-in candidate and won. Um, I don't think that's too surprising for folks. And we know there's still going to be a lot of counting because he is a write-in candidate. But we're, today we saw... Um, the Biden administration and uh, Kamala Harris go and have their first really campaign rally focused on abortion rights, focused on the core issues that distinguish them from the Republican Party, being able to show that, you know, on issues like abortion, on LGBTQ rights, on climate change, that they are the Republican Party and Trump is out of step with the vast majority of Americans. And so we're going to continue to see them pushing on these core issues that Americans, the general, again, electorate, really sees the Republican Party out of step with the American public. Um, and so we're just going to continue to see those rallies. And I think that will really consolidate support for the Biden administration, especially as Trump continues to really propose extremist ideas that most Americans don't really align with. All right, Christina, John, we thank you both so much for your time and insight. Really appreciate it. And I hope you'll stick with us. I'll be joined by David Muir and our team as we continue our special coverage of the New Hampshire primary right after this. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waits a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. In our connected world, misinformation can masquerade as fact, eroding trust, dividing communities. But behind every share is a person with a decision. Join the movement for a more news literate America. This is an ABC News election update. The New Hampshire primary. Now reporting, David Muir. Good evening. We're coming back on the air with news on tonight's first in the nation primary in New Hampshire. ABC News tonight projecting Donald Trump wins New Hampshire's Republican primary. He was in a one on one battle against former South Carolina governor, former U.N. ambassador Nikki Haley. Trump taking the stage just a short time ago, joined by former campaign rivals, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott among them. He's now endorsed Trump. Nikki Haley already looking to the next showdown in her home state of South Carolina tonight, telling her supporters, quote, this race is far from over, saying New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not last in the nation. As you can see, our powerhouse political team right here with me in the studio to break this down. The key questions, obviously, tonight, where do we go from here? Does Nikki Haley have a realistic path here? Are we barreling toward a Donald Trump, Joe Biden rematch? ABC's Rachel Scott live at Trump headquarters in Nashua, New Hampshire, where Donald Trump spoke just a short time ago. Rachel? David, Donald Trump taking on Nikki Haley directly, insisting that she's, quote, delusional if she thinks that she stands a chance in this Republican primary. The former president appearing on stage with his former rivals, that was meant to send a message that he wants the party to unify behind him with that win in Iowa and now New Hampshire. He's one step closer to clinching this Republican nomination, David. All right, Rachel Scott with the Trump campaign. Rachel, thank you. ABC's Eva Pilgrim with the Nikki Haley campaign. Eva, Nikki Haley making it very clear tonight, this is not over. That's exactly right, David. Nikki Haley is moving on and heading home to South Carolina, saying that this race is far from over. Now, her campaign, while she didn't win tonight, they do feel like she had the strong showing to give her that momentum as she moves forward. And she made that point. New Hampshire may be first, but they are not last. And she is planning to continue on. They believe that they still have a path forward. She told this crowd here tonight, I'm a fighter and I'm scrappy. And David, tonight, she's challenging Donald Trump to a debate. 
David. All right, we'll see if he answers that question with a yes or a no. He has said no to that question so far, and it's been successful for him. Eva Pilgrimer, thanks to you. Let's break this down. Let's get right to uh, Lindsay Davis, my partner in crime here. And, and you've been diving into the exit polls, and what the voters in New Hampshire have said, they're always different. You go from Iowa to New Hampshire, and what they've said is quite telling when it comes to who actually turned out today and their party affiliation. There was a lady who I think said it best from New Hampshire who was an independent voter, and she described themselves as the middle child who keeps peace in the family. And boy, did they turn out today. 46% who described themselves as undeclared or independent. That's a record for a New Hampshire primary. Uh, last time was 45% in 2012. And I also want to take a look at the qualities that matter most. People said fights for people like me overwhelmingly was the most important, followed by shares my values and ultimately has the right temperament. Not surprising to have such a sizable Republican turnout in New Hampshire, but that number of undeclared voters, independent voters who are willing to turn out today, the fact that it set a record is quite telling. But in the end, not enough for Nikki Haley. She needed that turnout, she got it, but still didn't win. Which takes us straight to John Carl. Lindsay, thank you. John, the question is, does Nikki Haley really have a, a realistic path forward here? Look, you can't say she doesn't have a path. We've only had two states vote. They're both small states. It goes to South Carolina. She got elected governor there twice by big margins. She was a popular governor, but David, bottom line, this was the state, New Hampshire, that she had the best chance to win, and she lost decisively. On the flip side, you had Donald Trump with a decisive win in Iowa, a decisive win tonight in New Hampshire. But it did show that half of the people who turned out were willing to vote for someone other than Donald Trump on the Republican side, the independent side. The Trump campaign has to be aware of this. And when you get to November, if it is Trump-Biden, where do those voters go? Yeah, and it wasn't just you had nearly half uh, voting against Trump. You had people voting for Nikki Haley because they wanted to stop Trump. So he faces a very real phenomenon. It's not a new phenomenon, but it's bigger than it was in the past of never Trump Republicans. He overwhelmingly controls this party, but there is a segment of Republicans that are now closer to calling themselves former Republicans who just will not vote for him in a general election. That could be a problem. they got to be fully aware of that moving forward in this rematch, potential rematch, yes. but it's looking a lot like it uh, with President Biden. Let's get right over to our political director, Rick Klein, because you've been looking at this literal path ahead for uh, Nikki Haley. She hopes to pick up uh, as she goes with these independents, these undeclared voters, and more moderate Republicans along the way. But what's What's ahead for her? Yeah, David, it starts slow, but it gets fast, really fast. And this is the problem for Nikki Haley. If you don't win in one of these first couple of states, maybe that's fine. You've got the time before South Carolina. But right after that is Super Tuesday. By Super Tuesday, almost half the delegates that the, the entire Republican convention will select will be chosen. So if you don't get something started early, you may as well not be in the game at all. Mary Bruce with us here at Recline. Our thanks to you at the big board. Mary, of course, our chief White House correspondent. And uh, the White House, the Biden campaign saying, we're not going to respond tonight to the results, and they've responded. They certainly have it. And they are happy, of course, that Joe Biden did win the Democratic primary, even though he wasn't on the ballot. No Democrat, no delegates were up for grabs there. And they are already looking ahead to the general. In a statement tonight saying Trump has all but locked up the GOP nomination, and then outlining again what is at stake. That central argument of this campaign that Donald Trump, they say, is promising to undermine America. American democracy. And David, the campaign is repeating that line we are going to hear over and over again in the coming months that Donald Trump is about to face in a general election. The one person who has beaten him at the ballot box, that is Joe Biden. Their argument, Biden has beat him once. They say he will beat him again. And a real quick follow for you. The president gave a speech today and clearly has pivoted completely to Donald Trump. Yeah. And get this, David. No less than 14 times did Joe Biden name check Donald Trump. Just a couple months ago, you were hard pressed to find the president even willing to mention Donald Trump by name. It is a clear sign he is ramping up his attacks, gearing up for what we know is going to be a long general election. Mary Bruce with us here. Mary, thank you. Martha Raddatz, who has traveled this country often. Uh, no question after Iowa, New Hampshire, the signal many of these voters are sending is that Donald Trump still has a very strong hold on the Republican Party, but there are others who are signaling we might be willing here to vote for somebody other than Trump. It, exactly, and those are the kinds of people who are voting for Nikki Haley, and where those votes go among independents is so important. If this is a Trump-Biden matchup, I've heard voters come out of those polling places across the country and simply say, I can't do it again for Donald Trump. I may have voted for him in 2016. I may have voted for him in 2020, but there's simply too much chaos. And that's a red signal, a flashing red signal for Donald Trump. He has to worry about those voters. All right, Martha Raddus with us. One last question here to Mary Bruce, because uh, Mary, you heard Nikki Haley say this in her final sort of closing argument before the primary here in New Hampshire. She puts out that number 70% of Americans don't 
don't want a Donald Trump Joe Biden rematch. The White House fully aware of these numbers, uh, and yet it looks more and more like that's exactly where we're headed. It certainly does. It is very hard to see, as we were discussing, how we aren't headed towards this historic rematch. And the Biden campaign is gearing up for it. We know they certainly would welcome that chance to have that rematch. It certainly seems Donald Trump would like it as well. And I gather they wouldn't mind Nikki Haley staying in this a bit, too, to bruise up Donald Trump. Spend some of his money on her before he gets to the general election. Exactly. All right, Mary Bruce and the whole team here uh, for our coverage on the network. We're going to continue after we return you to regular programming with our coverage on our digital channel, the entire team on ABC News Live. I'm David Muir. I'll see you there. And for the rest of you, enjoy the coverage from the network and your local news. And I'll see you tomorrow on World News Tonight. Goodbye. Live election update, the New Hampshire primary. Welcome back to our coverage of New Hampshire primary. For those just joining us, this is ABC News Live. And ABC News has been projecting this evening that Donald Trump has won the New Hampshire primary, defeating Nikki Haley. The battle for the Republican presidential nomination now moves to Nikki Haley's home state of South Carolina. I want to bring in our political consultants, Donna Brazil and Reince Priebus. Donna, first I want to go to you. Uh, I'm curious what you make of the results tonight in New Hampshire. You heard what Lindsey Davis reported there just moments ago. The exit polls actually showing a sizable number of undeclared and independent voters going for Nikki Haley. Uh, Donald Trump with a decisive win, but there's some warning signs there as well. Oh, absolutely. Look, in Iowa, I believe more than 50 percent of the voters identified with the Make America a Greater Movement. Here in New Hampshire, it was 35 percent. So that should be a warning sign. Again, unaffiliated voters are the key to victory, not just in New Hampshire, but in several other states coming down the pike. And if Trump is unable to convince them that he can carry their values and their judgments and their votes, then he's going to have trouble in the general election. Look, Donald Trump, I, I, I want to fact check his so-called analysis of winning. He lost in 2016 by less than 3,000 votes to Hillary Clinton. He lost in 2020 by less than 59,000 votes. So I don't know on what planet he's winning in New Hampshire when Nikki Haley had it right. He keeps losing. What do you make, though, of those undeclared independent voters? Where do they go if we end up with this general election matchup all over again between President Biden and the former president? I think the president, uh, President Biden, has to really focus on young voters. Remember, he led a historic turnout in 2020, a record turnout among all Americans. And of course, he won the popular vote by more than 8 million votes. So he has to really focus on young voters. Today, if you look at the exit poll, one in four voters made up their mind within the last eight days. Nikki Haley could have left Des Moines and jumped on a plane, got to Manchester, and at least visited seven counties in and near uh, between Nashua and, and Manchester. She didn't do that. And she needed a real strong turnout in those areas in order to win. Let's bring in Reince Priebus. Donna, thanks. Stick with us here. Former chair of the Republican National Committee, uh, Reince with us as well. And I wanted to ask you, obviously, a uh, decisive win for Donald Trump here tonight. Uh, he's going to be very happy with those results, given the fact that some of the polling in recent days showed Nikki Haley gaining momentum. And then, of course, the final polls these last uh, day or two uh, showing Donald Trump pulling ahead once again. Uh, decisive win in Iowa, decisive win now in New Hampshire. Uh, Donald Trump essentially has the nomination here. What could stop him at this point? Yeah, thank you, David. I mean, I, I think we all remember we've been hearing the talking points from the other candidates, uh, including some that have dropped out, that have said if Trump wins in Iowa and Trump wins in New Hampshire, then it's over. And, and a lot of people uh, on these programs have said the same thing. I think Jonathan Carl in the last segment before yours on ABC Live said it would be a miracle for Nikki Haley. So then the question from the party standpoint, because this is a contest for the party nomination among its members and delegates, you know, a miracle for, for what? I mean, to what end? Um, that's the big question for Nikki Haley. I've got nothing against Nikki Haley, and, and I like the people who work for her, but the reality is, is that th th this is a road to nowhere uh, right now. And I, I, I get the sense, David, that it's no different than when Ron DeSantis said after Iowa that we're continuing, we're flying to South Carolina, and lo and behold, he, he cut a video and, and, and endorsed uh, Donald Trump. So I think that's probably where this is heading. 
Given the fact that you know some of the folks inside Nikki Haley's campaign, you respect them, obviously. You respect uh, the former U.N. ambassador, I'm sure, as well, the governor. What does she do from here? What do you think the political strategy is? Does she at least stay in this through South Carolina? You look at South Carolina and the polling. If you're to believe the polling at this point, she could suffer a pretty significant defeat in her home state to Donald Trump unless those numbers change. Yeah, believe it or not, I mean, she doesn't have a real big advantage in South Carolina at all when you've got both U.S. senators supporting Donald Trump, the sitting governor who was the lieutenant governor under Nikki Haley supporting Donald Trump. What does she do, David? She sits down with the most the smartest data people and political folks around her. They map out what does Super Tuesday look like? What does South Carolina look like? How much is it gonna cost? What does, how much money do we have in the bank and how much money can we raise and is it really worth it? That's the next meeting that they're going to have and it's gonna be a, you know, a barn burner. And I, my prediction is after those couple meetings, I think she's probably going to realize that this is not going to head in the direction that she wants. Before we head over to the big board and, and recline, one more question for you, Ryan. And this, this is something that John Carl and I were talking about a moment ago. When you look at Iowa, you know, Donald Trump had a resounding victory. Uh, you know, more than half the vote hit that 50 percent mark uh, in New Hampshire. A sizable win against uh, Nikki Haley tonight. On the flip side, though, there, there were a number of people, you know, in the 40 percentage sort of range in Iowa who clearly sent a message that they were willing to vote for a candidate other than Donald Trump. You look at the independents, the undeclared voters uh, who uh, went with Nikki Haley tonight. What kind of message does that send to the Trump campaign? And is the Republican Party, uh, you know, as a whole, at all concerned about the folks who are looking for an alternative as you barrel towards this general election now, potentially uh, up against President Biden with a rematch with Donald Trump? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, you always need to build. You always need to add and, and multiply. You can't build a build a party by subtracting and dividing people out of the room. So that's always going to be the case. You know, New Hampshire is probably not a battleground state. I don't think, you know, up in New England is probably not the greatest Donald Trump territory in the world, especially among unaffiliated voters who really don't pick parties except for today to vote in a Republican primary. Um, but then again, look, David, at the people that were running. I mean, you had Tim Scott, Vivek, you had Ron DeSantis, who was exchanging insults with President Trump, and, and they all turned around and, and endorsed him. So, I mean, he got 20, what, 3 percent of the vote in Iowa. He turned around in 48 hours and endorsed President Trump. So, you know, look, I, it's a binary choice. It's going to be Biden and, 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 and presumably uh, President Trump, and it's going to come down to five states and 100,000 people will decide who the next president of the United States is. It sounds like 2020. In 2016 and 2012. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, anyway, we're right here with you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, thanks to Ryan and Don. I want to get right over to Rick Klein because you heard him talking about what's likely happening within Nikki Haley's campaign tonight and into tomorrow. Uh, but what is the path, Rick? Take us through this. Some of these states, she can try to appeal to these undeclared independent voters. Some do not have that situation. And some of it's proportional, so she can gain as she goes. But how long do donors stick with her? How long can she handle the Republican pressure as a the party as a whole when they see Donald Trump in these decisive victories. Yeah, David, on one level, almost no one has voted. I mean, look at how many contests we have ahead of us all the way through June. So we're really early in the process. And if you just look at what's upcoming in the next couple of weeks, Nikki Haley's campaign says, wait a second, now let's let's slow it down and say, all right, South Carolina, there's a possibility there. She's actually not even on the ballot in the state of Nevada. So you can cross that off. She isn't even competing there. But then when you move ahead to some of these Super Tuesday states, they see the kind of electorate that you're talking about because they allow independence, they allow sometimes Democrats. We're talking about places like Virginia and North Carolina, Massachusetts, Maine, Texas, which is a huge delegate hall, Minnesota. Now, a lot of things have to go right for all of this math to work for Nikki Haley, but at least there's the possibility as they look forward. This is their spin. This is how, what they're going to be telling donors in the coming days. If we can get through South Carolina and get a victory there, we have some really fertile ground waiting for us just a few weeks ahead of there. Is there a scenario, though, where Nikki Haley is simply staying in the race because she knows the number of legal hurdles Donald Trump faces? If she can convince the donors to stick with her, does she stick with this, knowing she can continue to add delegates, you know, add up some of these votes along the way? And we'll see what happens here. That's precisely right. But, but intriguing to me, David, we were hearing the same argument from Ron DeSantis and his supporters up until the moment he dropped out. So the harsh realities of the map and the math start to really come down on a candidate and to really look at what this means. Are you going to be talking about a contested convention? Are you going to be talking about uh, saying no to the will of the voters? That's a tough conversation for Nikki Haley to have. And I think the question of what her endgame is becomes a very real one.
Yeah, and only she knows the answer to that with her very tight circle of political strategists. It's interesting because that question came up again in the exit poll, Lindsay. We saw it in Iowa. Uh, voters there were asked if Donald Trump were convicted uh, of any of these felonies that he faces, uh, would you still support him in the numbers that came out of Iowa? And New Hampshire's numbers were quite telling as well. Yeah, we're seeing a little bit of a flip-flop. Different voters clearly in Iowa, a little more conservative. New Hampshire would have more of those independent voters, more moderate. But yet, 54% said yes, if convicted, he would still be fit to be president. So you have the majority there, 42% saying no, uh, but still a bit of a surprise that you have the majority of people in New Hampshire, again, moderate people who are saying, yeah, he could still be my president, even though he might not be able to vote for himself, he can still rule his country. Yeah, flip the coin though, 40% of the people who say they wouldn't support him, you know, all of a sudden, where would the Republican Party go if Donald Trump is the nominee, if there's not somebody standing waiting in the wings uh, still in the race? But the question, this is what I'm getting at with Rick, Will the donors stick with her that long? And listen, we don't want to get ahead of our skis here. We have no idea what's going to happen with these legal uh, sort of hurdles ahead. Uh, but will she even last that long? Yeah, look, when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking the answer is probably not. I think this is the most optimistic scenario that she can put forward. But when in reality, momentum takes over. And there were two big opportunities for a challenger to get momentum. Those are called Iowa and New Hampshire. And right now, Donald Trump is two for two. No one has ever won those two and not won the nomination on the Republican side. Somebody else watching this very closely won't likely admit it, and that's the president himself, uh, President Biden. In fact, uh, the White House, the Biden campaign, saying they wouldn't necessarily react to whatever happens in New Hampshire tonight. Not only have they reacted, I'm sure they're, they're happy with their win. They weren't nervous at all, but he wasn't technically on the ballot. People had to write him in in New Hampshire, did they not? Yeah, they did. Look, because of the way the Democrats scrambled their primary calendar, making South Carolina their first state, the president wasn't actually on the ballot tonight. There were no delegates for him to win in New Hampshire, but this is still a symbolic and certainly a welcome right in win for the president. It would have been a little embarrassing had he not been able to pull this off. But the message coming out of the campaign tonight basically is game on, right? They are looking ahead to the general election, and we are already seeing signs that they are pivoting into that all-hands-on-deck mode. In fact, earlier today, they announced that, that the president is actually moving, dispatching two of his top aides, Jen O'Malley Dillon, his deputy chief of staff, and Mike Donilon, one of his closest aides who he's been with since the early 80s. These were people who helped really to direct and were the architects behind his 2020 campaign. They're now leaving the White House, going up to Wilmington to help run this campaign. Is this considered a shakeup, or is this reinforcements, if you will? Or both. It's both. It's yeah. both. Like he is taking his best people out of the White House, putting them back on the campaign. And what's interesting is this is something that actually reportedly Barack Obama urged President Biden to do, saying that he needed to get some of his top people out of the White House and focused on the reelection. Barack Obama, also one of those big Democrats who's urging the Biden campaign to be more aggressive. And you are also seeing signs of that as well. You have to think that the Biden campaign tonight was looking at those numbers, those undeclared voters, those independent voters, and watching some of the interviews as they were coming out of their polling places across New Hampshire today. There were a number of voters who kept echoing one another. They, they said they, they voted for Nikki Haley today. They want to they want a new page uh, in this country when it comes to politics. But then they were asked the follow-up, which every reporter asks, but if we are faced with Joe Biden, Donald Trump all over again, and many of these voters said, well, you know, I'd have to vote for uh, President Biden. Sort of a reluctant answer, but you'd have to think the Biden campaign, watching these Nikki Haley numbers tonight, sees an opening there as well. Absolutely. And this is actually the argument that they have been making for months. Look, they are well aware that their message isn't resonating. They know that a lot of Americans are not exactly enthusiastic about the idea of this Biden-Trump rematch. But the argument that they make is that a lot of people simply aren't paying attention yet. And that if it really does come down to Biden and Trump, that there will be such a sharp contrast between the two, that Joe Biden will really have an opportunity to, to expand his lead, certainly based on, off of what we've seen so far in the polls. They hope that once people engage and once they do a better job of selling their message, which the Biden White House admits they need to do, that they hope they will be able to convince, especially those independents and those who are reluctantly voting for Biden, to come more onto their side. Yeah, Mary's tapping into something here, John, which is very true, I think. And yeah. A lot of people aren't paying attention. Uh, not only do they, in some ways, not want to pay attention, because it feels, again, you know, Reince was joking, like 2020, 2016, yeah. but in many ways it's echoing what we've seen these last couple of presidential cycles. Are there people who are not paying attention who are suddenly going to be handed two candidates all over again and, and say, how do we get here? Yeah, uh, I mean, for sure. And, and, and people have checked out. And, and, and let's, let's not forget how exhausting that 2020 campaign was, how exhausting uh, the Trump years were, where everybody was on edge following the ins and outs of politics because you had this unprecedented situation at the White House. People have checked out on Donald Trump. I mean, there are people who follow the legal cases. They get plenty of coverage. But what's he like as a candidate? You know, he's he campaigned. Um, 
it was a remarkably light campaign schedule in Iowa and New Hampshire, doing a fraction of the events uh, that, that, that his competitors did. It was kind of like, you know, he, he's got the name recognition, he's got the fact that there's discontent with Biden, but I think that as it's clear that he is the Republican nomination nominee, if it, it becomes clear, what does he stand for? What would a second Trump term look for? And trust me, the Biden team knows they've got a hell of a lot to work with. Uh, just with what he has said along the way, just over the past few weeks, he's talked about being a dictator on day one. He's talked about suspending the Constitution in certain circumstances. He's talked about the death penalty for the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I mean, this is stuff that for the most part, aside from Chris Christie before he dropped out, for the most part, uh, his Republican rivals didn't touch. Trust me, Biden's not going to be afraid yeah. to make sure everybody in America knows exactly all of that. Yes, that will be the campaign. Uh, let's that bring will in, be the campaign. Let's bring in Rachel Scott because, you know, Rick Klein was talking about this, some of the political pressure that will come within uh, the Republican Party for Nikki Haley at some point here once you see these Trump uh, victories uh, begin to mount. Uh, and from Capitol Hill tonight, a message of at least a, an effort for Republican unity around Donald Trump. David, we are seeing more and more Republicans on Capitol Hill calling on the party to now unite around former President Donald Trump, fresh off of that win in Iowa and now New Hampshire. And just moments ago, we got a statement from the new House Speaker, Mike Johnson. Uh, he says here that he's calling on the party to now move past and unite uh, behind President Trump so we can focus on ending uh, Biden's presidency and growing our majority in Congress. And I heard that same concern from Senator Tim Scott, who you saw there on the stage with the former president tonight. He said that every day that Nikki Haley sit, stays in this race is another day that they're not necessarily focused on how they could possibly defeat uh, President Joe Biden in the fall. That is a big concern for a lot of Republicans. So you're going to start to see that pressure on uh, on Nikki Haley to drop out only increase the longer that she stays in this race. But you you heard from her. She says that this race is far from over. Uh, she's taking this all the way to her home state of South Carolina, where the former president is currently leading in the polls. As for Trump, he's heading out west with stops in Arizona and Nevada over the course of the next few days, David. Rachel Scott, live at the Trump campaign where Donald Trump spoke a short time ago. And uh, not only did he signal time for unity in his two victory speeches, but now as we're hearing a uh, Speaker of the House uh, calling for Republican unity around uh, Donald Trump. Again, Iowa, New Hampshire, we're just getting started, but the path looks fairly clear at this point. There are always surprises. And as we heard from Nikki Haley tonight, uh, it's the first in the nation primary, you know, not the last. And Martha Raddatz, she must know the onslaught that's coming from the Trump campaign. I, I think it could be an absolutely brutal month for Nikki Haley. You heard Donald Trump tonight. He went after Nikki Haley. We, we talked last week about the winning Donald Trump and how his personality really changes. I'm winning. I'm on top of everybody tonight. I'm going to do this. And, and he has a very positive message. He is clearly angry that Nikki Haley is not saying, I'm, I'm, I'm on the Trump team now, I'm out of here. And you could hear it in his voice, you could hear it in, in, in really the cruelty. You've, you've seen it the last few weeks where he's gone after Nikki Haley in ways that he hadn't before. But you could see the anger with him tonight. It was the darker Donald Trump. And, and she is in for a brutal run if she stays in here. We did see the change because after Iowa, you heard she can stay in as long as she wants. Uh, you know, critical of her, but not not the wrath, if you will, uh, the fire that can come. And, and, and obviously, as you're saying, it will likely come and come to a much greater degree in the coming weeks. When you when you look at foreign policy, because she played a major role in the Trump administration, obviously the ambassador to the U.N., and you look at these foreign conflicts that are front and center, there is a significant debate, as you know, Martha, we've been reporting on it here within the Republican Party over uh, what to do with Ukraine, uh, how much money to continue to spend on them. That, at the same time as we watch the, the war with Hamas, Israel's war with Hamas, continue to play out. Uh, and this will be something that he will likely be able to, to, to create some daylight with Nikki Haley on. Uh, he sure will, and, and especially on Ukraine, but more so with Joe Biden. And, and look, you look at the numbers, people, foreign policy is by far not at the top of the concerns for most voters. And then the polling we did tonight and the exit polling we did tonight and polling we've done before, foreign policy is way down there, except for one thing. And that is, as you said, and that we've been reporting on the war in Gaza, young voters do not like what Joe Biden is doing. They do not like to see the support for Israel and, the, and what has happened in Gaza. And 
they see every single day on social media and elsewhere and on our newscast what's happening in Gaza and the number of women and children. And that, that could be a problem for Joe Biden. And that's something Donald Trump uh, if he is the nominee, will certainly use against Joe Biden. As well. And in fact, we heard some of the protesters during his speech today. Uh, the speech was intended to draw sort of a dividing line on the issue of choice for women in this country uh, on what would have been 51 years since uh, Roe. Um, obviously, it, it stands no longer. But during this speech, ostensibly about uh, abortion rights in this country, he had to answer to protesters in the audience over what's going on in Gaza. Yeah, repeatedly interrupted. And, you know, they were able to, to throw the president off of his game a little bit in this speech. He recovered, but we have seen this time and time again at his recent public events. And Martha is absolutely right, especially with young voters. This is going to be such a challenge for this president. And especially as he gets on the road, he wants to be talking about abortion. He wants to be talking about the economy, Bidenomics. These are the issues that he wants to hammer home. And yet the interruptions today proved that he's not be able to escape this one. He has to find a way. And you've seen him trying to walk this fine line, obviously offering staunch support for Israel while trying to urge, you know, more to be done to address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, ramping up the pressure on Israelis to do more to address the horrific civilian death toll. But how does he address it in a campaign setting? They haven't quite figured that one out yet. Are Democratic strategists, though, hoping that when looking at the alternative, when it comes to climate change, you know, uh, abortion rights, that young voters will perhaps very unhappy with what the administration's stance on Israel uh, and on Gaza, that when you list the, the sort of issues top of mind most important to young voters, that, that the balance will, will still push young voters their way. Absolutely. And abortion especially is an issue where they feel that they are going to have a lot of success. And they point to what we've seen in the off-year elections, seeing that this issue has really driven voters to the polls. And you heard the president today point blank say Donald Trump has, has boasted of taking away Roe versus Wade. He has boasted of taking away reproductive rights. You are going to hear that message repeated over and over again. But again, the Biden campaign does concede they have a lot of work to do when it comes to messaging Joe Biden's accomplishments and what he's going to do going forward. Because they know you can't just run against Donald Trump. You also have to give voters something to vote for. And enthusiasm, and, and, David. I mean, definitely yeah. the enthusiasm gap. And I've seen that with voters. And, and they'll talk to me about motivate me, motivate me. And, and they may not be paying attention now, or maybe they've been paying attention for the last couple of weeks because they thought there was some sort of alternative. They probably don't see that anymore. So it's going to be motivating people to get out, to get out and vote. And Lindsay, you have the issues actually that New Hampshire voters said drove them uh, the most. Right. And it seems like there is this big divide as far as what's important to the Republican voters, what's important to the Democratic voters. Because as we see, President Biden trying to do this speech on abortion, that that's the least important from the Republican voters we heard from is they prioritize it. Economy, number one, with 37 percent, followed by immigration, which is really pretty astonishing considering that New Hampshire is about 2,300 <laughs> miles away from the southern border. But you have economy, immigration, followed then by foreign policy and abortion. Immigration, top of mind, as we know, for not only Republican voters, but Democrat voters as well. What is the administration going to do to tackle immigration? Look, they know that they have to tackle this issue because it is so critical to so many voters. And it's why you've seen the president in the last several weeks say that he is willing to come out and compromise on this issue. It's part of this current debate over what to do with funding for Ukraine and Israel. The president's the one who, who put that on the table to tie some immigration reforms to this critical need for foreign aid. The question is, where exactly is he going to compromise? How far is he willing to go? Negotiations are moving along. They said they don't want to negotiate this in public, but there certainly are signs that they are getting there. And it's not just because the president feels, you know, he wants to have a bipartisan win. He knows he has to show voters he takes this issue seriously. Does and this deliver. get through the House? <sighs> David, that's All right, a big we can question. talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know. We'll that. see. We we'll see. We'll see. The I Senate mean, I mean, it's, it's certainly making progress in the Senate. Yeah. The House is, is an X factor. Republicans are not eager to hand yeah. exactly. a hand victory this Joe close Biden to the election. An accomplishment or anything resembling a victory on this, I, I, I think you've got a very steep uh, yeah. climb in the House. I think Republicans would rather have the issue than have something to point to that they an agreement yeah. they made uh, with Joe Biden, this the close. guy that they want to blame for destroying yeah. the border. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's a it's a very certainly not this close to the election. Yeah, and we know we're, we know and we know where the 
guy who presumes himself to be the Republican nominee is on this and okay. where he'll be pressuring Republicans. And has already been pressuring, yes. Yes, yes, making calls as we know. Let's bring in Eva Pilgrim. Eva, you probably heard us talking here. Martha and I were talking about the pressure that Nikki Haley will feel, the wrath that she will feel almost immediately uh, once the temperature is turned up here uh, from Donald Trump. We have seen hints of this in the last couple of days. It's only going to get, uh, you know, uh, more extreme in the days ahead. And there's already a statement tonight from the Haley campaign about the tone, uh, the tenor of Donald Trump's speech tonight. Uh, that's right, David. Nikki Haley's campaign putting out a statement tonight about uh, former President Donald Trump's primary night speech saying it was a furious and rambling rant against Nikki Haley. If Trump is in such good shape, why is he so angry? They go on to say two states have now voted in the presidential race and Donald Trump barely received half the vote. Not exactly a ringing endorsement for the former president demanding a coronation. You know, Nikki Haley tonight talking to this crowd that was here earlier saying that she doesn't take any of this personal and she expects this. Seeing this response from Donald Trump, she knows that she's gotten under his skin a bit and that she's may be gaining some ground, may be gaining some momentum, and that's what she's taking with her to South Carolina, David. But even let me ask you about this, because she's not going to find the same sort of demographic makeup that she w had in New Hampshire, uh, what Lindsay had pointed out earlier, just the sheer number of sort of undeclared independent voters uh, willing to um, chart a new course, if you will. Uh, she's not going to face that same kind of breakdown moving forward. It, it could get far more challenging from here. Uh, do they acknowledge that? She's said all along she knows that this is going to be a hard fight. She knew this was not going to be easy. But her campaign keeps pointing out that they have a month before South Carolina. And the people of South Carolina know her. And so she's hoping that if she can get on the ground in South Carolina, talk about the things that she did. You have to remember, she was a very popular governor at the time she was governor of South Carolina. And she won pretty handedly when she was governor. And so. Those people in South Carolina, she's hoping to get in front of them, remind them, try to convince them that this isn't just about right now, that this is about the future of our country. That's the speech she keeps giving out on the campaign trail in front of these crowds, that this is about tomorrow, this is about our children, and that Donald Trump doesn't have as good a chance as she does in a head-to-head -head with Joe Biden. And she's hoping that message and her record in South Carolina will help put her over the top. Eva David. Pilgrim uh, with the Nikki Haley campaign tonight. Eva, thank you. And there's no question Nikki Haley's been talking about this two-person race. She's wanted it to be a two-person race. The question is, uh, is it too late now that the game has begun? I know it's weird to say that when we've only had Iowa and New Hampshire, but we're watching the math sort of roll out here uh, and the size of the victories from, uh, from Donald Trump. I want to bring in Mary Alice Parks, who's actually in South Carolina, where Nikki Haley will uh, head next to her home state, where she was a two-term, uh, a popular governor uh, in South Carolina, where she was the one who actually appointed, uh, you know, Senator Scott to his his role, uh, at least at the very beginning. He has now endorsed uh, Donald Trump. So she goes home, tries to convince the people of her home state to vote for her, and she's aware of the polling that has Donald Trump far ahead. Yeah, David, exactly right. The big question is, can this be Haley's home turf still, or is it just Trump territory? I mean, I've been talking to local state officials here who say, basically, she is liked, but he is loved, and that he has built out such an apparatus. I was talking to the state party chair here who said that out of all the campaigns, it is Trump who has the staff, the resources, the volunteers on the ground. And like you were saying, of course, uh, the realities of the polling. I mean, we've seen polling that shows Trump uh, 60 points uh, here in this state. But the Nikki Haley team, like we were just talking with Eva, they are confident. They talk about the fact that South Carolinians know her. She was a popular governor. She won re-election here by 15 points. Uh, she has friends in this state, and she wants to point to her record. When she's on the campaign trail, she likes talking about her record as governor. Uh, of course, we've seen in the last few days Trump really flexing those endorsements that he has. You know, I was really struck by that latest endorsement, Congresswoman Mace. Uh, because she had gone head to head with Trump, Trump really calling her names, and still she came out and backed 
Trump, even in local Charleston right here, instead of Nikki Haley. David. So it's going to be tough even on her home turf for Nikki Haley, who says she is not out of this race yet. Mary Alice, our thanks to you as well. Uh, no question, a very difficult path ahead for Nikki Haley. And Giancarlo, I wanted to ask you for a, f a final thought here before we take a quick break. Uh, as far as what she must be thinking, at least strategically, not only the map that Recline pointed out, but uh, slowly sort of hoping to gather some delegates along the way, knowing that she likely doesn't have victories ahead of her. How long can she stick with this? How long will the donors stick with her? And is there also part of this strategy, the, the, the knowledge that Donald Trump faces a lot of other things other than what we're watching politically. D David, I spoke to a, a very important donor to Haley's, uh, Haley's campaign effort today who said, even before the results came in, but it was clear where we were going, that if she in fact failed to win uh, in New Hampshire and didn't come close, uh, that there would be a reassessment about whether or not to continue to fund her campaign. So I think that is the first question, is how much in way of resources are there for her? Now look, she's got a lot in her, we don't know the exact amount she still has in her war chest, but she raised a lot of money. Uh, she had a lot of cash on hand going into New Hampshire. She will have the money to go through South Carolina, certainly. The question is, does she have the money and the wherewithal to see it through Super Tuesday. That's, that's the big question. And part of it, she has to look, you know, look at, at herself and her future. Does she assess that she can win in her state? Mary Alice pointed out she was a popular governor. She won twice. Uh, but if you look at any polling, and there hasn't been a lot of reliable polling, but any indication, it sure looks like Donald Trump has a very strong position in South Carolina. He's got the endorsements of all of those uh, in, in the congressional delegation, except for one House member. He's got the governor. He's got, I mean, he's very popular, much more popular in South Carolina, frankly, than he was in Iowa or in New Hampshire. So does Nikki Haley want to face the possibility of an embarrassing loss in the state where she served as governor? Uh, for nearly two terms. And not only that, part of the calculus has to be her own political future. She, yes. She's running for president now. It doesn't mean she won't run again in four years uh, if it doesn't go her way this time. Uh, we want to we want to say we still don't know, uh, obviously, but she has not won a state yet in, in this process. And if she wants to, and this is the other thing. We've heard a lot of people say, well, why didn't she go after Donald Trump faster yeah. and sooner? I, I think that's easier said than done when you know that you need some of those voters in the end to help you over the finish line if you make it to the general. But, you know, the other thing, and this is big for the donors, too, because, by the way, it doesn't take a lot of big, big money donors to keep a campaign alive. Uh, we, we, we've seen that in the past, especially with the campaign finance rules being basically non-existent with super PACs. So you, you will have a, a segment of the party and of that donor class that wants to ensure that there is somebody that remains in this race. Somebody waiting in the wings. Somebody waiting in the rings. That Donald Trump is such a volatile candidate. All the, the legal cases you mentioned, and not just that, the kinds of things he is saying. Um, you know, he has an ability uh, uh, to, to, to create campaign gaffes that are greater than any anything we've ever seen, and to survive them. How long can that maintain? But you need somebody, somebody in the race, just in case Donald Trump falls. Is she willing to be that person? Yes. She says she, she She's can. the only one left. Yeah, yeah. She's the only one left. And so is she willing to be the withering that? criticism that Martha says is around the corner, which we all know is true? Yes. Stick through it. And, and by the way, that's happens. why you see the Speaker of the House coming out and endorsing. Uh, I mean, he already endorsed Trump, but basically calling on everybody to get online. I mean, Trump is putting pressure and making it clear. You saw the anger. Martha's exactly right. That was an angry guy for a guy that just wanted, to, you know, a double-digit victory. Uh, an angry guy, and he is expressing that anger to Republicans who have not yet come out to endorse him and putting the pressure on those who have to put pressure on Haley. Uh, to get out of this race. It, it's so interesting because it's the political calculation within the leaders of the party, the, the established politicians within the party, because typically after a, a victory like that in New Hampshire, you'd come out and, and you oh, would talk yeah. about bringing the voters yeah. together to try to appeal to the people who voted for Nikki Haley as you move forward in the process. But this was not about that tonight, at least no. the particular anger that you're speaking of. It's yeah. about who has not... And I think there was a subliminal message on the stage right behind him on one shoulder is Senator Tim Scott, former opponent. The other side is Vivek Ramaswamy, who he actually gave them both time the to floor, speak. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think that the messaging there very quietly is Nikki Haley, get on board, right? Because kind of what he says goes, at least to people who are following along the party line. And just one other board I just wanted to bring up. The 
proves this point. 47% of those people tonight who were polled said that Joe Biden is not a legitimate president. So we're talking about just shy of half of those people who went out to vote uh, don't believe that Joe Biden is That number down from won. Iowa, though. Correct? It is down from Iowa. Yeah, still a significant number. There's no question about that. But isn't that... Uh, isn't that a risk, Martha? You know, Lindsay pointed out the number earlier that if Donald Trump were convicted of a crime, you know, of one of these felonies that he faces in this pathway ahead, the legal pathway, other than the political uh, road ahead for him, uh, that you had a sizable amount of the electorate that, sa that said, no, it wouldn't be a problem. But you also had a significant number of Republicans and independent voters who turned out uh, in New Hampshire today who said, yes, it would be a problem. Uh, if he's convicted. Isn't that a risk for the Republican Party sort of coalescing around Donald Trump so quickly? There's so many risks to the Republican Party right now and how they're coalescing around uh, various, various things with Donald Trump. But Donald Trump has has made this a campaign calling. I mean, come there. I'm a victim. That is that has been one of his primary messages. They're after me. So it's it's not, I, I think, it's not just, hey, it's okay if he's convicted of a crime, we, we'd still support him. They don't believe believe that he's guilty. If, he, if, if they brought down a guilty verdict, I think it would probably be much like the election. Like, we don't believe that this election wasn't stolen. I doubt a lot of those people would believe that if he was found guilty of those crimes. I mean, look at the E. Jean Carroll case. A lot of people think that's just fraudulent. And, and what's happening now, he's in court. He's in court rather than campaigning. That is his campaign. That has been one of his singular campaign messages. Poor me, they're going after me. No question, it's been used as a political platform and successfully, at least uh, so far. Uh, last question to you, Mary Bruce, our Chief White House Correspondent, before we, we take a break here. I would gather the Biden campaign has no problem with Nikki Haley sticking <laughs> around in this race a while longer to try to go after Donald Trump as she has been, uh, you know, to take the barbs from Trump while they get their, their election campaign up and running against who they believe firmly will be Donald Trump in the fall. Look, if she wants to hang around and rough him up a little bit, I'm sure they are just fine with that. And it does beg a question of what does Joe Biden's campaign look like going forward, right? So far, he has not been on the campaign trail a lot at all. In fact, today was actually his first official campaign event of the year. We have been told, look, they're trying to keep their powder dry as long as possible here. They're trying to save their money until they really need it, which gets to the point of, you know, go ahead and let Nikki Haley beat him up a little bit. I am told, you know, you're going to see the campaign ramping up a little bit over the next several weeks, putting out, you know, more ads, more paid media, doing more at the local level. Look, early spring or late spring, early summer, when you're finally going to see the president sort of stepping up those campaign rallies. But if it, if it truly is a Trump-Biden rematch, people are very familiar with these candidates. They know what they're getting into. To Martha's point, so much of this campaign is really simply going to be a get-out-the-vote effort. You're not going to see these candidates out there doing multiple campaign events on and off a campaign bus all day long. Donald Trump will be spending a lot of time in court. The president will be bouncing back and forth between the White House and the trail and really just trying to get his message out there and urging people to get out and vote, hammering home that enthusiasm issue. And playing a larger role role, at least in recent weeks, has been the Vice President Kamala yeah. Harris, who told you in the one-on-one -on -one interview that she knows they'll have to get out there and earn these votes. Absolutely, because they know that they have a real problem. And look, you're seeing it not just in the polling, but also they're hearing it from some of their biggest Democratic backers. In South Carolina, Jim Clyburn, the man who resuscitated Joe Biden's campaign in 2020, is out there saying he is very worried that their message isn't resonating, especially with critical constituencies like black voters. And they know they have their work cut out to them. They have have to get out there and make it very clear, as Kamala Harris told me, who brought them, who is delivering for them. And they know that they, they, they've got an uphill battle when it comes to some of these issues. All right. Incredible conversation. The conversation continues. I'm going to hand it over to Jay O'Brien. And we're going to continue right here on ABC News Live. Jay, take it away. David and team, thank you. I'm Jay O'Brien. You're watching coverage of the New Hampshire primary right here on ABC News Live. It is 1030 here in the East, actually 1037 now. ABC News has projected that former President Donald Trump will win the Republican primary in the Granite State. He is up 54 percent to Nikki Haley's 44 percent. You see it there on your screen. Trump celebrating his win not long ago tonight with harsh words for his competitor and former U.N. ambassador. Pretended she won Iowa. <laughs> and I looked around, I said, didn't she come in third? Yeah, she came in third. And then I looked at the polls. She was talking about most winnability, who's going to win. And I had one put up. I don't know if you see it, but I have one put up. We've won almost every single poll in the last three months against Crooked Joe Biden. Almost every poll. And she doesn't win those polls. 
And she doesn't win those. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody take a victory. Nikki Haley also taking to the stage tonight. She said this to a room of supporters. Well, I'm a fighter. And I'm scrappy. And now we're the last one standing next to Donald Trump. And today we got close to half of the vote. We still have a ways to go, but we keep moving up. President Biden winning in the Democratic side of things tonight. He, in fact, just putting out a statement not long ago saying that it is clear that former President Trump will be the nominee and that the stakes could not be higher. President Biden, though, did have a primary challenger there in New Hampshire, the Minnesota Congressman Democrat Dean Phillips. There was Biden was not technically on the ballot there in New Hampshire. Instead, Democrats there had to write his name in. South Carolina is officially the first Democratic primary this year. Someone who spent quite a bit of time in New Hampshire was Dean Phillips. He was hoping to gain some steam against Biden. As we heard a short time ago, Phillips encouraging his supporters to stay with him, saying he is not dropping out of this race. Our Zareen Shah is there and spoke with Congressman Phillips earlier. Here's what he said. Some people are saying you're pushing Donald Trump toward the White House, possibly taking away some of Nikki Haley's votes. A lot of independents that I spoke to said they wanted to vote for you. What do you have to say about that? She could have possibly been a lot closer had those independents voted for her. Oh, and by the way, I think the country would be much happier with a Nikki Haley, Dean Phillips matchup this November. That's what we're hearing. I know she's hearing that. I'm hearing the same thing. Seven like on the same ticket or? Well, no, I'm not saying the same ticket. No, I said against each other. Zoreen joins us now from that Dean Phillips event. Zoreen, look, it's it's what, 1040, but the night is young despite the fact that we have the races called here, and it's because we've got open questions as to what comes next. So for Dean Phillips, what is the latest from his campaign, and where does this campaign go from here? So, Jay, for Dean Phillips, this is a win. I mean, he had said that 20% of the vote would be a win for him. It looks like he's going to hit that target number. The exact numbers are still a little bit TBD. And he also said that, look, if, if, uh, if the incumbent president doesn't hit 80, that that's going to be an embarrassment. So, actually, both things happened. He hit 20%, which is a win for him at this moment. Uh, Joe Biden did hit 80, though, at the moment. Um, that, that is pretty good, you got to say, for a president who wasn't even on the ballot. Joe Biden had to get people to write in his name. A lot of people certainly did. But I think that question that I asked Ian Phillips is really an important one and something that a lot of people are going to be looking at. Did those independent voters go towards Dean Phillips when they could have gone to a Nikki Haley? Could she have been a lot closer to Donald Trump? I mean, that is the race, the Republican race that a lot of people were looking at. It's interesting, the Biden campaign looking right past Dean Phillips. I texted a Biden aide tonight. If they were watching Dean Phillips speak, they didn't even know that he was speaking at the time that he was speaking. Zoreen Shah at that Dean Phillips event. Zoreen, thank you. I want to turn now to senior White House correspondent Selena Wang. Selena, I want to stay with the Biden campaign here because they are looking past those primary challengers, as I said. They're looking right at former President Trump. That bore out in the statement that the president just released moments ago. You were at an event that the president and the vice president held today centered around abortion rights. What was the 2024 argument that the president made there? Well, look, this campaign, they've been squarely focused on Donald Trump, not just since this result, but for several weeks now. We heard the president really ramping up his rhetoric, directly going after Trump, calling him out by name at least 14 times with this strong message saying, look, it is Donald Trump who is responsible for taking your freedoms away, really forming this abortion issue as a freedom issue, saying, look, the Republican Party, they're trying to restrict your freedoms, putting women's health and lives at risk, while the Democratic Party, President Joe Biden, he is trying to protect them and enshrine them. And in a new campaign statement, the president saying thanks to all of those who wrote in his name in New Hampshire. And he said, at stake here is our democracy, our personal freedoms, our economy. And, and here, quote, says, which has seen the strongest recovery in the world since COVID, all are at stake. So again, really, they're squarely focused on the general election here. They are ready for it. They are very eager to be drawing that contrast as it becomes clearer and clearer. 
Uh, Selena, we saw some divisions at that event you were at earlier today in the Democratic Party. There were protesters, as has been repeatedly mentioned tonight, repeatedly interrupting President Biden. How much of a concern is that for the Biden campaign, these young progressives who are particularly taking issue with the president's handling uh, of the Israel-Hamas war? And Jay, just going back to that event, I mean, I've been at several Biden campaign events recently, several events where he has been interrupted, but the number of times that was unprecedented, at least a dozen times you had protesters standing up during the rally, interrupting his speech. It was sort of throwing the president off, but he was still strong and fired up and, and catching himself again. But really, this just points, as you say, to the divisions within the Democratic Party, especially among young and progressive voters. But the campaign, they insist that as this clear choice becomes more obvious between Trump and Biden, that those voters are still going to go towards Biden, despite their concerns over his handling of the Israel-Hamas war. Selena Wang for us in Washington. Zareen Shatu breaking down everything Democrat. We want to go right back now to ABC News Live prime anchor, anchor Lindsey Davis, who was with that team in New York. Lindsey, uh, take it away. Oh, Jay O'Brien, we appreciate you holding it down for us. Of course, ABC News has projected Donald Trump as the winner of primary night. Nikki Haley is vowing to stay in the race. Meanwhile, ABC News has also projected that Donald Trump will win the primary, as we just said. Let's go back to ABC's Eva Pilgrim, who joins us now. Eva, what are you hearing there from voters on the ground? Well, you know, a lot of what we heard from voters or, or earlier today was that they, they didn't really love the option of a Biden-Trump rematch. And so a lot of them were thinking some who had voted for Biden previously were coming towards Nikki Haley. And some of the Trump supporters even were undecided as we were talking to them in the line. There was a huge turnout here. The lines were long. The people here in New Hampshire take their voting very seriously, and they turned out. Um, and, and really what we were hearing from them was it was about the candidates. While they, there are specific issues that are important to them, ultimately their decision about who to vote for came down to who these candidates are and how they think they will be in the future as president, Lindsay. And Eva, just give us a sense, and we heard her saying, I'm going home, she's going to sweet South Carolina. What's the strategy from here? Uh, well, Lindsay, you know, before the results even started coming in, Nikki Haley's campaign put out a press release saying that they were going to South Carolina, that they were going to continue on, that there was nothing that could happen tonight that would change their plan, and they were moving on to Super Tuesday as well. And, and this is sort of what they're thinking. They still think that there is a path forward for her, no matter what happened here in New Hampshire tonight, because she's hoping to get momentum and then pull those independent voters and those who are looking for an alternative to Trump that typically vote Republican. And in the state of South Carolina, in the Republican primary, anyone can vote in that primary as long as they didn't vote in the Democratic primary. Then you look ahead to Super Tuesday. There are 11 states that are either open primaries or semi-open. And so she's hoping that building this momentum here, she'll be able to carry it forward. She knows she's got a long road ahead. She told us multiple times over the last several weeks that she knew this was not going to be easy, but they are in this for the long haul. They are fighting for every vote, Lindsay. All right, Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. I want to bring John Carl in. And John, we were talking earlier about uh, the tone, because eight yeah. days ago when we were sitting right in these yeah. same spots, Donald Trump really gave a, a speech that was focused squarely on Biden, on moving forward. This primary is over. We're heading to the general election and then it was like a retraction tonight as he was angry he even said at one point I don't get mad I get even Tim Scott who's standing right over his shoulder had just said that he endorsed him because he could bring the country together and yet you have him saying oh don't you really hate her referring you to must you. really hate her exactly yeah. and, and so what do you think is is the the dissonance here uh, I mean first of all just just note that that this is a guy who just won by double digits and just won the second state, just on something that no other Republican in the modern primary era has done to win both Iowa and New Hampshire, no Republican non-president, uh, well on his way uh, to, to getting the nomination. And what does he do? He comes out and eviscerates uh, his uh, his vanquished opponent and does it in a very threatening way. There were all kinds of overtones of you know how they're going to go after they're going to go after Nikki if she wants to go after her, and they've got stuff we know the stuff and we're going to I mean like like as if they're about to like dump, do this big uh, dump of oppo research uh, on on Nikki Haley. Lord knows what it is or whether it's you know I mean he he showed a willingness 
time and time again to go after opponents with allegations that are entirely made up. I mean, this is somebody who accused uh, Ted Cruz's father of being involved in the JFK assassination. So he's ca capable of a really vicious campaign. That's what he was threatening. Seems incredibly eager to get Nikki Haley out of this race. And you have to ask yourself why. And why? Does he fear that, that, that she can win, even though we see that her path ahead is incredibly difficult? Why the eagerness, the almost desperation to get out of, her out of the race? I, I think it's almost that it's desperation for her to come with him. He just doesn't mm. like that. He doesn't want anyone on the other team. He thinks she should be with him, she should drop out. I, I, I mean, I think it's a really good point. Like, what, what does he fear? But I think it's just that he's angry that she hasn't dropped out, that she's still saying things about him, that she was pushing the envelope a little yeah. bit more in the last couple of weeks uh, th than she had before. And he doesn't like that. You, you know that better than anyone, John. And, and that yeah. He does well. not like that. He doesn't want anybody not on his team who he thinks should be. And Next. this more so than, I mean, this is, this is a campaign of vengeance and retribution. And I think you saw a flash of what really angers him, often more so than even the prosecutors or the Democrats are Republicans that don't fall in mm. line. And perhaps that is the case, considering that you had, as I mentioned earlier, flanked by Tim Scott and Vivek Ramaswamy. Yeah. It's like, they did it, why don't you too, uh, Nikki Haley? But one thing that I think is interesting, talking about his speech tonight, he didn't mention the issues. And when we're looking at the issues that mattered to those people who went to the polls in New Hampshire today, number one, they're saying economy, followed by immigration, and a really distant third foreign policy. Way and, distant and, third. And meanwhile, if you really are paying attention, it seems like we're at the brink of war, you know, trying to tamp down those, those concerns. Well, be, I think because one of the things is that Donald Trump has just pounded Joe Biden on immigration. Pounded, pounded, pounded. And, and, and Joe Biden has a problem there. I mean, he has to figure something out with immigration. So that is clearly how Donald Trump is going after Joe Biden. And the economy has not resonated with, with Biden voters yet at all. And, and so it's sort of like whatever Donald Trump thinks are the issues is what those voters are going to hear right now. I mean, his base is listening to him every night, wherever he is, whatever that message is, that message is completely resonating with him. I don't think this will be a huge issues campaign. I think it will come down to personalities. And this race is unlike any other. I think, you know, we compare past races and in 2016 this, in 2020 this, we have essentially two incumbents running. We, ha we have a former president and a current president. Both of them have records. Both of them you can look at, but Donald Trump's record is, is removed. So he's making it about Joe Biden. He's making about grievances and he's making about making it about what Joe Biden is or is not doing. And if this is not going to be about issues, Mary, we want to bring you in here. Somebody has to tell Joe Biden that, right? Because he's <laughs> trying to give a speech today about abortion, which happened to be the lowest of importance for the voters that went to the polls today. And, and look, Joe Biden is certainly more than happy to lean into the fact that Donald Trump isn't talking about the issues, because that's one of his central arguments, is while Donald Trump is about Donald Trump. Joe Biden says, I'm focused on the American people. That's the argument that he is trying to make. And in fact, we are just hearing in a statement from the president. And it is clear that while, you know, Nikki Haley thinks she still has a chance, Joe Biden does not. In fact, he says point blank in this statement that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee. And then he outlines what he thinks is at stake, our democracy, our personal freedoms, our economy. He says all of this is at stake. Of course, that argument that we've heard over and over again from the Biden campaign, that what is on the line in this election is our country democracy, the, the, the freedoms that this country were founded on, Biden says, are very much what is on the line here. And then what's really interesting in this statement is that Biden then appeals directly to those independents and Republicans, those voters that, that, that our team on the ground were talking to today, leaving the polling station saying, you know, I may be a Republican, and if it comes down to, to Trump versus Biden, maybe I will vote for Biden. Those Republicans who just can't stomach another four years of Donald Trump 
Biden reaching out to them, urging them to join us as Americans. But and do you hear just, that over and over again? Do you run the same playbook again if yeah. you're Joe Biden, if it is a, a rematch head to head against Joe Biden and Donald Trump? I mean, he very much is running on the exact same campaign message. I mean, you think about it. Four years ago, the, the, the argument was that this is a battle for the soul of our country. And now he's saying he needs four more years to finish the job. He is very much still arguing that he is trying to save the country again from Donald Trump. And he knows, though, look, we've been talking about this, he can't just run against Donald Trump. He has to give people something to run for. He has to hit at those issues, which is why they know they have to do a better job of getting out there and selling their accomplishments to the American people. But it, it, it is not an accident that this feels very, very familiar. But keep in <laughs> mind, he ran that playbook before January 6th, exactly. before Donald Trump tried to overturn an election, before Donald Trump talked about suspending the Constitution, before Donald Trump declared he would be a dictator on day one. I mean, he has more material, but it is... And it, it is, is very why, much the same you know, the, the first image of Joe Biden's re-election video, that video he put out announcing he was running for re-election, the first frame of video, January 6th. Mm -hmm. And whether it makes that the resonates or not, yeah. we're, we'll have to see. I mean, you, you have had so much talk about January 6th, and of course, Donald Trump talks about it, too, in a very different way, calling the people who are in prison Hostages. Hostages, <laughs> hostages yeah. which is Our, extraordinary. I want to table this conversation just for a moment to bring in Rachel Scott, who is there on the ground in Nashua, New Hampshire, for us. Been following the Trump campaign. Rachel, we heard Trump bash rival Nikki Haley earlier, calling her an imposter who failed badly. Uh, but there's a new call tonight for the, for the party to, to come together. Yeah, and we are seeing growing calls from Republicans, especially over on Capitol Hill. House Speaker Mike Johnson releasing a statement tonight. He's urging the party to unite around the former president. You obviously saw uh, Senator Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, two of Trump's former rivals on that stage with him. And then in Iowa, you had uh, Governor Doug Burgum, who also was a former rival. He endorsed him as well. So now you see this growing push to try to get this party to coalesce behind Donald Trump. As Tim Scott told me tonight, he believes that every day that Nikki Haley is still in this race is a day that they are not talking about Joe Biden and how they're going to potentially defeat him in the November election. But as you guys all pointed out, this speech tonight was really light on issues, which is somewhat ironic here when you look at the polling data. The former president actually polls ahead of Nikki Haley on several key issues that are important to voters, including the economy, immigration. Those are things that are top of mind for voters. They told us that when they were heading into the polls today. One thing that I think uh, is going to be keen for the former president uh, to think about if he thinks he's heading into this general election as he's one step away from possibly uh, clinching the Republican nomination here is independent voters. We certainly talked to so many independent voters that just quite frankly did not like either option of Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Uh, they felt like Donald Trump had too much legal chaos around him. They thought both of them were just simply too old and they really couldn't fathom a potential rematch. Uh, some of them even struggling to even tell us who they would possibly support if we see Biden and Trump facing off in November, Lindsay. Yeah, we've seen that again and again. Overwhelmingly, the majority of, uh, of voters are basically saying that they're going to hold their nose and vote if it's going to be another rematch between Biden and Trump. Rachel Scott, we appreciate you being with us all night. want to send it now to ABC News political director Rick Klein, who's back with us again. Uh, Rick, let's take a look at where the race goes from here. Haley is not competing in the Nevada caucus, uh, but let's take a look at, at South Carolina. I know you're ready at all I'm times. Oh, yeah, so South Carolina, <laughs> this is our 5 30 in polling average, Lindsay, and it is not close right now. Donald Trump is winning by a lot. Uh 35 points in this polling, and, and it hasn't gotten any closer. If you just zoom into the last couple of weeks, you see Donald Trump picking up some ground. And where things get pretty difficult for, for Haley is if you start to look ahead a little bit, our partners at 538 put together a, a chart of the upcoming states. And here they've looked at what, what they have to do in terms of how many delegates they win. This to me is really striking because they're saying that Donald Trump actually doesn't have to win anything in South Carolina and he'll be fine. Nikki Haley needs to win them all. She has to clean up in her home state to even be on track for the nomination. And it's just, it's so striking when you, when you start to get into any of the math around the nomination to know that things get really serious really fast. It looks like there hasn't been much happening yet. And look, we're here on January 3rd and you've got like 2% or something of the, of the delegates that you, need to, that you need to win the nomination have been named. But by Super Tuesday, that jumps up to almost half. By, by the beginning of April, it's, it's basically over. So there's a very short window to make a difference. And, and there's really no realistic path that I can see in looking at the states ahead 
without seeing a Nikki Haley victory in South Carolina a month from now. And it will be a long, and as Martha pointed out, a very searing month for Nikki Haley to endure. Oh, Rick Klein, we thank you. Everybody here at the roundtable, we appreciate you. Hopefully there will be a real Super Tuesday, and it's not Super Today uh, right now, <laughs> and that that's it. Uh, but that is our show for tonight, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from Hiroshima, I'm Brick Clenet. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Live election update, the New Hampshire primary. Welcome back to our coverage of New Hampshire primary. For those just joining us, this is ABC News Live, and ABC News has been projecting this evening that Donald Trump has won the New Hampshire primary, defeating Nikki Haley. The battle for the Republican presidential nomination now moves to Nikki Haley's home state of South Carolina. I want to bring in our political consultants, Donna Brazil and Reince Priebus. Donna, first I want to go to you. Uh, I'm curious what you make of the results tonight in New Hampshire. You heard what Lindsey Davis reported there just moments ago. The exit polls actually showing a sizable number of undeclared and independent and voters going for Nikki Haley. Uh, Donald Trump with a decisive win, but there's some warning signs there as well. Oh, absolutely. Look, in Iowa, I believe more than 50% of the voters identified with the Make America Greater movement. Here in New Hampshire, it was 35%, so that should be a warning sign. Again, unaffiliated voters are the key to victory, not just in New Hampshire, but in several other states coming down the pike. And if Trump is unable to convince them that he can carry their values and their judgments and their votes, then he's going to have trouble in the general election. Look, Donald Trump, I, I, I want to fact check his so-called analysis of winning. He lost in 2016 by less than 3,000 votes to Hillary Clinton. He lost in 2020 by less than 59,000 votes. So I don't know on what planet he's winning in New Hampshire when Nikki Haley had it right. He keeps losing. What do you make, though, of those undeclared independent voters? Where do they go if we end up with this general election matchup all over again between President Biden and the former president? I think the president, uh, President Biden, has to really focus on young voters. Remember, he led a historic turnout in 2020, a record turnout among all Americans. And of course, he won the popular vote by more than 8 million votes. So he has to really focus on young voters. Today, if you look at the exit poll, one in four voters made up their mind within the last eight days. Nikki Haley could have left Des Moines and jumped on a plane, got to Manchester, and at least visited seven counties in and near uh, between Nashua and, and Manchester. She didn't do that. And she needed needed a real strong turnout in those areas in order to win. Let's bring in Reince Priebus. Donna, thanks. Stick with us here. Former chair of the Republican National Committee, uh, Reince with us as well. And I wanted to ask you, obviously, a uh, decisive win for Donald Trump here tonight. Uh, he's going to be very happy with those results, given the fact that some of the polling in recent days showed Nikki Haley gaining momentum. And then, of course, the final polls these last uh, day or two uh, showing Donald Trump pulling ahead once again. Uh, decisive win in Iowa, decisive win now in New Hampshire. Uh, Donald Trump essentially has the nomination here. What could stop him at this point? Yeah, thank you, David. I mean, I, I think we all remember we've been hearing 
the talking points from the other candidates, uh, including some that have dropped out, that have said if Trump wins in Iowa and Trump wins in New Hampshire, then it's over. And, and a lot of people uh, on these programs have said the same thing. I think Jonathan Carl in the last segment before yours on ABC Live said it would be a miracle for Nikki Haley. So then the question from the party standpoint, because this is a contest for the party nomination among its members and delegates, you know, a miracle for, for what? I mean, to what end? Um, that's the big question for Nikki Haley. I've got nothing against Nikki Haley, and, and I like the people work for her, but the reality is, is that th this is a road to nowhere uh, right now. And I, I, I get the sense, David, that it's no different than when Ron DeSantis said after Iowa that we're continuing, we're flying to South Carolina, and lo and behold, he, he cut a video and, and, and endorsed uh, Donald Trump. So I think that's probably where this is heading. Given the fact that you know some of the folks inside Nikki Haley's campaign, you respect them, obviously. You respect uh, the former U.N. ambassador, I'm sure, as well, the governor. What does she do from here? What do you think the political strategy is? Does she at least stay in this through South Carolina? You look at South Carolina and the polling. If you're to believe the polling at this point, she could suffer a pretty significant defeat in her home state to Donald Trump unless those numbers change. Yeah, believe it or not, I mean, she doesn't have a real big advantage in South Carolina at all when you've got both U.S. senators supporting Donald Trump, the sitting governor who was the lieutenant governor under Nikki Haley supporting Donald Trump. What does she do, David? She sits down with the most, the smartest data people and political folks around her. They map out what does Super Tuesday look like, what does South Carolina look like, how much is it going to cost? What does, how much money do we have in the bank and how much money can we raise and is it really worth it? That's the next meeting that they're going to have and it's gonna be a, you know, a barn burner. And I, my prediction is after those couple meetings, I think she's probably gonna realize that this is not gonna head in the direction that she wants. Before we head over to the big board and, and recline, one more question for you, Ryan. And this, this is something that John Carl and I were talking about a moment ago. When you look at Iowa, you know, Donald Trump had a resounding victory. Uh, you know, more than half the vote hit that 50% mark. Uh, in New Hampshire, a sizable win against uh, Nikki Haley tonight. On the flip side, though, there, there were a number of people, you know, in the 40 percentage sort of range in Iowa who clearly sent a message that they were willing to vote for a candidate other than Donald Trump. You look at the independents, the undeclared voters uh, who uh, went with Nikki Haley tonight. What kind of message does that send to the Trump campaign? And is the Republican Party uh, you know, as a whole, at all concerned about the folks who are looking for an alternative as you barrel towards this general election now, potentially uh, up against President Biden with a rematch with Donald Trump? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, you always need to build, you always need to add and, and multiply. You can't build a build a party by subtracting and dividing people out of the room. So that's always going to be the case. You know, New Hampshire is probably not a battleground state. I don't think, you know, up in New England is probably not the greatest Donald Trump territory in the world, especially among unaffiliated voters who really don't pick parties except for today to vote in a Republican primary. Um, but then again, look, David, at the people that were running. I mean, you had Tim Scott, Vivek, you had Ron DeSantis, who was exchanging insults with President Trump, and, and they all turned around and, and endorsed him. So, I mean, he got 20, what, 3 percent of the vote in Iowa. He turned around in 48 hours and endorsed President Trump. So, you know, look, I, it's a binary choice. It's going to be Biden and, 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 and presumably uh, President Trump, and it's going to come down to five states and 100,000 people will decide who the next president of the United States is. It sounds like 2020. In 2016 and 2012. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, anyway, we're right here with you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, thanks to Ryan and Don. I want to get right over to Rick Klein because you heard him talking about what's likely happening within Nikki Haley's campaign tonight and into tomorrow. Uh, but what is the path, Rick? Take us through this. Some of these states, she can try to appeal to these undeclared independent voters. Some do not have that situation. And some of it's proportional, so she can gain as she goes. But how long do donors stick with her? How long can she handle the Republican pressure as a the party as a whole when they see Donald Trump in these decisive victories. Yeah, David, on one level, almost no one has voted. I mean, look at how many contests we have ahead of us all the way through June. So we're really early in the process. And if you just look at what's upcoming in the next couple of weeks, Nikki Haley's campaign says, wait a second, now let's let's slow it down and say, all right, South Carolina, there's a possibility there. She's actually not even on the ballot in the state of Nevada. So you can cross that off. She isn't even competing there. But then when you move ahead to some of these Super Tuesday states, they see the kind of electorate that you're talking about because they allow independence, they allow 
House, sometimes Democrats. We're talking about places like Virginia and North Carolina, Massachusetts, Maine, Texas, which is a huge delegate hall, then Minnesota. Now, a lot of things have to go right for all of this math to work for Nikki Haley, but at least there's the possibility as they look forward. This is their spin. This is how, what they're going to be telling donors in the coming days. If we can get through South Carolina and get a victory there, we have some really fertile ground waiting for us just a few weeks ahead of there. Is there a scenario, though, where Nikki Haley is simply staying in the race because she knows the number of legal hurdles Donald Trump faces? If she can convince the donors to stick with her, does she stick with this, knowing she can continue to add delegates, you know, add up some of these votes along the way? And we'll see what happens here. That's precisely right. But, but intriguing to me, David, we were hearing the same argument from Ron DeSantis and his supporters up until the moment he dropped out. So the harsh realities of the map and the math start to really come down on a candidate and to really look at what this means. Are you going to be talking about a contested convention? Are you going to be talking about uh, saying no to the will of the voters? That's a tough conversation for Nikki Haley to have. And I think the question of what her end game is becomes a very real one. Yeah, and only she knows the answer to that with her very tight circle of political strategists. It's interesting because that question came up again in the exit poll, Lindsay. We saw it in Iowa. Uh, voters there were asked if Donald Trump were convicted uh, of any of these felonies that he faces, uh, would you still support him in the numbers that came out of Iowa? And New Hampshire's numbers were quite telling as well. Yeah, we're seeing a little bit of a flip-flop. Different voters clearly in Iowa, a little more conservative. New Hampshire have more of those independent voters, more moderate. But yet, 54% said yes if convicted, he would still be fit to be president. So you have the majority there, 42% saying no, uh, but still a bit of a surprise that you have the majority of people in New Hampshire, again, moderate people who are saying, yeah, he could still be my president, even though he might not be able to vote for himself, he can still rule his country. Yeah, flip the coin though, 40% of the people who say they wouldn't support him, you know, all of a sudden, where would the Republican Party go if Donald Trump is the nominee, if there's not somebody standing waiting in the wings? Uh, still in the race. But the question this was uh, getting at with Rick, will the donors stick with her that long? Uh, and listen, we don't want to get ahead of our skis here. We have no idea what's going to happen with these legal uh, sort of hurdles ahead. Uh, but will she even last that long? Yeah, look, I, when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking the answer is probably not. I think this is the most optimistic scenario that she can put forward. But when in reality, momentum takes over. And there were two big opportunities for an, a challenger to get momentum. Those are called Iowa and New Hampshire. And right now, Donald Trump is two for two. No one has ever won those two and not won the nomination on the Republican side. Somebody else watching this very closely won't likely admit it, and that's the president himself, uh, President Biden. In fact, uh, the White House, the Biden campaign, saying they wouldn't necessarily react to whatever happens in New Hampshire tonight. Not only have they reacted, I'm sure they're they're happy with their win. They weren't nervous at all, but he wasn't technically on the ballot. People had to write him in in New Hampshire, did they not? Yeah, they did. Look, because of the way the Democrats scrambled their primary calendar, making South Carolina their first state, the president wasn't actually on the ballot tonight. There were no delegates for him to win in New Hampshire, but this is still a symbolic and certainly a welcome write-in win for the president. It would have been a little embarrassing had he not been able to pull this off. But the message coming out of the campaign tonight basically is game on, right? They are looking ahead to the general election, and we are already seeing signs that they are pivoting into that all-hands-on-deck mode. In fact, earlier today, they announced that, that the president is actually moving, dispatching two of his top aides, Jen O'Malley Dillon, his deputy chief of staff, and Mike Donilon, one of his closest aides who he's been with since the early 80s. These were people who helped really to direct and were the architects behind his 2020 campaign. They're now leaving the White House, going up to Wilmington to help run this campaign. Is this considered a shakeup, or is this reinforcements, if you will? Or both. It's both. It's yeah. both. Like he is taking his best people out of the White House, putting them back on the campaign. And what's interesting is this is something that actually reportedly Barack Obama urged President Biden to do, saying that he needed to get some of his top people out of the White House and focused on the reelection. Barack Obama, also one of those big Democrats who's urging the Biden campaign to be more aggressive. And you are also seeing signs of that as well. You have to think that the Biden campaign tonight was looking at those numbers, those undeclared voters, those independent voters, and watching some of the interviews as they were coming out of their polling places across New Hampshire today. There were a number of voters who kept echoing one another. They, they said they, they voted for Nikki Haley today. They want to they want a new page uh, in this country when it comes to politics. But then they were asked the follow-up, which every reporter asks, but if we are faced with Joe Biden, Donald Trump all over again, and many of these voters said, well, you know, I'd have to vote for uh, President Biden. Sort of a reluctant answer, but you'd have to think the Biden campaign, watching these Nikki Haley numbers tonight, sees an opening there as well. Absolutely. And this is actually the argument that they have been making for months. Look, they are well aware that their message isn't resonating. They know that a lot of Americans are not exactly enthusiastic about the idea of this Biden-Trump rematch. But the argument that they make is that a lot of people simply aren't paying attention yet. And that if it really does come down to Biden and Trump, 
that there will be such a sharp contrast between the two that Joe Biden will really have an opportunity to, to expand his lead, certainly based on, off of what we've seen so far in the polls. They hope that once people engage and once they do a better job of selling their message, which the Biden White House admits they need to do, that they hope they will be able to convince, especially those independents and those who are reluctantly voting for Biden, to come more onto their side. Yeah, Mary's tapping into something here, John, which is very true, I think. And yeah. A lot of people aren't paying attention. Uh, not only do they, in some ways, not want to pay attention, because it feels, again, you know, Reince was joking, like 2020, 2016, yeah. but in many ways it's echoing what we've seen these last couple of presidential cycles. Are there people who are not paying attention who are suddenly going to be handed two candidates all over again and, and say, how do we get here? Yeah, uh, I mean, for sure. And, and people have checked out. And, and, and let's, let's not forget how exhausting that 2020 campaign was, how exhausting uh, the Trump years were, where everybody was on edge following the ins and outs of politics because you had this unprecedented situation at the White House. People have checked out on Donald Trump. I mean, there are people who follow the legal cases. They get plenty of coverage. But what's he like as a candidate? You know, he's, he campaigned. Um, it was a remarkably light campaign schedule in Iowa and New Hampshire, doing a fraction of the events uh, that, that, that his competitors did. It was kind of like, you know, he, he's got the name recognition, he's got the fact that there's discontent with Biden, but I think that as it's clear that he is the Republican nomination nominee, if it, it becomes clear, what does he stand for? What would a second Trump term look for? And trust me, the Biden team knows they've got a hell of a lot to work with. Uh, just with what he has said along the way, just over the past few weeks, he's talked about being a dictator on day one. He's talked about suspending the Constitution in certain circumstances. He's talked about the death penalty for the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I mean, this is stuff that for the most part, aside from Chris Christie before he dropped out, for the most part, uh, his Republican rivals didn't touch, trust me, Biden's not going to be afraid yeah. to make sure everybody in America knows exactly all of that. Yes, that's that will be the campaign. Uh, let's that bring will in, be the campaign. Let's bring in Rachel Scott because, you know, Rick Klein was talking about this, some of the political pressure that will come within uh, the Republican Party for Nikki Haley at some point here once you see these Trump uh, victories uh, begin to mount. Uh, and from Capitol Hill tonight, a message of at least a, an effort for Republican unity around Donald Trump. David, we are seeing more and more Republicans on Capitol Hill calling on the party to now unite around former President Donald Trump, fresh off of that win in Iowa and now New Hampshire. And just moments ago, we got a statement from the new House Speaker, Mike Johnson. Uh, he says here that he's calling on the party to now move past and unite uh, behind President Trump so we can focus on ending uh, Biden's presidency and growing our majority in Congress. And I heard that same concern from Senator Tim Scott, who you saw there on the stage with the former president tonight. He said that every day that Nikki Haley sit, stays in this race is another day that they're not necessarily focused on how they could possibly defeat uh, President Joe Biden in the fall. That is a big concern for a lot of Republicans. So you're going to start to see that pressure on uh, on Nikki Haley to drop out only increase the longer that she stays in this race. But you you heard from her. She says that this race is far from over. Uh, she's taking this all the way to her home state of South Carolina, where the former president is currently leading in the polls. As for Trump, he's heading out west with stops in Arizona and Nevada over the course of the next few days, David. Rachel Scott, live at the Trump campaign where Donald Trump spoke a short time ago. And uh, not only did he signal time for unity in his two victory speeches, but now as we're hearing a uh, Speaker of the House uh, calling for Republican unity around uh, Donald Trump. Again, Iowa, New Hampshire, we're just getting started, but the path looks fairly clear at this point. There are always surprises. And as we heard from Nikki Haley tonight, uh, it's the first in the nation primary, you know, not the last. And Martha Raddatz, she must know the onslaught that's coming from the Trump campaign. I, I think it could be an absolutely brutal month for Nikki Haley. You heard Donald Trump tonight. He went after Nikki Haley. We, we talked last week about the winning Donald Trump and how his personality really changes. I'm winning. I'm on top of everybody tonight. I'm going to do this. And, and he has a very positive message. He is clearly angry that Nikki Haley is not saying, I'm, I'm, I'm on the Trump team now, I'm out of here. And you could hear it in his voice, you could hear it in, in, in really the cruelty. You've, you've seen it the last few weeks where he's gone after Nikki Haley in ways that he hadn't before. But you could see the anger with him tonight. It was the darker 
Donald Trump, and and she is in for a brutal run if she stays in here. We did see the change because after Iowa, you heard she can stay in as long as she wants. Uh, you know, critical of her, but not not the wrath, if you will, uh, the fire that can come, and, and and obviously, as you're saying, it will likely come and come to a much greater degree in the coming weeks. When you when you look at foreign policy, because she played a major role in the Trump administration, obviously the ambassador to the UN, and you look at these foreign conflicts that are front and center. There is a significant debate, as you know, Martha, we've been reporting on it here within the Republican Party over uh, what to do with Ukraine, uh, how much money to continue to spend on them. That at the same time as we watch the, the war with Hamas, Israel's war with Hamas continue to play out. Uh, and this will be something that he will likely be able to, to, to create some daylight with Nikki Haley on. Uh, he sure will, and especially on Ukraine, but more so with Joe Biden. And and look, you look at the numbers, people, foreign policy is by far not at the top of the concerns for most voters. And in the polling we did tonight, and the exit polling we did tonight, and polling we've done before, foreign policy is way down there, except for one thing. And that is, as you said, and that we've been reporting on the war in Gaza, young voters do not like what Joe Biden is doing. They do not like to see the support for Israel and, the, and what has happened in Gaza. And they see every single day on social media and elsewhere and on our newscast what's happening in Gaza and the number of women and children. And that, that could be a problem for Joe Biden. And that's something Donald Trump uh, if he is the nominee, will certainly use against Joe Biden. Well. And in fact, we heard some of the protesters during his speech today. Uh, the speech was intended to draw sort of a dividing line on the issue of choice for women in this country uh, on what would have been 51 years since uh, Roe. Um, obviously, it, it stands no longer. But during this speech, ostensibly about uh, abortion rights in this country, he had to answer to protesters in the audience over what's going on in Gaza. Yeah, repeatedly interrupted. And, you know, they were able to, to throw the president off of his game a little bit in this speech. He recovered, but we have seen this time and time again at his recent public events. And Martha's absolutely right, especially with young voters. This is going to be such a challenge for this president. And especially as he gets on the road, he wants to be talking about abortion. He wants to be talking about the economy, Bidenomics. These are the issues that he wants to hammer home. And yet the interruptions today proved that he's not be able to escape this one. He has to find a way, and you've seen him trying to walk this fine line, obviously offering staunch support for Israel while trying to urge, you know, more to be done to address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, ramping up the pressure on Israelis to do more to address the horrific civilian death toll, but how does he address it in a campaign setting? They haven't quite figured that one out yet. Are Democratic strategists, though, hoping that when looking at the alternative, when it comes to climate change, you know, uh, uh, abortion rights, that young voters will perhaps very unhappy with what the administration's stance on Israel uh, and on Gaza, that when you list the, the sort of issues top of mind most important to young voters, that, that the balance will, will still push young voters their way. Absolutely, and abortion especially is an issue where they feel that they are going to have a lot of success. And they point to what we've seen in the off-year elections, seeing that this issue has really driven voters to the polls. And you heard the president today point blank say, Donald Trump has, has boasted of taking away Roe versus Wade. He has boasted of taking away reproductive rights. You are gonna hear that message repeated over and over again. But again, the Biden campaign does concede they have a lot of work to do when it comes to messaging Joe Biden's accomplishments and what he's going to do going forward. Because they know you can't just run against Donald Trump. You also have to give voters something to vote for. And enthusiasm, and, and, David. I mean, definitely yeah. the enthusiasm gap. And I've seen that with voters. And, and they'll talk to me about motivate me, motivate me. And and they may not be paying attention now, or maybe they've been paying attention for the last couple of weeks because they thought there was some sort of alternative. They probably don't see that anymore. So it's gonna be motivating people to get out, to get out and vote. And Lindsay, you have the issues actually that New Hampshire voters said drove them uh, the most. Right, and it seems like there is this big divide as far as what's important to the Republican voters, what's important to the Democratic voters, because as we see President Biden trying to do this speech on abortion, that that's the least important from the Republican voters we heard from is they prioritize it. Economy, number one, with 37 percent, followed by immigration, which is really pretty astonishing considering that New Hampshire is about 2,300 <laughs> miles away from the southern border. But you have economy, immigration, followed then by foreign policy and abortion. Immigration, top of mind, as we know, for not only Republican voters, but Democrat voters as well. 
What is the administration going to do to tackle immigration? Look, they know that they have to tackle this issue because it is so critical to so many voters. And it's why you've seen the president in the last several weeks say that he is willing to come out and compromise on this issue. It's part of this current debate over what to do with funding for Ukraine and Israel. The president's the one who, who put that on the table to tie some immigration reforms to this critical need for foreign aid. The question is, where exactly is he going to compromise? How far is he willing to go? Negotiations are moving along. They said they don't want to negotiate this in public, but there certainly are signs that they are getting there. And it's not just because the president feels, you know, he wants to have a bipartisan win. He knows he has to show voters he takes this issue seriously. And Does this deliver. get to the House? <sighs> David, that's right, a we big can talk question. about that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll that. see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. The I mean, Senate, I mean, it's, I mean, certainly, I mean, it's certainly making progress in the Senate. Yeah. The House is, is an X factor. Republicans are not eager to hand yeah. exactly. a victory hand this Joe close Biden to the election. An accomplishment or anything resembling a victory on this. I, I think you've got a very steep uh, yeah. climb in the House. I think Republicans would rather have the issue than have something to point to that they, an yeah. agreement they made uh, with Joe Biden, this the guy that they want to blame for destroying yeah. the border, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a very... Certainly not this close to the election. Yeah, and we, know we're, we know, and we know we're the guy who presumes himself to be the Republican nominee is on this and okay. where he'll be pressuring Republicans. And has already been pressuring, yes. Yes, yes, making calls as we know. Let's bring in Eva Pilgrim. Eva, you probably heard us talking here. Martha and I were talking about the pressure that Nikki Haley will feel, the wrath that she will feel almost immediately uh, once the temperature is turned up here uh, from Donald Trump. We have seen hints of this in the last couple of days. It's only going to get, uh, you know, uh, more extreme in the days ahead. And there's already a statement tonight from the Haley campaign about the tone, uh, the tenor of Donald Trump's speech tonight. Uh, that's right, David. Nikki Haley's campaign putting out a statement tonight about uh, former President Donald Trump's primary night speech saying it was a furious and rambling rant against Nikki Haley. If Trump is in such good shape, why is he so angry? They go on to say two states have now voted in the presidential race and Donald Trump barely received half the vote. Not exactly a ringing endorsement for the former president demanding a coronation. You know, Nikki Haley tonight talking to this crowd that was here earlier saying that she doesn't take any of this personally personal, and she expects this. Seeing this response from Donald Trump, she knows that she's gotten under his skin a bit and that she's maybe gaining some ground, maybe gaining some momentum, and that's what she's taking with her to South Carolina, David. But even let me ask you about this, because she's not going to find the same sort of demographic makeup that she w had in New Hampshire, uh, what Lindsay had pointed out earlier, just the sheer number of sort of undeclared independent voters uh, willing to um, chart a new course, if you will. Uh, she's not going to face that same kind of breakdown moving forward. It, it could get far more challenging from here. Uh, do they acknowledge that? She's said all along she knows that this is going to be a hard fight. She knew this was not going to be easy. But her campaign keeps pointing out that they have a month before South Carolina. And the people of South Carolina know her. And so she's hoping that if she can get on the ground in South Carolina, talk about the things that she did. You have to remember, she was a very popular governor at the time she was governor of South Carolina. And she won pretty handedly when she was governor. And so. Those people in South Carolina, she's hoping to get in front of them, remind them, try to convince them that this isn't just about right now, that this is about the future of our country. That's the speech she keeps giving out on the campaign trail in front of these crowds, that this is about tomorrow, this is about our children, and that Donald Trump doesn't have as good a chance as she does in a head-to-head -head with Joe Biden. And she's hoping that message and her record in South Carolina will help put her over the top. Eva David. Pilgrim uh, with the Nikki Haley campaign tonight. Eva, thank you. And there's no question Nikki Haley's been talking about this two-person race. She's wanted it to be a two-person race. The question is, uh, is it too late now that the game has begun? I know it's weird to say that when we've only had Iowa and New Hampshire, but we're watching the math sort of roll out here uh, and the size of the victories from, uh, from Donald Trump. I want to bring in Mary Alice Parks, who's actually in South Carolina, where Nikki Haley will uh, head next to her home state, where she was a two-term, uh, a popular governor uh, in South Carolina, where she was the one who actually appointed, uh, you know, Senator Scott to his his role, uh, at least at the very beginning. He has now endorsed uh, Donald Trump. So she goes home, tries to convince the people of her home state to vote for her, and she's aware of the polling that has Donald Trump far ahead. 
Yeah, David, exactly right. The big question is, can this be Haley's home turf still, or is it just Trump territory? I mean, I've been talking to local state officials here who say, basically, she is liked, but he is loved, and that he has built out such an apparatus. I was talking to the state party chair here who said that out of all the campaigns, it is Trump who has the staff, the resources, the volunteers on the ground. And like you were saying, of course, uh, the realities of the polling. I mean, we've seen polling that shows Trump with 60 points uh, here in this state. But the Nikki Haley team, like we were just talking with Eva, they are confident. They talk about the fact that South Carolinians know her. She was a popular governor. She won re-election here by 15 points. Uh, she has friends in this state, and she wants to point to her record. When she's on the campaign trail, she likes talking about her record as governor. Uh, of course, we've seen in the last few days Trump really flexing those endorsements that he has. You know, I was really struck by that latest endorsement, Congresswoman Mace, uh, because she had gone head to head with Trump. Trump really calling her names, and still she came out and backed Trump, even in local Charleston right here, instead of Nikki Haley. David. So it's going to be tough even on her home turf for Nikki Haley, who says she is not out of this race yet. Mary Alice, our thanks to you as well. Uh, no question, a very difficult path ahead for Nikki Haley. And Giancarlo, I wanted to ask you for a, f a final thought here before we take a quick break. Uh, as far as what she must be thinking, at least strategically, not only the map that Recline pointed out, the, uh, slowly sort of hoping to gather some delegates along the way, knowing that she likely doesn't have victories ahead of her. How long can she stick with this? How long will the donors stick with her? And is there also part of this strategy, the, the, the knowledge that Donald Trump faces a lot of other things other than what we're watching politically. D David, I spoke to a, a very important donor to Haley's, uh, Haley's campaign effort today who said, even before the results came in, but it was clear where we were going, that if she in fact failed to win uh, in New Hampshire and didn't come close, uh, that there would be a reassessment about whether or not to continue to fund her campaign. So I think that is the first question, is how much in way of resources are there for her? Now look, she's got a lot in her, we don't know the exact amount she still has in her war chest, but she raised a lot of money. Uh, she had a lot of cash on hand going into New Hampshire. She will have the money to go through South Carolina, certainly. The question is, does she have the money and the wherewithal to see it through Super Tuesday. That's, that's the big question. And part of it, she has to look, you know, look at, at herself and her future. Does she assess that she can win in her state? Mary Alice pointed out she was a popular governor. She won twice. Uh, but if you look at any polling, and there hasn't been a lot of reliable polling, but any indication, it sure looks like Donald Trump has a very strong position in South Carolina. He's got the endorsements of all of those uh, in, in the congressional delegation, except for one House member. He's got the governor. He's got, I mean, he's very popular, much more popular in South Carolina, frankly, than he was in Iowa or in New Hampshire. So does Nikki Haley want to face the possibility of an embarrassing loss in the state where she served as governor? Uh, for nearly two terms. And not only that, part of the calculus has to be her own political future. She, yes. She's running for president now. It doesn't mean she won't run again in four years uh, if it doesn't go her way this time. Uh, we want to we want to say we still don't know, uh, obviously, but she has not won a state yet in, in this process. And if she wants to, and this is the other thing. We've heard a lot of people say, well, why didn't she go after Donald Trump faster yeah. and sooner? I, I think that's easier said than done when you know that you need some of those voters in the end to help you over the finish line if you make it to the general. But you know, the other thing, and this is big for the donors too, because by the way, it doesn't take a lot of big, big money donors to keep a campaign alive. Uh, we, we, we've seen that in the past, especially with the campaign finance rules being basically non-existent with super PACs. So you, you will have a, a segment of the party and of that donor class that wants to ensure that there is somebody that remains in this race. Somebody waiting in the wings. Somebody waiting in the rings. That Donald Trump is such a volatile candidate. All the, the legal cases you mentioned, and not just that, the kinds of things he is saying. Um, you know, he has an ability uh, uh, to, to, to create campaign gaffes that are greater than any anything we've ever seen and to survive them. How long can that maintain? But you need somebody, somebody in the race, just in case Donald Trump falls. Is she willing to be that person? Yes. She says she, she she's can. the only one left. Yeah. yeah. She's the only one left. And so is she willing the to the withering that? criticism that Martha says is around the corner, which we all know is true. Yes. 
stick through it. And, and by the way, that's happens. why you see the Speaker of the House coming out and endorsing. Uh, I mean, he already endorsed Trump, but basically calling on everybody to get online. I mean, Trump is putting pressure and making it clear. You saw the anger. Martha's exactly right. That was an angry guy for a guy that just wanted, to, you know, a double-digit victory. Uh, an angry guy, and he is expressing that anger to Republicans who have not yet come out to endorse him and putting the pressure on those who have to put pressure on Haley uh, to get out of this race. It, it, it's so interesting because it's the political calculation within the leaders of the party, the, the established politicians within the party, because typically after a, a victory like that in New Hampshire, you'd come out and, and you oh, would talk yeah. about bringing the voters yeah. together to try to appeal to the people who voted for Nikki Haley as you move forward in the process. But this was not about that tonight, at least no. the particular anger that you're speaking of. It's yeah. about who has not. And I think there was a subliminal message on the stage right behind him on one shoulder is Senator Tim Scott, former opponent. The other side is Vivek Ramaswamy, who he actually gave them both time gave them the to floor. speak. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think that the messaging there very quietly is Nikki Haley, get on board, right? Because kind of what he says goes, at least to people who are following along the party line. And just one other board I just wanted to bring up. The, proves this point, 47% of those people tonight who were polled said that Joe Biden is not a legitimate president. So we're talking about just shy of half of those people who went out to vote uh, don't believe that Joe Biden is That legitimate number down from won. Iowa, though. It correct? is down from Iowa. Yeah, still a significant number. There's no question about that. But isn't that... Uh, isn't that a risk, Martha? You know, Lindsay pointed out the number earlier that if Donald Trump were convicted of a crime, you know, of one of these felonies that he faces in this pathway ahead, the legal pathway, other than the political uh, road ahead for him, uh, that you had a sizable amount of the electorate that, sa that said, no, it wouldn't be a problem. But you also had a significant number of Republicans and independent voters who turned out uh, in New Hampshire today who said, yes, it would be a problem. Uh, if he's convicted. Isn't that a risk for the Republican Party sort of coalescing around Donald Trump so quickly? There's so many risks to the Republican Party right now and how they're coalescing around uh, various, various things with Donald Trump. But Donald Trump has has made this a campaign calling. I mean, come there. I'm a victim. That is that has been one of his primary messages. They're after me. So it's it's not, I, I think, it's not just, hey, it's okay if he's convicted of a crime, we, we'd still support him. They don't believe believe that he's guilty. If, he, if, if they brought down a guilty verdict, I think it would probably be much like the election. Like, we don't believe that this election wasn't stolen. I doubt a lot of those people would believe that if he was found guilty of those crimes. I mean, look at the E. Jean Carroll case. A lot of people think that's just fraudulent. And, and what's happening now, he's in court. He's in court rather than campaigning. That is his campaign. That has been one of his singular campaign messages. Poor me, they're going after me. No question, it's been used as a political platform and successfully, at least uh, so far. Uh, last question to you, Mary Bruce, our Chief White House Correspondent, before we, we take a break here. I would gather the Biden campaign has no problem with Nikki Haley sticking <laughs> around in this race a while longer to try to go after Donald Trump as she has been, uh, you know, to take the barbs from Trump while they get their, their election campaign up and running against who they believe firmly will be Donald Trump in the fall. Look, if she wants to hang around and rough him up a little bit, I'm sure they are just fine with that. And it does beg a question of what does Joe Biden's campaign look like going forward, right? So far, he has not been on the campaign trail a lot at all. In fact, today was actually his first official campaign event of the year. We have been told, look, they're trying to keep their powder dry as long as possible here. They're trying to save their money until they really need it, which gets to the point of, you know, go ahead and let Nikki Haley beat him up a little bit. I am told, you know, you're going to see the campaign ramping up a little bit over the next several weeks, putting out, you know, more ads, more paid media, doing more at the local level. Look, early spring or late spring, early summer, when you're finally going to see the president sort of stepping up those campaign rallies. But if it, if it truly is a Trump-Biden rematch, people are very familiar with these candidates. They know what they're getting into. To Martha's point, so much of this campaign is really simply going to be a get-out-the-vote effort. You're not going to see these candidates out there doing multiple campaign events on and off a campaign bus all day long. Donald Trump will be spending a lot of time in court. The president will be bouncing back and forth between the White House and the trail and really just trying to get his message out there and urging people to get out and vote, hammering home that enthusiasm issue. And playing a larger role role, at least in recent weeks, has been the Vice President Kamala yeah. Harris, who told you in the one-on-one -on -one interview that she knows they'll have to get out there and 
earn these votes. Absolutely, because they know that they have a real problem. And look, you're seeing it not just in the polling, but also they're hearing it from some of their biggest Democratic backers. In South Carolina, Jim Clyburn, the man who resuscitated Joe Biden's campaign in 2020, is out there saying he is very worried that their message isn't resonating, especially with critical constituencies like black voters. And they know they have their work cut out to them. They have to get out there and make it very clear, as Kamala Harris told me, who brought them, who is delivering for them. And they know that they, they, they've got an uphill battle when it comes to some of these issues. All right. Incredible conversation. The conversation continues. I'm going to hand it over to Jay O'Brien. And we're going to continue right here on ABC News Live. Jay, take it away. David and team, thank you. I'm Jay O'Brien. You're watching coverage of the New Hampshire primary right here on ABC News Live. It is 1030 here in the East, actually 1037 now. ABC News has projected that former President Donald Trump will win the Republican primary in the Granite State. He is up 54 percent to Nikki Haley's 44 percent. You see it there on your screen. Trump celebrating his win not long ago tonight with harsh words for his competitor and former U.N. ambassador. Pretended she won Iowa. <laughs> and I looked around, I said, didn't she come in third? Yeah, she came in third. And then I looked at the polls. She was talking about most winnability, who's going to win. And I had one put up. I don't know if you see it, but I have one put up. We've won almost every single poll in the last three months against Crooked Joe Biden. Almost every poll. And she doesn't win those polls. And she doesn't win those. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody take a victory. Nikki Haley also taking to the stage tonight. She said this to a room of supporters. Well, I'm a fighter. Yeah. And I'm scrappy. Yeah. And now we're the last one standing next to Donald Trump. Yeah. Today, we got close to half of the vote. We still have a ways to go, but we keep moving up. President Biden winning in the Democratic side of things tonight. He, in fact, just putting out a statement not long ago saying that it is clear that former President Trump will be the nominee and that the stakes could not be higher. President Biden, though, did have a primary challenger there in New Hampshire, the Minnesota Congressman Democrat Dean Phillips. There was Biden was not technically on the ballot there in New Hampshire. Instead, Democrats there had to write his name in. South Carolina is officially the first Democratic primary this year. Someone who spent quite a bit of time in New Hampshire was Dean Phillips. He was hoping to gain some steam against Biden. As we heard a short time ago, Phillips encouraging his supporters to stay with him, saying he is not dropping out of this race. Our Zareen Shah is there and spoke with Congressman Phillips earlier. Here's what he said. Some people are saying you're pushing Donald Trump toward the White House, possibly taking away some of Nikki Haley's votes. A lot of independents that I spoke to said they wanted to vote for you. What do you have to say about that? She could have possibly been a lot closer had those independents voted for her. Oh, and by the way, I think the country would be much happier with a Nikki Haley, Dean Phillips matchup this November. And that's what we're hearing. I know she's hearing that. I'm hearing the same thing. Seven like on the same ticket or? Well, no, I'm not saying the same ticket. No, I said against each other. Zoreen joins us now from that Dean Phillips event. Zoreen, look, it's it's what, 1040, but the night is young despite the fact that we have the races called here, and it's because we've got open questions as to what comes next. So for Dean Phillips, what is the latest from his campaign, and where does this campaign go from here? So, Jay, for Dean Phillips, this is a win. I mean, he had said that 20% of the vote would be a win for him. It looks like he's going to hit that target number. The exact numbers are still a little bit TBD. And he also said that, look, if, if, uh, if the incumbent president doesn't hit 80, that that's going to be an embarrassment. So, actually, both things happened. He hit 20%, which is a win for him at this moment. Uh, Joe Biden did hit 80, though, at the moment. Um, that, that is pretty good, you got to say, for a president who wasn't even on the ballot. Joe Biden had to get people to write in his name. A lot of people certainly did. But I think that question that I asked Dean Phillips is really an important one and something that a lot of people are going to be looking at. Did those independent voters go towards Dean Phillips when they could have gone to a Nikki Haley? Could she have been a lot closer to Donald Trump? I mean, that is the race, the Republican race that a lot of people were looking at. 
It's interesting, the Biden campaign looking right past Dean Phillips. I texted a Biden aide tonight. If they were watching Dean Phillips speak, they didn't even know that he was speaking at the time that he was speaking. Zoreen Shah at that Dean Phillips event. Zoreen, thank you. I want to turn now to senior White House correspondent Selena Wang. Selena, I want to stay with the Biden campaign here because they are looking past those primary challengers, as I said. They're looking right at former President Trump. That bore out in the statement that the president just released moments ago. You were at an event that the president and the vice president held today centered around abortion rights. What was the 2024 argument that the president made there? Well, look, this campaign, they've been squarely focused on Donald Trump, not just since this result, but for several weeks now. We heard the president really ramping up his rhetoric, directly going after Trump, calling him out by name at least 14 times with this strong message saying, look, it is Donald Trump who is responsible for taking your freedoms away, really forming this abortion issue as a freedom issue, saying, look, the Republican Party, they're trying to restrict your freedoms, putting women's health and lives at risk, while the Democratic Party, President Joe Biden, he is trying to protect them and enshrine them. And in a new campaign statement, the president saying thanks to all of those who wrote in his name in New Hampshire, and he said, at stake here is our democracy, our personal freedoms, our economy, and, and here, quote, says, which has seen the strongest recovery in the world since COVID, all are at stake. So again, really, they're squarely focused on the general election election here. They are ready for it. They are very eager to be drawing that contrast as it becomes clearer and clearer. Uh, Selena, we saw some divisions at that event you were at earlier today in the Democratic Party. There were protesters, as has been repeatedly mentioned tonight, repeatedly interrupting President Biden. How much of a concern is that for the Biden campaign, these young progressives who are particularly taking issue with the president's handling of the Israel-Hamas war? And Jay, just going back to that event, I mean, I've been at several Biden campaign events recently, several events where he has been interrupted, but the number of times that was unprecedented, at least a dozen times you had protesters standing up during the rally, interrupting his speech. It was sort of throwing the president off, but he was still strong and fired up and, and catching himself again. But really, this just points, as you say, to the divisions within the Democratic Party, especially among young and progressive voters. But the campaign, they insist that as this clear choice becomes more obvious between Trump and Biden, that those voters are still going to go towards Biden despite their concerns over his handling of the Israel-Hamas war. Selena Wang for us in Washington. Zareen Shah, too, breaking down everything. Democrat, we want to go right back now to ABC News Live Prime member anchor Lindsey Davis, who was with that team in New York. Lindsey, uh, take it away. Uh, Jay O'Brien, we appreciate you holding it down for us. Of course, ABC News has projected Donald Trump as the winner of primary night. Nikki Haley is vowing to stay in the race. Meanwhile, ABC News has also projected that Donald Trump will win the primary, as we just said. Let's go back to ABC's Eva Pilgrim, who joins us now. Eva, what are you hearing there from voters on the ground? Well, you know, a lot of what we heard from voters or, or earlier today was that they, they didn't really love the option of a Biden-Trump rematch. And so a lot of them were thinking some who had voted for Biden previously were coming towards Nikki Haley. And some of the Trump supporters even were undecided as we were talking to them in the line. There was a huge turnout here. The lines were long. The people here in New Hampshire take their voting very seriously, and they turned out. Um, and, and really what we were hearing from them was it was about the candidates. While they, there are specific issues that are important to them, ultimately their decision about who to vote for came down to who these candidates are and how they think they will be in the future as president, Lindsay. And Eva, just give us a sense of we heard her saying, I'm going home, she's going to sweet South Carolina. What's the strategy from here? Uh, well, Lindsay, you know, before the results even started coming in, Nikki Haley's campaign put out a press release saying that they were going to South Carolina, that they were going to continue on, that there was nothing that could happen tonight that would change their plan, and they were moving on to Super Tuesday as well. And, and this is sort of what they're thinking. They still think that there is a path forward for her, no matter what happened here in New Hampshire tonight, because she's hoping to get momentum and then pull those independent voters and those who are looking for an alternative to Trump that typically vote Republican. And in the state of South Carolina, in the Republican primary, anyone can vote in that primary as long as they didn't vote in the Democratic primary. Then you look ahead to Super Tuesday. There are 11 states that are either open primaries or semi-open. And so she's hoping that building this momentum here, she'll be able to carry it forward 
She knows she's got a long road ahead. She told us multiple times over the last several weeks that she knew this was not going to be easy, but they are in this for the long haul. They are fighting for every vote, Lindsay. All right, Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. I want to bring John Carl in. And John, we were talking earlier about uh, the tone because eight yeah. days ago when we were sitting right in these yeah. same spots, Donald Trump really gave a speech that was focused squarely on Biden. Now, moving forward, this primary is over. We're heading to the general election and then it was like a retraction tonight as he was angry he even said at one point I don't get mad I get even Tim Scott who's standing right over his shoulder had just said that he endorsed him because he could bring the country together and yet you have him saying oh don't you really hate her referring you to must you. really hate her exactly yeah. and, and so what do you think is is the the dissonance here I mean first of all just just note that that this is a guy who just won by double digits and just won the second state, just on something that no other Republican in the modern primary era has done to win both Iowa and New Hampshire. No Republican non-president. Uh, well on his way uh, to, to getting the nomination. And what does he do? He comes out and eviscerates uh, his uh, his vanquished opponent and does it in a very threatening way. There were all kinds of overtones of you know how they're going to go after they're going to go after Nikki if she wants to going to go after her, and they've got stuff we know the stuff and we're going to I mean like like as if they're about to like dump, do this big uh, dump of oppo research uh, on on Nikki Haley. Lord knows what it is or whether it's you know I mean he he showed a willingness time and time again to go after opponents with allegations that are entirely made up. I mean, this is somebody who accused uh, Ted Cruz's father of being involved in the JFK assassination. So he's ca capable of a really vicious campaign. That's what he was threatening. Seems incredibly eager to get Nikki Haley out of this race. And you have to ask yourself why. And why? Does he fear that, that, that she can win, even though we see that her path ahead is incredibly difficult? Why? the eagerness, the almost desperation to get, out of, get her out of the race. I think it's almost that it's desperation for her to come with him. He just doesn't mm. like that. He doesn't want anyone on the other team. He thinks she should be with him. She should drop out. I, I, I mean, I think it's a really good point. Like, what, what does he fear? But I think it's just that he's angry that she hasn't dropped out, that she's still saying things about him, that she was pushing the envelope a little yeah. bit more in the last couple of weeks uh, th than she had before. And he doesn't like that. You, you know that better than anyone, John. And, and that yeah. He does not like that. He doesn't want anybody not on his team who he thinks should be. And Next. this more so than, I mean, this is, this is a campaign of vengeance and retribution. And I think you saw a flash of what really angers him, often more so than even the prosecutors or the Democrats are Republicans that don't fall in mm. line. And perhaps that is the case, considering that you had, as I mentioned earlier, flanked by Tim Scott and Vivek Ramaswamy. Yeah. It's like, they did it, why don't you too, uh, Nikki Haley? But one thing that I think is interesting, talking about his speech tonight, he didn't mention the issues. And when we're looking at the issues that mattered to those people who went to the polls in New Hampshire today, number one, they're saying economy, followed by immigration, and a really distant third foreign policy. Way and, distant and, third. And meanwhile, if you really are paying attention, it seems like we're at the brink of war, you know, trying to tamp down those, those concerns. Well, be, I think because one of the things is that Donald Trump has just pounded Joe Biden on immigration. Pounded, pounded, pounded. And, and, and Joe Biden has a problem there. I mean, he has to figure something out with immigration. So that is clearly how Donald Trump is going after Joe Biden. And the economy has not resonated with, with Biden voters yet at all. And, and so it's sort of like whatever Donald Trump thinks are the issues is what those voters are going to hear right now. I mean, his base is listening to him every night, wherever he is, whatever that message is, that message is completely resonating with him. I don't think this will be a huge issues campaign. I think it will come down to personalities. And this race is unlike any other. I think, you know, we compare past races and in 2016 this, in 2020 this, we have essentially two incumbents running. We, ha we have a former president and a current president. Both of them have records. Both of them you can look at, but Donald Trump's record is, is removed. So he's making it 
about Joe Biden. He's making about grievances, and he's making about making it about what Joe Biden is or is not doing. And if this is not going to be about issues, Mary, we want to bring you in here. Somebody has to tell Joe Biden that, right? Because he's <laughs> trying to give a speech today about abortion, which happened to be the lowest of importance for the voters that went to the polls today. And, and look, Joe Biden is certainly more than happy to lean into the fact that Donald Trump isn't talking about the issues, because that's one of his central arguments, is while Donald Trump is about Donald Trump. Joe Biden says, I'm focused on the American people. That's the argument that he is trying to make. And in fact, we are just hearing in a statement from the president. And it is clear that while, you know, Nikki Haley thinks she still has a chance, Joe Biden does not. In fact, he says point blank in this statement that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee. And then he outlines what he thinks is at stake, our democracy, our personal freedoms, our economy. He says all of this is at stake. Of course, that argument that we've heard over and over again from the Biden campaign that what is on the line in this election is our country democracy, the, the, the freedoms that this country were founded on, Biden says, are very much what is on the line here. And then what's really interesting in this statement is that Biden then appeals directly to those independents and Republicans, those voters that, that, that our team on the ground were talking to today, leaving the polling station saying, you know, I may be a Republican, and if it comes down to, to Trump versus Biden, maybe I will vote for Biden. Those Republicans who just can't stomach another four years of Donald Trump. Biden reaching out to them, urging them to join us as Americans. But and do you're you hear just, that over and over again. Do you run the same playbook again if yeah. you're Joe Biden, if it is a, a rematch head-to-head -head against Joe Biden to Donald Trump? I mean, he very much is running on the exact same campaign message. I mean, you know, think about it. Four years ago, the, 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 the argument was that this is a battle for the soul of our country. And now he's saying he needs four more years to finish the job. He is very much still arguing that he is trying to save the country again from Donald Trump. And he knows, though, look, we've been talking about this, he can't just run against Donald Trump. He has to give people something to run for. He has to hit at those issues, which is why they know they have to do a better job of getting out there and selling their accomplishments to the American people. But it, it, it is not an accident that this feels very, very familiar. But keep in mind, he ran that playbook before January 6th, exactly. before Donald Trump tried to overturn an election, before Donald Trump talked about suspending the Constitution, before Donald Trump declared he would be a dictator on day one. I mean, he has more material, but it is... And it, it is, is very why, much the same you know, the, the first image of Joe Biden's re-election video, that video he put out announcing he was running for re-election, the first frame of video, January 6th. Mm -hmm. And whether makes that the resonates or not, yeah. we're, we'll have to see. I mean, you, you have had so much talk about January 6th, and of course, Donald Trump talks about it, too, in a very different way, calling the people who are in prison hostages, hostages, <laughs> hostages yeah. which is uh, extraordinary. I want to uh, table this conversation just for a moment to bring in Rachel Scott, who is there on the ground in Nashua, New Hampshire, for us, been following the Trump campaign. Rachel, we heard Trump bash rival Nikki Haley earlier, calling her an imposter who failed badly. Uh, but there's a new call tonight for the, for the party to, to come together. Yeah, and we are seeing growing calls from Republicans, especially over on Capitol Hill. House Speaker Mike Johnson releasing a statement tonight. He's urging the party to unite around the former president. You obviously saw uh, Senator Tim Scott Vivek Ramaswamy, two of Trump's former rivals, on that stage with him. And then in Iowa, you had uh, Governor Doug Burgum, who also was a former rival. He endorsed him as well. So now you see this growing push to try to get this party to coalesce behind Donald Trump. As Tim Scott told me tonight, he believes that every day that Nikki Haley is still in this race is a day that they are not talking about Joe Biden and how they're going to potentially defeat him in the November election. But as you guys all pointed out, uh, this speech tonight was really light on issues, which is somewhat ironic here when you look at the polling data. The former president actually polls ahead of Nikki Haley on several key issues that are important to voters, including the economy, immigration. Those are things that are top of mind for voters. They told us that when they were heading into the polls today. One thing that I think uh, is going to be keen for the former president uh, to think about if he thinks he's heading into this general election as he's one step away from possibly uh, clinching the Republican nomination here is independent voters. We certainly talked to so many independent voters that just quite frankly did not like either option of Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Uh, they felt like Donald Trump had too much legal chaos around him. They thought both of them were just simply too old and they really couldn't fathom a potential rematch. Uh, some of them even struggling to even tell us who they would possibly support if we see Biden and Trump facing off 
in November, Lindsay. Yeah, we've seen that again and again. Overwhelmingly, the majority of, uh, of voters are basically saying that they're going to hold their nose and vote if it's going to be another rematch between Biden and Trump. Rachel Scott, we appreciate you being with us all night. want to send it now to ABC News political director Rick Klein, who's back with us again. Uh, Rick, let's take a look at where the race goes from here. Haley is not competing in the Nevada caucus, uh, but let's take a look at, at South Carolina. I know you're ready at all times. Oh, so, yeah, so South Carolina, <laughs> this is our 538 polling average, Lindsay, and it is not close right now. Donald Trump is winning by a lot. Uh, 35 points in this polling, and, and it hasn't gotten any closer. If you just zoom into the last couple of weeks, you see Donald Trump picking up some ground. And where things get pretty difficult for, for Haley is if you start to look ahead a little bit, our partners at 538 put together a, a chart of the upcoming states. And here they've looked at what, what they have to do in terms of how many delegates they win. This to me is really striking because they're saying that Donald Trump actually doesn't have to win anything in South Carolina and he'll be fine. Nikki Haley needs to win them all. She has to clean up in her home state to even be on track for the nomination. And it's just, it's so striking when you, when you start to get into any of the math around the nomination to know that things get really serious really fast. It looks like there hasn't been much happening yet. And look, we're here on January 3rd and you've got like 2% or something of the, of the delegates that you, need to, that you need to win the nomination have been named. But by Super Tuesday, that jumps up to almost half. By, by the beginning of April, it's, it's basically over. So there's a very short window to make a difference. And, and there's really no realistic path that I can see in looking at the states ahead without seeing a Nikki Haley victory in South Carolina a month from now. And it will be a long, and as Martha pointed out, a very searing month for Nikki Haley to endure. Oh, Rick Klein, we thank you. Everybody here at the round table, we appreciate you. Hopefully there will be a real Super Tuesday and it's not Super Today uh, right now <laughs> and that that's it. Uh, but that is our show for tonight, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Thing in the morning. There's a lot going on.